Section 18 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Book 2, Chapter 5. In which I hear ill news of George. The sun was pouring in at my lattice when I awoke next morning to a general soreness of body that at first puzzled me to account for. But as I lay in that delicious state between sleeping and waking, I became aware of a faint, sweet perfume, and, turning my head, espied a handkerchief upon the pillow beside me, and immediately I came to my elbow, with my eyes directed to the door, for now indeed I remembered all. And beyond that door, sleeping or waking, lay a woman. In the early morning things are apt to lose something of the glamour that was theirs overnight. Thus I remained propped upon my elbow, gazing apprehensively at the door, and with my ears on the stretch, hearkening for any movement from the room beyond that should tell me she was up. But I heard only the early chorus of the birds and the gurgle of the brook, swollen with last night's rain. In a while I rose and began to dress somewhat awkwardly on account of my thumb, yet with rather more than my usual care, stopping occasionally to hear if she was yet astir. Being at last fully dressed, I sat down to wait until I should hear her footstep, but I listened vainly, for minute after minute elapsed until, rising at length, I knocked softly, and having knocked twice, each time louder than before, without effect, I lifted the latch and opened the door. My first glance showed me that the bed had never been slept in, and that save for myself the place was empty. And yet the breakfast table had been neatly set, though with but one cup and saucer. Now beside this cup and saucer was one of my few books, and picking it up I saw that it was my Virgil. Upon the fly-leaf at which it was open I had years ago scrawled my name thus. Peter Vibart. But lo, close under this, written in a fine Italian hand, were the following words. To Peter Smith, Esquire, the Smith underlined, Blacksmith, Charmian Brown, Brown likewise underlined, desires to thank Mr. Smith, yet because thanks are so poor and small, and his service so great, needs must she remember him as a gentleman, yet oftener as a blacksmith, and most of all as a man. Charmian Brown begs him to accept this little trinket in memory of her. It is all she has to offer him. He may also keep her handkerchief. Upon the table, on the very spot where the book had lain, was a gold heart-shaped locket, very quaint and old-fashioned, upon one side of which was engraved the following posy. He who mine heart would keep for long shall be a gentle man and strong. Attached to the locket was a narrow blue riband, Wherefore, passing this riband over my head, I hung the locket about my neck, and having read through the message once more, I closed the Virgil, and, replacing it on a shelf, set about brewing a cup of tea, and so presently sat down to breakfast. I had scarcely done so, however, when there came a timid knock at the door, whereat I rose expectantly, and immediately sat down again. "'Come in,' said I. The latch was slowly raised, the door swung open, and the ancient appeared. If I was surprised to see him at such an hour, he was even more so, for, at sight of me, his mouth opened, and he stood staring speechlessly, leaning upon his stick. "'Why, ancient,' said I, "'you are early abroad this morning.' "'Lord!' he exclaimed, scarcely above a whisper. "'Come in and sit down,' said I. "'Lord! Lord!' he murmured. "'And has sat in his breakfast, too.' "'Lordy, Lord!' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'And, such as it is, you are heartily welcome to share it. "'Sit down.' "'And I drew up my other chair. "'A eaten his breakfast as ever was,' repeated the old man, without moving. "'And why not, Ancient?' "'Why not?' he repeated disdainfully. "'Cause breakfast can't be ate by a corp, can it?' "'A corpse, Ancient? What do you mean?' "'I means a corp ain't got no right to eat no breakfast, no.' Why, I, no, certainly not. Consequently, you aren't a corp, you'll be telling me. I? 
no not yet god be thanked peter said the ancient shaking his head and mopping his brow with a corner of his neckerchief you do be forever a giving me turns that you do do i ancient ay that you do and me such an aged man too such a very aged man i wonders at ye peter and me with my white airs oh i wonders at ye said he sinking into the chair i had placed for him and regarding me with a stern reproving eye if you will tell me what i have been guilty of i began i come down here peter so early as it be too i come down here to look for your corp after the storm and what happened last night i comes down here and what does i find i finds ye eating your breakfast just as if there never hadn't been no storm at all no nor nothing else i'm sure said i pouring out a second cup of tea i'm sure i would sooner you find my corpse than any one else and i'm sorry to have disappointed you again but really ancient oh you aren't the disappointment peter i found one corp and that's enough i suppose for an aged man like me no it aren't that it's finding you eating your breakfast just if there had not been no storm no nor yet no devil with horns and the tail and running up and down in the oller ear and a roaring and a bellering as john pringle said last night ah and what else did john pringle say i inquired setting down my cup why he come into the ball all wet and wild like and with his two eyes a sticking out like gooseberries he comes a busting into the tap and never says a word till he's emptied old amos's tankard that being nighest then by golds he said looking around by golds i just seen the ghost ghost says all on us sitting up ye may be sure peter ay says john looking over his shoulder scared like seed em with my own two eyes i did and what's more i heard em too where says all on us beginning to look over our shoulders likewise where says john where should i have seen him but in that there gashly holler i see a light first of all a leaping and a dancing back among the trees ah and i heard shouts as was enough to curdle a man's good blood pooh what light said joel amos cocking his eye into his empty tankard that bain't so much frighten a man no nor shouts neither aren't i says john pringle fierce like what if i tell ye the place be full of flaming fire what if i tell you i seen the devil hisself all smoke and sparks and brimstone a floating and a flying and dragging a body through the tops of the trees lord said everybody and well they might peter and nobody says nothing for a while i wonder says joel amos at last i wonder who he was dragging through the tops of the trees and why that'll be poor peter being took away says i i'll go and find the poor lad's corp in the morning and here i be and you find me not dead after all your trouble said i if said the ancient sighing if your arms was broke or your legs was broke now or if your hair was singed or your face all burned and blackened with sulphur i could have took it kinder but to find ye sitting eating and drinking it aren't what i expected of you peter no shaking his head moodily he took from his hat his never-failing snuff-box but having extracted a pinch paused suddenly in the act of inhaling it to stare at me very hard but he said in a more hopeful tone but your face be all bruised and swole up to be sure peter is it ancient ah that it be that it be he cried his eyes brightening and your thumbs all bandaged too why so it is ancient and peter the pinch of snuff fell and made a little brown cloud on the snow of his smock frock as he rose trembling and leaned towards me across the table well ancient your throat yes what of it it be all marked scratched if it be tore as if as if claws had been at it peter long sharp claws is it ancient peter oh peter said he with a sudden quaver in his voice who was it what was it peter and he laid a beseeching hand upon mine peter his voice had sunk almost to a whisper and the hand plucked tremulously at my sleeve while in the wrinkled old face was a look of pitiful entreaty oh peter a lad twere old nick has done it twere the devil has done it won't it oh say twere the devil peter and seeing that hoary head all a twitch with eagerness as he waited my answer how could i do other than nod yes it was the devil ancient 
the old man subsided into his chair, embracing himself exultantly. I knowed it. I knowed it, he quavered. Twere the devil flying off with Peter, says I. And they fools laughed at me, Peter. I laughed at me, they did. And they won't laugh at the old man no more. Not they. Old I be, but they won't laugh at me no more. Not when they see your face and I tell em. Here he paused to fumble for his snuff-box, and, opening it, held it towards me. Take a pinch with me, Peter. No, thank you, Ancient. Come, twould be a wonderful thing, as I took out snuff of my very own box, with a man as fault with the devil. Come, take a pinch, Peter, he pleaded. Whereupon, to please him, I did so, and immediately fell most violently a sneezing. And, pursued the old man, when the paroxysm was over, did ye see his horns, Peter, and his... Why, no, Ancient. You see, he happened to be wearing a bell-crowned hat and a long coat. An at a coat? said the man, in a disappointed tone. A at, Peter? Yes, I nodded. To be sure, the scriptures say, as he goeth up and down like a ravening lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yes, said I, but more often, I think, like a fine gentleman. I never heard tell of the devil in a bell-crowned hat before. But perhaps you're right, Peter. Take another pinch of snuff. No more, said I, shaking my head. Why, it's apt to catch you a bit at first, but, Lord, Peter, for a man as fought with a devil. One pinch is more than enough, Ancient. Oh, Peter, tis a wonderful thing as you should be alive this day. And yet, Ancient, many a man has fought the devil before now, and lived. Nay, has been better for it. Maybe, Peter, maybe, but not on such a terrible wild night as last night was. Saying which, the old man nodded emphatically, and, rising, hobbled to the door. Yet there he turned and came back. I nigh forgot, Peter. I have news for ye. News? News as ever was. News as will surprise ye, Peter. Well, I inquired. Well, Peter, Black George be took again. What? I exclaimed. Oh, I know twould come. I knowed he couldn't last much longer. I says to Simon, day afore yesterday it were. Simon, I says, mark my words, he'll never last the month out. No. How did it happen, Ancient? Got terrible drunk he did over to Cranbrook. Throwed Mr. Scrope, the beadle, over the churchyard wall. Knocked down Jeremy Tullinger, the watchman, and then went to sleep. While he were asleep, they managed, cautious-like, to tie his legs and arms, and locked him up, mighty secure, in the vestry. As ever, when he woke up, he broke the door open and walked out, and nobody tried to stop him. Not a soul, Peter. And when was all this? Why, that was the very point, chuckled the ancient. That's the wonderful part of it, Peter. It all happened on Saturday night, day afore yesterday as ever was. The same day, I says to Simon, mark my words, he won't last the month out. And where is he now? Nobody knows, but there's them that says he's making for Sefton Woods. Hereupon, breakfast done, I rose and shook my hat. Where away, Peter? To the forge. There is much work to be done, Ancient. But Jarge bain't there to help you. Yet the work remains, Ancient. Well, then, if you'm going, I'll go with ye, Peter. So we presently set out together. All about us as we walked were mute evidences of the fury of last night's storm. Trees had been uprooted, and great branches torn from others, as if by the hands of angry giants, and the brook was a raging torrent. Down here, in the hollow, the destruction had been less, but in the woods above the giants had worked their will, and many an empty gap showed where, erstwhile, had stood a tall and stately tree. "'Trees be very like men,' said the ancient, nodding to one that lay prone beside the path. "'Ere to-day and gone to-morrow, Peter, gone to-morrow. "'The man in the Bible, Imus was cured of his blindness by the blessed Lord. "'He said as men were like trees walking. "'But to my mind, Peter, trees is much more like men as standing still. "'You see, Peter, trees be such companionable things. "'It's very seldom as you see a tree growing all by itself. "'And when you do, if you look at it, you can't help but notice how lonely it do look. Ay, its very leaves seem to have a downhearted sort of drop. I knowed three of em once. Elm trees they was, growing all close together, so close that their branches used to touch each other when the wind blew, just as if they were shaking hands with one another, Peter. You could see as they was uncommon fond of each other, with half an eye. Well, 
one day along comes a storm and blows one of em down kills it dead peter and a little while later they cuts down another lord knows why and there was the last one all alone and solitary now i used to watch that there tree and here's the curious thing peter day by day i see that tree a drooping and drooping a withering and a pining for them other two brothers you might say till one day i came by and there it were peter a standing up so big and tall as ever but dead ay peter dead it were and never put forth another leaf and never will peter never and if you was to ax me i should say it died because it art were broken peter yes trees is very like men and the older you grow the more you'll see it i listened it was thus we talked or rather the ancient talked and i listened until we reached sissinghurst at the door of the smithy we stopped peter said the old man staring very hard at the button on my coat well ancient what about that there poor old rusty staple why it is still above the door ancient you must have seen it this morning oh ah i seed it peter i seed it answered the old man shifting his gaze to a rolling white cloud above i give it a glimp over peter but what do ye think of it well said i aware of the fixity of his gaze and the wistful note in his voice it is certainly older and rustier than it was rustier peter much rustier very slowly a smile dawned on the wrinkled old face and very slowly the eyes were lowered till they met mine e lad i be glad o that we be all growing older peter and though i be a wonderful man for my age and so strong as a cart horse peter still i do sometimes feel i be growing rustier with length of days and tis a comfort to know that that is staple a growing rustier along with me old i be but staples old too peter and i be waiting for the day when it shall rust itself away altogether and when that day comes peter then i'll say like the old patriarch in the bible lord now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace amen peter amen said i and so having watched the old man totter across to the bull i turned into the smithy and set about lighting the fire End of Book Two, Chapter Five. Teen of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter Six in which i learn of an impending danger i am at the forge watching the deepening glow of the coals as i ply the bellows and listening to their hoarse not unmusical drone it seems like a familiar voice or the voice of a familiar albeit a somewhat wheezy one speaking to me in stertorous gasps something in this wise charmian brown desires to thank mr smith but because thanks are so poor and small and his service so great needs must she remember him remember me said i aloud and letting go the shaft of the bellows the better to think this over it naturally followed that the bellows grew suddenly dumb whereupon i seized the handle and recommenced blowing with a will remember him as a gentleman wheezed the familiar Psha! i exclaimed yet oftener as a smith hum said i and most of all as a man as a man said i and turning my back upon the bellows i sat down upon the anvil and taking my chin in my hand stared away to where the red roof of old amos's oast house peeped through the swaying green of leaves as a man said i to myself again and so fell a dreaming of this charmian and in my mind i saw her not as she had first appeared tall and fierce and wild but as she had been when she stooped to bind up the hurt in my brow with her deep eyes brimful of tenderness and her mouth sweet and compassionate beautiful eyes she had though whether they were blue or brown or black i could not for the life of me remember only i knew i could never forget the look they had held when she gave that final pat to the bandage and here i found that i was turning a little locket round and round in my fingers a little old-fashioned heart-shaped locket with its quaint inscription 
he who mine heart would keep for long shall be a gentleman and strong i was sitting thus plunged in a reverie when a shadow fell across the floor and looking up i beheld prudence and straightway slipping the locket back into the bosom of my shirt i rose to my feet somewhat shamefaced to be caught thus idle her face was troubled and her eyes red as from recent tears while in her hand she held a crumpled paper mr peter she began and then stopped staring at me well prudence you you've seen him him who do you mean black jarge no what should make you think so your face be all cut you've been fighting and supposing i have that is none of george's doing he and i are very good friends why should we quarrel well then it won't george no i have not seen him since saturday thank god she exclaimed pressing her hand to her bosom as if to stay its heaving but you must go she went on breathlessly oh mr peter i've been so fearful for you and 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 you might meet each other any time so so you must go away prudence said i prudence what do you mean for answer she held out the crumpled paper and scrawled in great straggling characters i read these words prudence i am going away i shall kill him else but i shall come back tell him not to cross my path or god help him and you and me george what does it all mean prudence said i like a fool now as i spoke glancing at her i saw her cheeks that had seemed hitherto more pale than usual grow suddenly scarlet and meeting my eyes she hid her face in her two hands then seeing her distress in that same instant i found the answer to my question and so stood turning poor george's letter over and over more like a fool than ever you must go away you must go away she repeated hum said i you must go soon he means it i i've seen death in his face she said shuddering go to-day the longer you stay here the worse for all of us go now prudence said i yes mr peter from behind her hands you always loved black george didn't you yes mr peter and you still love him don't you a moment's silence then yes mr peter excellent said i her head was raised a trifle and one tearful eye looked at me over her fingers i had always hoped you did i continued for his sake and for yours and in my way a very blundering way as it seems now i have tried to bring you two together prudence only sobbed but things are not hopeless yet i think we can see a means of straightening out this tangle oh if we only could sobbed prudence you see i were very cruel to him mr peter just a little perhaps said i and while she dabbed at her pretty eyes with her snowy apron i took pen and ink from the shelf where i kept them which together with george's letter i set upon the anvil now said i in answer to her questioning look write down just here below where george signed his name what you told me a moment ago you mean that i that you love him yes oh mr peter prudent said i it is the only way so far as i can see of saving george from himself and no sweet pure maid need be ashamed to tell her love especially to such a man as this who worships the very ground that little shoe of yours has once pressed she glanced up at me under her wet lashes as i said this and a soft light beamed in her eyes and a smile hovered upon her red lips do he really mr peter indeed he does prudence though i think you must know that without my telling you so she stooped above the anvil blushing a little and sighing a little and crying a little and with fingers that trembled somewhat to be sure wrote these four words george i love you what now mr peter she inquired seeing me begin to unbuckle my leather apron now i answered i am going to look for black george no no she cried laying her hands upon my arm no no if he do meet him he he'll kill he i don't think he will said i shaking my head oh don't go don't go she pleaded shaking my arm in her eagerness 
he be so strong and wild and quick he'll give ee no chance to speak twill be murder prudent said i my mind is set on it i am going for your sake for his sake and my own saying which i loosened her hands gently and took down my coat from its peg dear god she exclaimed staring down at the floor with wide eyes if he were to kill ee well said i my search would be ended and i should be a deal wiser in all things than i am to-day and he would be hanged said prudence shuddering probably poor fellow said i at this she glanced quickly up and once again the crimson dyed her cheeks oh mr peter forgive me i i were only thinking of george and and quite right too prudence i nodded he is indeed worth any good woman's thoughts let it be your duty to think of him and for him henceforth wait she said wait and turning she fled through the doorway and across the road swift and graceful as any bird and presently was back again with something hidden in her apron he be a strong man and terrible in his wrath said she and i love him but take this with you and if it must be use it because i do love him now as she said this she drew from her apron that same brass-bound pistol that had served me so well against the ghost and thrust it into my hand take it mr peter take it but oh here a great sob choked her voice don't don't use it if if you can help it for my sake why prue said i touching her bowed head very tenderly how can you think i would go up against my friend with death in my hand heaven forbid so i laid aside the weapon and clapping on my hat strode out into the glory of the summer morning but left her weeping in the shadows chapter seven which narrates a somewhat remarkable conversation to find a man in camborne woods even so big a man as black george would seem as hard a matter as to find the needle in the proverbial bottle of hay the sun crept westward the day declined into evening yet hungry though i was i persevered in my search not so much in the hope of finding him in the which i knew i must be guided altogether by chance as from a disinclination to return just yet to the cottage it would be miserable there at this hour i told myself miserable and lonely yet why should i be lonely i who had gloried in my solitude hitherto whence then had come this change while i stood thus seeking an answer to this self-imposed question and finding none i heard someone approach whistling and looking about beheld a fellow with an axe upon his shoulder who strode along at a good pace keeping time to his whistle he gave me a cheery greeting as he came up but without stopping you seem in a hurry said i ah grinned the man over his shoulder cause why cause i be going home home said i to supper he nodded and forthwith began to whistle again while i stood listening till the clear notes had died away home said i for the second time and there came upon me a feeling of desolation such as i had never known even in my neglected boyhood's days home truly a sweet word a comfortable word the memory of which has been as oil and wine to many a sick and weary traveller upon this broad highway of life a little word and yet one which may come betwixt a man and temptation covering him like a shield roof and walls be they cottage or mansion do not make home thought i rather it is the atmosphere of mutual love the intimacies of thought the joys and sorrows endured together and the never failing sympathy that bond invisible yet stronger than death and because i had hitherto known nothing of this i was possessed of a great envy for this axe fellow as i walked on through the wood now as i went it was as if there were two voices arguing together within me whereof ensued the following triangular conversation myself yet i have my books i will go to my lonely cottage and bury myself among my books first voice assuredly is it for a philosopher to envy a whistling axe fellow go to second voice far better a home and loving companionship than all the philosophy of all the schools surely happiness is greater than learning and more to be desired than wisdom first voice better rather than destiny had never sent her to you 
myself rubbing my chin very hard and staring at nothing in particular her second voice her to be sure she who has been in your thoughts all day long first voice with lofty disdain crass folly a woman utterly unknown who came heralded by the roar of wind and the rush of rain a creature born of the tempest with flame in her eyes and hair and fire in the scarlet of her mouth a fierce passionate being given to hot impulse even to the taking of a man's life but said i somewhat diffidently the fellow was a proved scoundrel first voice bellowing sophistry sophistry even supposing he was the greatest of villains does that make her less a murderess in intent myself hum first voice roaring of course not again can this woman even faintly compare with your ideal of what a woman should be this shrew this termagant can a woman whose hand has the strength to level a pistol and whose mind the will to use it be of a gentle nature clinging sweet second voice sotto and sticky first voice howling of course not preposterous hereupon finding no answer i strode on through the alleys of the wood but when i had gone some distance i stopped again for there rushed over me the recollection of the tender pity of her eyes and the gentle touch of her hand as when she had bound up my hurts nevertheless said i doggedly her face can grow more beautiful with pity and surely no woman's hand could be lighter or more gentle first voice with withering contempt our peter fellow is like to become a preposterous ass but unheeding i thrust my hand into my breast and drew out a small handful of cambric whence came a faint perfume of violets and closing my eyes it seemed that she was kneeling before me her arms about my neck as when she had bound this handkerchief about my bleeding temples truly said i for that one sweet act alone a woman might be worth dying for second voice or better still living for first voice in high indignation balderdash sir sentimental balderdash second voice a truth incontrovertible folly said i and threw the handkerchief from me but next moment moved by a sudden impulse i stooped and picked it up again first voice our peter fellow is becoming the fool of fools myself no of that there is not the slightest fear because she is gone and thus I remained staring at the handkerchief for a great while. End of section 19《of the Broad Highway》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Book Two Chapter Eight In Which I See a Vision in the Glory of the Moon and Eat of a Poached Rabbit. The moon was rising as, hungry and weary, I came to that steep descent I have mentioned more than once, which leads down into the hollow, and her pale radiance was already upon the world a sleeping world wherein i seemed alone and as i stood to gaze upon the wonder of the heavens and the serene beauty of the earth the clock in cranbrook's church chimed nine all about me was a soft stirring of leaves and the rustle of things unseen which was the breathing of a sleeping host borne to my nostrils came the scent of wood and herb and dewy earth while up stealing from the shadow of the trees below the voice of the brook reached me singing its never-ending song now loud and clear now sinking to a rippling murmur a melody of joy and sorrow of laughter and tears like the greater melody of life and presently i descended into the shadows and walking on the side of the brook sat me down upon a great boulder and straightway my weariness and hunger were forgotten, and I fell a-dreaming. Truly it was a night to dream in, a white night, full of the moon and the magic of the moon. Slowly she mounted upwards, 
peeping down at me through whispering leaves checkering the shadows with silver and turning the brook into a path of silver for the feet of fairies yes indeed the very air seemed fraught with a magic whereby the unreal became the real and things impossible the manifestly possible and so staring up at the moon's pale loveliness i dreamed the deathless dreams of long dead poets and romancers wherein were the notes of dreamy lutes the soft whisper of trailing garments and sighing voices that called beneath the breath between petrarch's laura and dante's beatrice came one as proud and gracious and beautiful as they deep-bosomed broad-hipped with a red red mouth and a subtle witchery of the eyes i dreamed of nymphs and satyrs of fauns and dryads and of the young endymion who on just such another night in just such another leafy bower waited the coming of his goddess now as i sat thus chin in hand i heard a little sound behind me the rustling of leaves and turning my head beheld one who stood half in shadow half in moonlight looking down at me beneath the shy languor of drooping lids with eyes hidden by their lashes a woman tall and fair as strong as diane's self very still she stood and half wistful as if waiting for me to speak and very silent i sat staring up at her as she had been the embodiment of my dreams conjured up by the magic of the night while from the mysteries of the woods stole the soft sweet song of a nightingale charmian said i at last speaking almost in a whisper surely this was the sweet goddess herself and i the wandering shepherd on mount ida's solitude charmian said i again you have come then with the words i rose you have come then i repeated but now she sighed a little and turning her head away laughed very sweet and low and sighed again were you expecting me i i think i was that is i i don't know i stammered then you are not very surprised to see me no and you are not very sorry to see me no and you are not very glad to see me yes here there fell a silence between us yet a silence that was full of leafy stirrings soft night noises and the languorous murmur of the brook presently charmian reached out a hand broke off a twig of willow and began to turn it round and round in her white fingers while i sought vainly for something to say when i went away this morning she began at last looking down at the twig i didn't think i should ever come back again no why I, I suppose not said i awkwardly but you see i had no money no money not a penny it was not until i had walked a long long way and was very tired and terribly hungry that i found i hadn't enough to buy even a crust of bread and there was three pounds fifteen shillings and sixpence in donald's old shoe said i sevenpence she corrected sevenpence said i in some surprise three pounds fifteen shillings and sevenpence i counted it oh said i she nodded and in the other i found a small very curiously shaped piece of wood ah yes i've been looking for that all week you see when I made my table by some miscalculation one leg persisted in coming out shorter than the others Which necessitated its being shored up by a book until I made that block Mr. Peter Vibart's Virgil book she said nodding to the twig Yes said I somewhat disconcerted It was a pity to use a book she went on still very intent upon the twig even if that book does belong to a man with such a name as peter vibart now presently seeing i was silent she stole a glance at me and looking laughed but she continued more seriously this has nothing to do with you of course nor me for that matter and i was trying to tell you how hungry how hatefully hungry i was and i couldn't beg could i and so i i you came back 
said I. I came back. Being hungry. Famishing. Three pounds, fifteen shillings, and sevenpence is not a great sum, said I. But perhaps it will enable you to reach your family. I'm afraid not. You see, I have no family. Your friends, then. I have no friends. I am alone in the world. Oh, said I, and turned to stare down into the brook, for I could think only that she was alone and solitary, even as I, which seemed like an invisible bond between us, drawing us each nearer the other, whereat I felt ridiculously pleased that this should be so. No, said Charmian, still intent upon the twig, I have neither friends nor family nor money, and so, being hungry, I came back here and ate up all the bacon. Why, I hadn't much left, if I remember. Six slices. Now, as she stood, half in shadow, half in moonlight, I could not help but be conscious of her loveliness. She was no pretty woman. Beneath the high beauty of her face lay a dormant power that is ever at odds with prettiness, and before which I vaguely felt at a loss. And yet, because of her warm beauty, because of the elusive witchery of her eyes, the soft, sweet column of the neck, and the sway of the figure in the moonlight, because she was no goddess, and I no shepherd in Arcadia, I clasped my hands behind me, and turned to look down into the stream. Indeed, said I, speaking my thought aloud, this is no place for a woman, after all. No she said very softly no although to be sure there are worse places yes she said i suppose so then again it is very far removed from the world so that a woman must needs be cut off from all those little delicacies and refinements that are supposed to be essential to her existence yes she sighed though what i continued what on earth would be the use of a harp let us say or a pair of curling irons in this wilderness i don't know one could play upon the one and curl one's hair with the other and there's a deal of pleasure to be had from both said she then also i pursued this place as i told you is said to be haunted not i went on seeing that she was silent not that you believe in such things of course but the cottage is very rough and ill and clumsily furnished though to be sure it might be made comfortable enough and well she inquired as i paused then said i and was silent for a long time watching the play of the moonbeams on the rippling water well said she again at last then said i if you are friendless, God forbid that I should refuse you the shelter of even such a place as this. So, if you are homeless and without money, stay here if you will, so long as it pleases you. I kept my eyes directed to the running water at my feet as I waited her answer, and it seemed a very long time before she spoke. Are you fond of stewed rabbit? Rabbit? said I, staring with onions onions oh i can cook a little and supper is waiting supper if you are hungry i am ravenous then why not come home and eat it home instead of echoing my words and staring the poor moon out of countenance come and with the word she turned and led the way to the cottage and behold the candles were lighted the table was spread with a snowy cloth, and a pot simmered upon the hob, a hob that gave forth an odour delectable, and over which Charmian bent forthwith, and into which she gazed with an anxious brow, and thrust an inquiring fork. I think it's all right. I'm sure of it, said I, inhaling the appetising aroma. But pray, where did you get it? A man sold it to me. He had a lot of them. Huh, said I probably poached i bought this for sixpence out of the old shoe sixpence then they certainly were poached these are the camborne woods and everything upon them fish flesh or fowl living or dead belongs to the lady sophia sefton of camborne then 
Perhaps we had better not eat it, said she, glancing at me over her shoulder. But meeting my eye, she laughed, and so we presently sat down to supper, and, poached though it may have been, that rabbit made a truly noble end notwithstanding. End of Book Two, Chapter Eight twenty one of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson the broad highway by geoffrey farnall book two chapter nine which relates somewhat of charmian brown we were sitting in the moonlight now said charmian staring up at the luminous heaven let us talk willingly i answered let us talk of stars no let us talk of ourselves as you please very well you begin well i am a blacksmith yes so you told me before and i make horseshoes he is a blacksmith and makes horseshoes says charmian nodding at the moon and i live here in this solitude very contentedly so that it is only reasonable to suppose that i shall continue to live here and make horseshoes though really i broke off letting my eyes wander from my companion's upturned face back to the glowing sky once more there is little i could tell you about so commonplace a person as myself that is likely to interest you no said charmian evidently not here my gaze came down to her face again so quickly that i fancied i detected the ghost of a smile upon her lips then said i by all means let us talk of something else yes she agreed let us talk of the woman charmian charmian brown a tress of hair had come loose and hung low over her brow and in its shadow her eyes seemed more elusive more mocking than ever and while our glances met she put up a hand and began to wind this glossy tress round and round her finger well said she well said i supposing you begin but is she likely to interest you i think so yes aren't you sure then quite sure certainly then why don't you say so i thought you would take that for granted a woman should take nothing for granted sir then said i supposing you begin i've half a mind not to she retorted curling the tress of hair again and then suddenly what do you think of charmian brown i think of her as little as i can indeed sir indeed said i and why pray because said i knocking the ashes from my pipe because the more i think about her the more incomprehensible she becomes have you known many women very few i confess but but i am not altogether unfamiliar with the sex for i have known a great number in books our blacksmith said charmian addressing the moon again has known many women in books his knowledge is therefore profound and she laughed may i ask why you laugh at me oh said she don't you know that women in books and women out of books are no more the same than day and night or summer and winter and yet there are thousands of women who exist for us in books only laura beatrice trojan helen aspasia and glorious Phryne, and hosts of others i demurred yes but they exist for us only as their historians permit them as their biographers saw or imagined them would petrarch ever have permitted laura to do an ungracious act or anything which to his masculine understanding seemed unfeminine and would dante have mentioned it had beatrice been guilty of one a man can no more understand a woman from the reading of books than he can learn latin or greek from staring at the sky of that said i shaking my head of that i am not so sure 
Then, personally, you know very little concerning women, she inquired. I have always been too busy, said I. Here, Charmian turned to look at me again. Too busy, she repeated, as though she had not heard aright. Too busy? Much too busy. Now, when I said this, she laughed, and then she frowned, and then she laughed again. You would much rather make a horseshoe than talk with a woman, perhaps. Yes, I think I would. Oh, said Charmian, frowning again. But this time she did not look at me. You see, I explained, turning my empty pipe over and over rather aimlessly. When I make a horseshoe, I take a piece of iron and, having heated it, I bend and shape it, and with every hammer stroke I see it growing into what I would have it. I am sure of it from start to finish. Now, with a woman, it is different. You mean that you cannot bend and shape her like your horseshoe, still without looking towards me? I mean that, that I fear I should never be quite sure of a woman as I am of my horseshoe. Why, you see, said Charmian, beginning to braid the tress of hair, a woman cannot at any time be said to resemble a horseshoe very much, can she? Surely, said I, surely you know what I mean. There are Laura and Beatrice and Helen and Aspasia and Phryne and hosts of others, said Charmian, nodding to the moon again. Oh, yes, our blacksmith has read of so many women in books that he has no more idea of women out of books than I of Sanskrit. And in a little while, seeing I was silent, she condescended to glance towards me. Then, I suppose, under the circumstances, you have never been in love. In love, I repeated, and dropped my pipe. In love? The Lord forbid! Why, pray? Because love is a disease, a madness coming between a man and his life's work. Love, said I, it is a calamity. Never having been in love himself, our blacksmith very naturally knows all about it said charmian to the moon i speak only of such things as i have read i began more books she sighed words of men much wiser than i poets and philosophers written when they were old and grey-headed charmian broke in when they were quite incapable of judging the matter though many a great philosopher loved now didn't he to be sure said i rather hipped dionysius lambienus I think, says somewhere, that a woman with a big mouth is infinitely sweeter in the kissing, and... Do you suppose he read that in a book? she inquired, glancing at me sideways. Why, as to that, I answered, a philosopher may love, but not for the mere sake of loving. For whose sake, then, I wonder? A man who esteems trifles for their own sake is a trifler but one who values them rather for the deductions that may be drawn from them he is a philosopher charmian rose and stood looking down at me very strangely so said she throwing back her head so throned in lofty might superior mr smith thinks love a trifle does he my name is vibart as i think you know said i stung by her look or her tone or both Yes, she answered, seeming to look down at me from an immeasurable attitude. But I prefer to know him just now as superior Mr. Smith. As you will, said I, and rose also. But even then, though she had to look up to me, I had the same inward conviction that her eyes were regarding me from a great height, wherefore I attempted quite unsuccessfully to light my pipe. And after I had struck flint and steel vainly, perhaps a dozen times, Charmian took the box from me, and, igniting the tinder, held it for me while I lighted my tobacco. Thank you, said I, as she returned the box, and then I saw that she was smiling. Talking of Charmian Brown, I began, but we are not. Then suppose you begin. Do you really wish to hear about that humble person? very much then you must know in the first place that she is old sir dreadfully old but said i she really cannot be more than twenty-three 
or four at the most she is just twenty-one returned charmian rather hastily i thought quite a child no indeed it is experience that ages one and by experience she is quite two hundred the wonder is that she still lives indeed it is and being of such a ripe age it is probable that she at any rate has been in love scores of times oh said i puffing very hard at my pipe or fancied so said charmian that i replied that is a very different thing do you think so well isn't it perhaps very well then continue i beg now this woman charmian went on beginning to curl the tress of hair again hating the world about her with its shams its hypocrisy and cruelty ran away from it all one day with a villain and why with a villain because he was a villain that said i turning to look at her that i do not understand no i didn't suppose you would she answered hm said i rubbing my chin and why did you run away from him because he was a villain that was very illogical said i but very sensible sir here there fell a silence between us and as we walked now and then her gown would brush my knee or her shoulder touch mine for the path was very narrow and did you i began suddenly and stopped did i what sir did you love him said i staring straight in front of me i ran away from him and do you love him i suppose said charmian speaking very slowly i suppose you cannot understand a woman hating and loving a man admiring and despising him both at the same time no i can't can you understand one glorying in the tempest that may destroy her riding a fierce horse that may crush her or being attracted by a will strong and masterful before which all must yield or break i think i can then said charmian this man is strong and wild and very masterful and so i ran away with him and do you love him we walked on some distance ere she answered i don't know not sure then no after this we fell silent altogether yet once when i happened to glance at her i saw that her eyes were very bright beneath the shadow of her drooping lashes and that her lips were smiling and i pondered very deeply as to why this should be re-entering the cottage i closed the door and waited the while she lighted my candle and having taken the candle from her hand i bade her good night but paused at the door of my chamber you feel quite safe here quite safe despite the color of my hair and eyes you have no fear of peter smith none because he is neither fierce nor wild nor masterful because he is neither fierce nor wild she echoed nor masterful said i nor masterful said charmian with averted head so i opened the door but even then must needs turn back again do you think i am so very different from him as different as day from night as the lamb from the wolf said she without looking at me good night peter good night said i and so going into my room i closed the door behind me a lamb said i tearing off my neckcloth and sat for some time listening to her footsteps and the soft rustle of her petticoats going to and fro a lamb said i again and slowly drew off my coat as i did so a little cambric handkerchief fell to the floor and i kicked it forthwith into a corner a lamb said i for the third time but at this moment came a light tap upon the door yes said i without moving oh how is your injured thumb thank you it is as well as can be expected does it pain you very much it is not unbearable said i good night peter and i heard her move away but presently she was back again 
uncle peter well are you frowning i i think i was why when you frown you are very like him and have the same square set of the mouth and chin when you are angry so don't please don't frown peter good night good night charmian said i and stooping i picked up the little handkerchief and thrust it under my pillow End of Book Two, Chapter Nine. Twenty Two of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnell. Book Two, Chapter Ten. I am suspected of the black art. Vibert. The word had been uttered close behind me, and very softly, yet I started at this sudden mention of my name, and stood for a moment with my hammer poised above the anvil, ere I turned and faced the speaker. He was a tall man with a stubbly growth of grizzled hair around his lank jaws, and he was leaning in at that window of the smithy, which gave upon a certain grassy back lane. You spoke, I think said I. I said, Vibert. Well? Well. And why should you say Vibert? And why should you start? Beneath the broad flapping hat his eyes glowed with a sudden intensity as he waited my answer. It is familiar, said I. Ha! Ah, familiar, he repeated, and his features were suddenly contorted as with a strong convulsion, and his teeth gleamed between his pallid lips. My hammer was yet in my grasp, and, as I met this baleful look, my fingers tightened instinctively around the shaft. Familiar? said he again. Yes, I nodded, like your face, for it would almost seem I have seen you somewhere before, and I seldom forget faces. Nor do I, said the man. Now, while we were thus fronted each other, there came the sound of approaching footsteps, and John Pringle, the carrier, appeared, followed by the pessimistic job. "'Marnin, Peter, them war shoes,' began John, pausing just outside the smithy door. "'You was to finish em this afternoon, if so be as they been done, you being short-handed without George. Why, I can wait.' Now, during this speech, I was aware that both his and Job's eyes had wandered from my bandaged thumb to my bare throat, and become fixed there. Come in and sit down, said I, nodding to each as I blew up the fire. Come in. For a moment they hesitated, then John stepped gingerly into the smithy, closely followed by Job, and watching them beneath my brows as I stooped above the shaft of the bellows, I saw each of them furtively cross his fingers. Why do you do that, John Pringle? said I. Do what, Peter? Cross your fingers. Why, you see, Peter, said John, glancing in turn at the floor, the rafters, the fire, and the anvil, but never at me. You see, it be just a kind of way of mine. But why does Job do the same? And why do you look at a man so sharp and sudden-like, retorted Job sullenly. Dang me, if it aren't enough to send cold shivers up a chap's spine. I never see such a pair of eyes afore, no, nor don't want to again. Nonsense! said I. My eyes can't hurt you. And how am I to know that? How am I to be sure of that, and you with your throat all worn with devil's claws and demon's clutches? It being natural. Old Amos says so, and I says so. Pure folly, said I, plucking the iron from the fire, and beginning to beat and shape it with my hammer. But presently, remembering the strange man who had spoken my name, I looked up, and then I saw that he was gone. Where is he? said I, involuntarily. "'Where's who?' inquired John Pringle, glancing about uneasily. "'The fellow who was talking to me as you came up?' "'I didn't see no fellow,' said Job, looking at John and edging nearer the door. "'Nor me neither,' chimed in John Pringle, looking at Job. "'Why, he was leaning in at the window here, not a minute ago,' said I, and plunging the half-finished horseshoe back into the fire, I stepped out into the road but the man was nowhere to be seen. "'Very strange,' said I. 
"'What might he have been like now?' inquired John. He was tall and thin and wore a big flapping hat. John Pringle coughed, scratched his chin, and coughed again. "'What is it, John?' I inquired. "'Why, then, you couldn't happen to notice him wearing his hat. You couldn't happen to notice if he had ever a pair of horns, Peter?' "'Horns!' I exclaimed. Uh, "'Or a tail, Peter?' "'Or even a oof now,' suggested Job. "'Come,' said I, looking from one to the other. "'What might you be driving at?' "'Why, you see, Peter,' answered John, coughing again and scratching his chin harder than before, "'you see, Peter, it aren't natural for a human being to go vanishing away like this here. "'If it were a man, as you were a-talking to—' "'Which I doubt,' muttered Job. "'If it were a man, Peter, then I axes you, where is that man?' Before I could answer this pointed question, old Joel Amos hobbled up. He paused on the threshold to address someone over his shoulder. "'Come on, James, here he be. Come forward, James, like a man.' Thus adjured, another individual appeared, a somewhat flaccid-looking individual, with colourless hair and eyes, when it seemed to exhale an air of apology, as it were, from the hobnailed boot upon the floor to the grimy forefinger that touched the straw-like hair in salutation. "'Morning, Peter,' said old Amos. "'This year is Dutton.' "'How do you do?' said I, acknowledging the introduction. "'And what can I do for Mr. Dutton?' The latter, instead of replying, took out a vivid vulture handkerchief and apologetically mopped his face. "'Speak up, James Dutton,' said old Amos. "'Lord!' exclaimed Dutton. "'Lord!' I do be that art. You speak for I, Amos, do. Well, began old Amos, not ill-pleased, this ere Dutton wants to ask you a question. E do, Peter. I shall be glad to answer it if I can, I returned. You ear that? Well, ax your question, James Dutton, commanded the old man. Why, you see, Amos, began Dutton, positively reeking apology, I do be that uncommon ought, you axin. Why, then, Peter, began Amos, with great unction, it's as pigs. Pigs? I exclaimed, staring. Ah, pigs, Peter, nodded old Amos. Dutton's pigs. Is thou farrowed last week, at three in the morning, nine of them? Well, said I, wondering more and more. Well, Peter, they was a fine hearty lot, and all are doing well, till last Monday. Indeed, said I. Last Monday night, four of em sickened and died. Most unfortunate, said I. And the rest has never been the same since. Probably ate something that disagreed with them, said I, picking up my hammer and laying it down again. Old Amos smiled and shook his head. You know James Dutton's pigs died, don't you, Peter? I really can't say that I do. Yet you pass it every day on your way to the Aller. It lies just behind Simon's Oast house, as James himself will tell you. So it do, interpolated Dutton, with an apologetic nod, which, leastways, if it don't, can't be no of. Having delivered himself of which, he buried his face in the belcher handkerchief. Now, one evening, Peter, continued old Amos, one evening you leaned over the fence of that there pigsty, and stood a-looking at they pigs for, perhaps, ten minutes. Did I? Yeah, that you did. James Dutton see thee, and his wife, she see you too, and I see ye. Then, said I, probably I did. Well? Well, said the old man, looking round upon his hearers, and bringing out each word with the greatest unction. That your evening were last Monday evening, as ever was, the very same hour as Dutton's pig sickened and died. Hereupon John Pringle and Job rose simultaneously from where they had been sitting, and retreated precipitately at the door. Lord! exclaimed John. I might have knowed it, said Job, drawing a cross in the air with his finger. And so James Dutton wants to ax you to take it off, Peter, said old Amos. To take what off? Why, the spell, for sure. Hereupon I gave free play to my amusement, and laughed and laughed, while the others watched me with varying expressions. And so you think that I bewitched Dutton's pigs, do you? 
said I at last, glancing from old Amos to this perspiring apology, who immediately began to mop his face and neck again. And why, I continued, seeing that nobody appeared willing to speak, why should you think it of me? Why, Peter, you bean't like ordinary folk, your eyes go through and through a man, and then, Peter, I mind as you come a-walking into Sisner's one night from Lord knows where, all covered with dust and with a pack on your back. You are wrong there, Amos, said I. It was afternoon when I came, and the Ancient was with me. Ah, and where did you find you, Peter? Come, speak up and tell us. In the hollow, I answered. Ah, he found he in the very spot where the wanderer o' the roads hung himself sixty and six years ago. There is nothing very strange in that, said I. What's more, you come into the village, and beat Black George throwing the ammer, and him the strongest man in all the south country. I beat him because he did not do his best, so there is nothing strange in that either. And then you lives all alone in that there ghastly oller, and you fights and struggles with devils and demons, all in the wind and rain and tearing tempest, and what's most of all, you comes back, alive, and what's more yet, with devil marks upon ye and your throat all tore with claws. Old Gaffer be over proud of finding ye, but old Gaffer be doddering, doddering ye be, and foolish with years, he'd ha' done much better to left ye alone. I've heard of folk selling theirselves to the devil afore now, I've likewise eared of the evil eye afore now. Ah, and knows one when I sees it. Nonsense, said I sternly. Nonsense! This talk of ghosts and devils is sheer folly. I am a man like the rest of you, and could not wish you ill, even if I would come. Let us all shake hands and forget this folly. And I extended my hand to old Amos. He glanced from it to my face, and immediately lowering his eyes shook his head. It's the evil eye, said he, and drew a cross upon the floor with his stick. The evil eye. Nonsense, said I again. My eye is no more evil than yours, or Job's. I never wished any man harm yet, nor wronged one, and I hope I never may. As for Mr. Dutton's pigs, if he take better care of them and keep them out of the damp, they will probably thrive better than ever. Come, shake hands but one by one they edged their way to the door after old Amos, until only John Pringle was left. He, for a moment, stood hesitating. Then, suddenly reaching out, he seized my hand and shook it twice. I'll call for them more shoes in the morning, Peter, said he, and vanished. After all, I heard him say as he joined the others, it's summat to have shook hands with a chap as fights with demons. Chapter 11 A Shadow in the Hedge Over the uplands to my left the moon was peeping at me, very broad and yellow, as yet casting long shadows athwart my way. The air was heavy with the perfume of honeysuckle abloom in the hedges, a warm, still air wherein a deep silence brooded, and in which leaf fluttered not and twig stirred not, but it was none of this I held in my thoughts as I strode along, whistling softly as I went. Yet in a while, chancing to lift my eyes, I beheld the objects of my reverie coming towards me through the shadows. "'Why, Charmian,' said I, uncovering my head. "'Why, Peter! Did you come to meet me? It must be nearly nine o'clock, sir. Yes, I had to finish some work. Did anyone pass you on the road? Not a soul. Peter, have you an enemy? Not that I know of, unless it be myself. Epictetus says somewhere that, Oh, Peter, how dreadfully quiet everything is, said she, and shivered. Are you cold? No, but it is so dreadfully still. Now in one place the lane, narrowing suddenly, led between high banks crowned with bushes, so that it was very dark there. As we entered this gloom, Charmian suddenly drew closer to my side and slipped her hand beneath my arm and into my clasp and the touch of her fingers was like ice. "'Your hand is very cold,' said I, but she only laughed, yet I felt her shiver as she pressed herself close against me. And now it was she who talked, and I who walked in silence, or answered at random, for I was conscious only of the clasp of her fingers and the soft pressure of hip and shoulder. 
So we passed through this lane of shadows, walking neither fast nor slow, and ever her cold fingers clasped my fingers, and her shoulder pressed my arm while she talked and laughed, but of what I know not until we had left the dark place behind. Then she sighed deeply and turned, and drew her arm from mine almost sharply, and stood looking back, with her two hands pressed upon her bosom. "'What is it?' "'Look!' she whispered, pointing. "'There, where it's darkest, look!' Now, following the direction of her finger, I saw something that skulked amid the shadows, something that slunk away and vanished as I watched. "'A man!' I exclaimed, and would have started in pursuit, but Charmian's hands were upon my arm, strong and compelling. "'Are you mad?' cried she angrily. "'Would you give him the opportunity I prevented? He was waiting there to—to to, to shoot you, I think.' And after we had gone on some little way, I spoke. "'Was that why you came to meet me?' "'Yes.' "'And kept so close beside me?' "'Yes.' "'Ah, oh, yes, to be sure.' said I, and walked on in silence, and now I noticed that she kept as far from me as the path would allow. "'Are you thinking me very unmaidenly again, sir?' "'No,' I answered, "'no. You see, I had no other way. Had I told you that there was a man hidden in the hedge, you would have gone to look, and then something dreadful would have happened.' "'How came you to know he was there?' Why, after I had prepared supper, I climbed that steep path which leads to the road, and sat down upon the fallen tree that lies there, to watch for you, and as I sat there I saw a man come hurrying down the road. A very big man? Yeah, very tall he seemed, and, as I watched, he crept in behind the hedge. While I was wondering at this, I heard your step on the road, and you were whistling. And yet I seldom whistle. It was you. I knew your step. Did you, Charmian? I do wish you would not interrupt, sir. I beg your pardon, said I humbly. And then I saw you coming, and the man saw you too, for he crouched suddenly. I could only see him dimly in the shadow of the hedge, but he looked murderous, and it seemed to me that if you reached his hiding place before I did, something terrible would happen, and so you came to meet me. Yes and walked close beside me so that you were between me and the shadow of the hedge? Yes. And I thought, I began and stopped. Well, Peter? Here she turned and gave me a swift glance beneath her lashes. That it was because you were, perhaps, rather glad to see me. Charmian did not speak. Indeed, she was so very silent that I would have given much to have seen her face just then, but the light was very dim, as I have said. Moreover, she had turned her shoulder towards me. But I am grateful to you, I went on, very grateful, and it was very brave of you. Thank you, sir, she answered in a very small voice, and I more than suspected that she was laughing at me. Not, I therefore continued, that there was any real danger. What do you mean? she asked quickly. I mean that in all probability the man you saw was Black George, a very good friend of mine who, though he may imagine he has a grudge against me, is too much of a man to lie in wait to do me hurt. Then why should he hide in the hedge? Because he committed the mistake of throwing the town beetle over the churchyard wall, and is, consequently, in hiding for the present. He has an ill-sounding name. And is the manliest, gentlest, truest, and the worthiest fellow that ever wore the leather apron. Seeing how perseveringly she kept the whole breadth of the path between us, I presently fell back and walked behind her. Now her head was bent, and thus I could not but remark the little curls and tendrils of hair upon her neck, whose sole object seemed to be to make the white skin more white, by contrast. "'Peter,' said she suddenly, speaking over her shoulder, "'of what are you thinking?' "'Of a certain steak pasty that was promised for my supper.' I answered immediately, mendacious. Oh! And what? I inquired. What were you thinking? I was thinking, Peter, that the shadow in the hedge may not have been Black George after all. End of Book 2, Chapters 10 and 11
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Book 2, Chapters 12 and 13. Who comes? This table wobbles, said Charmian. It does, said I, but then I notice that the block is misplaced again. Then why use a block? A book is so clumsy, I began. Or a book. Why not cut down the long legs to match a short one? That is really an excellent idea. Then why didn't you before? Because, to be frank with you, it never occurred to me. I suppose you are better as a blacksmith than as a carpenter, aren't you, Peter? And seeing I could find no answer worthy of retort, she laughed, and sitting down, watched me while I took my saw forthwith and shortened the three long legs as she had suggested. Having done which, to our common satisfaction, seeing the moon was rising, we went and sat down on the bench beside the cottage door. And are you a very good blacksmith? she pursued, turning to regard me, chin in hand. I can swing a hammer or shoe a horse with any smith in Kent, except Black George, and he is the best in all the South Country. And is that a very great achievement, Peter? It is not a despicable one. Are you quite satisfied to be able to shoe horses well, sir? It is far better to be a good blacksmith than a bad poet or an incompetent prime minister. Meaning that you would rather succeed in the little thing than fail in the great? With your permission I will smoke, said I. Surely, she went on, nodding her permission, surely it is nobler to be a great failure rather than a mean success. Success is very sweet, Charmian, even in the smallest thing. For instance, said I, pointing to the cottage door that stood open beside her, when I built that door and saw it swing on its hinges, I was as proud of it as though it had been. A really good door, interpolated Charmian, instead of a bad one. A bad one, Charmian? It's a very clumsy door, and has neither bolt nor lock. There are no thieves hereabouts, and even if they were, they would not dare to set foot in the hollow after dark. And then, unless one closes it with great care, it sticks very tight. That, obviating the necessity for a latch, is rather to be commended, said I. Besides, it is a very ill-fitting door, Peter. I have seen worse and it will be very draughty in cold weather. A blanket hung across will remedy that. Still, it can hardly be called a very good door, can it, Peter? Here I lighted my pipe without answering. I suppose you make horseshoes much better than you make doors? I puffed at my pipe in silence. You're not angry because I found fault with your door, are you, Peter? Angry? said I. Not in the least. I'm sorry for that. Why sorry? Are you never angry, Peter? Seldom, I hope. I should like to see you so just once. Finding nothing to say in answer to this, I smoked my negro head pipe and stared at the moon which was looking down at us through a maze of tree trunks and branches. Referring to horseshoes, said Charmian at last, are you content to be a blacksmith all your days? Yes, I think I am. Were you never ambitious then? Ambition is like rain, breaking itself upon what it falls on. At least so Bacon says, and— Oh, bother Bacon! Were you never ambitious, Peter? I was a great dreamer. A dreamer! she exclaimed with fine scorn. Are dreamers ever ambitious? Indeed, they are the most truly ambitious, I retorted. Their dreams are so vast, so infinite, so far beyond all puny human strength and capacity, that they, perforce, must remain dreamers always. Epictetus himself— I wish, sighed Charmian, I do wish— What do you wish? That you were not— That I was not— Such a pedant. Pedant? said I, somewhat disconcerted. And you have a way of echoing my words that is very irritating. I beg your pardon, said I, feeling much like a chidden schoolboy. And I am sorry you should think me a pedant. And you are so dreadfully precise and serious, she continued. Am I, Charmian? And so very solemn and austere, and so ponderous, and egotistical, and calm. Yes, you are hatefully calm and placid, aren't you, Peter? 
and after I had smoked thoughtfully a while I sighed. Yes, I fear I may seem so. Oh, I forgive you. Thank you. Though you needn't be so annoyingly humble about it, said she, and frowned, and even while she frowned, laughed and shook her head. And pray, why do you laugh? Because, oh, Peter, you're such a boy. So you told me once before, said I, biting my pipe stem viciously. Did I, Peter? You also called me a lamb. I remember. At least you suggested it. Did I, Peter? And she began to laugh again, but stopped all at once and rose to her feet. Peter, said she with a startled note in her voice, don't you hear something? Yes, said I. Someone is coming. Yes. And they're coming this way. Yes. Oh, how can you sit there so quietly? Do you think? She began and stopped, staring into the shadows with wide eyes. I think, said I, knocking the ashes from my pipe and laying it on the bench beside me, that, all things considered, you were wiser to go into the college for a while. No, oh, I couldn't do that. You would be safer, perhaps. I'm not a coward. I shall remain here, of course. But I had rather you went inside. And I much prefer staying where I am. Then I must ask you to go inside, Charmian. No, indeed, my mind is made up. Then I insist, Charmian. Mr. Vibert, she exclaimed, throwing up her head, you forget yourself, I think. I permit no one to order my going and coming, and I obey no man's command. Then I beg of you. And I refuse, sir. My mind is made up. And mine also, said I, rising. Why, what, what are you going to do? She cried, retreating as I advanced towards her. I'm going to carry you into the cottage. You would not dare. If you refuse to walk, how else can you get there? Said I. Anger, amazement, indignation, all these I saw in her eyes as she faced me, but anger most of all. Ah, oh, you would not dare, she said again, and with a stamp of her foot. Indeed, yes, I nodded. And now her glance wavered beneath me, her head drooped, and, with a strange little sound that was neither a laugh nor a sob, and yet something of each, she turned upon her heel, ran into the cottage, and slammed the door behind her. CHAPTER Thirteen, A PEDDLER IN ARCADIA The cottage, as I have said, was entirely hidden from the chance observer by reason of the foliage. Ash, alder, and bramble flourished luxuriantly, growing very thick and high, with here and there a great tree, but upon one side there was a little grassy glade, or clearing rather, some ten yards square, and it was towards this that my eyes were directed, as I reseated myself upon the settle beside the door, and waited the coming of the unknown. Though the shadows were too deep for my eyes to serve me, yet I could follow the newcomer's approach quite easily by the sound he made. Indeed, I was particularly struck by the prodigious rustling of leaves. Whoever it was must be big and bulky, I thought, and clad probably in a long trailing garment. All at once I knew I was observed, for the sounds ceased, and I heard nothing save the distant bark of a dog and the ripple of the brook nearby. I remained there for maybe a full minute, very still, only my fists clenched themselves as I sat listening and waiting, and that minute was an hour. You won't be wanting ever a broom now? The relief was so sudden and intense that I had much ado to keep from laughing outright. You won't be wanting ever a broom now? inquired the voice again. No, I answered, nor yet a fine leather belt with a steel buckle made in Brahmagem as ever was. Ah, oh, it's you, is it? said the peddler, and forthwith gabbing Dick stepped out of the shadows, brooms on shoulder and bulging pack upon his back, a sight of which the leafy tumult of his approach was immediately accounted for. So it's you, is it? he repeated, setting down his brooms and spitting lugubriously at the nearest patch of shadow. Yes, I answered. But what brings you here? I be going to sleep here, my chap. Ah, oh, you don't mind the ghost, then? Oh, Lord, no. There be only two things as I can't abide. Trees as ain't trees is one of them, and women's another. Women? 
Come, didn't I once tell you I were married? You did. Very well, then. Trees as ain't trees is bad enough, Lord knows, but women's worse. Ah, oh, said the peddler, shaking his head, a sight worse. You see, trees ain't got tongues, leastways not as I've ever heard tell on, and a tree never told a lie, or ate an apple, did it? What do you mean by ate an apple? I means as a tree can't tell a lie or eat an apple, but a woman can tell a lie, which she does, frequent, and as for apples. But I began. Eve ate an apple, didn't she? The scriptures say so, I nodded. And told a lie afterwards, didn't she? So we are given to understand. Very well then, said the peddler. There you are. And he turned to spit into the shadow again. What's more, he continued, it were a woman as done me at my birthright. How so? Why, it were Eve as got us drove out of the Garden of Eden, weren't it? If it hadn't been for Eve, I might have been living on milk and honey, ugh, oh, and playing with butterflies instead of being married and peddling these ear brooms. Don't talk to me of women, my chap. I can't abide em. Ugh! Oh. If there's any trouble of it, you may take your Bible oath, as there's a woman about somewheres. There always is. Do you think so? I know so. Ain't I hearing and seeing such all day and every day? There's Black George for one. What about him? What about him? repeated the peddler. Why, ain't his life been ruined, broke, wore away by one of them eaves? Very well, then. What do you mean? How has his life been ruined? Ah, oh, the usual way of it. George loves a girl. Girl loves George. Sugar ain't sweeter. Very well, then. Along comes another cove, a strange cove, a cove with nice white hands and soft taking ways. He talks with her, and walks with her, smiles at her, and poor George ain't nowheres. Poor George's cake is dough. Ugh, oh, and doughy dough at that. How do you come to know all this? How should I come to know it but from the man himself? Dick, says he, baptismal name Richard, but Dick for short. Dick, says he, do you see this ear stick? And he shows me a good stout cudgel cut out of the edge and very neatly trimmed it were too. Ah, I sees it, George, says I. And you see this one, says he, holding up another as like the first one P to its fellow. Ah, I sees that one too, George, says I. Well, says George, one's for him and one's for me. He can take his choice, he says, and when we do meet it's a going to be one or the other of us, he says, and what's more, he looked it. If I have to wait and wait and follow him and follow him, says George, I'll catch him alone one of these fine nights, and it'll be man to man. And when did it tell you all this? This morning as ever was. Where did you see him? Oh, no, said the peddler, shaking his head. Not by no manner of means. I'm married, but I ain't that kind of a cove. What do you mean? The runners is after him. Looking for him I and low, and though married I ain't one to give a man away. I ain't a friendly co myself, never was and never shall be. Never had a friend all my days, and don't want one, but I like Black George. I pities and I despises him. Why do you despise him? Because he carries on so, all about an eve. Why, there ain't a woman breathing, as is worth a man's troubling his lead over. No, nor ever will be. Yet here is Black George ready, ah, oh, and more than willing to get himself hung, and all for a wench, a Eve. Get himself hanged? I repeated. Yeah, hung. Why ain't he waiting and waiting to get at this cove? This cove with the nice white hands and the taking ways. Ain't he a watching and a watching to meet him some lonely night? And when he do meet him, the peddler sighed. Well, why there'll be bloodshed, blood quarts of it, buckets on it. Black George'll batter this ear cove's head soft, so sure as I was baptized Richard, he'll lift this cove up in his great strong arms, and he'll throw this cove down, and he'll gore him and stamp him down under his feet, and this cove's blood'll go a-soaking and a-soaking into the grass, somewheres beneath some edge, or in some quiet corner of the woods, 
and the birds will perch on this cove's breast and flutter their wings in the cove's face, cause they'll know as this cove can never do anyone no hurt any war. Ugh, there'll be blood, gallons of it. I hope not, said I. You do, do you? Most fervently. And cause why? Cause I happen to be that cove, I answered. Ah, oh, said the peddler, eyeing me more narrowly. You are, are ye? I am. Yet you ain't got white hands. They were white ones, said I. And I don't see your ways is soft, nor yet taking. Nonetheless, I am that cove. Ah, oh, repeated the peddler, and having turned this intelligence over in his mind, spat thoughtfully into the shadow again. You won't be wanting ever a broom, I think you said? No, said I. Very well, then, he nodded, and lifting his brooms made towards the cottage door. Where are you going? To sleep in this here empty hut. But it isn't empty. So much the better, nodded the peddler. Good night. And with the words he laid his hand upon the door, but as he did so it opened, and Charmian appeared. The peddler fell back three or four paces staring with round eyes. "'By goals!' he exclaimed. "'So you're married, then?' Now when he said this I felt suddenly hot all over, even to the very tips of my ears, and for the life of me I could not have looked at Charmian. "'Why, why?' I began, but her smooth, soft voice came to my rescue. "'No, he's not married,' said she. "'Far from it.' "'Not?' said the peddler. So much the better. Marriage ain't love. No, nor love ain't marriage. I'm a married cove myself, so I know what I'm a-saying. If folk do talk and shake their heads over ye, why let them? Only don't, don't go a-spiling things by getting churched. You're a woman, but you're a fine un, a dasher by goals, nice and straight-backed, and round, and plump if I was this ear cove. No, I know what. Here, I said hastily, here, sell me a broom. The peddler drew a broom from his bundle and passed it to me. One shilling and sixpence, said he, which sum I duly paid over. Don't, he continued, pocketing his money and turning to Charmian, don't go spiling things by letting this young cove go a marrying and a churching ye. Nobody ever got married as didn't repent it some time or other, and what's more, when marriage comes in at the door, love flies out up the chimbley, and there you are. Now if you love this young cove, why, very good. If this here young cove loves you, which ain't to be wondered at, so much the better, but don't, don't go a marrying each other, and as for the children, come, I'll take a belt, give me a belt, said I, more hastily than before. A belt, said the peddler. A belt, yes. With a fine steel buckle made in, yes, yes, said I. Two shilling and sixpence, said the peddler. When I saw you last time, you offered much the same belt for a shilling, I demurred. Ah, oh, noted the peddler, but bolts is risk. Arf a crown's the price. Take it or leave it. It's getting late, said I, slipping the money into his hand, and I'll wish you a good night. You're in a hurry about it, ain't you? Yes. Ah, oh, to be sure, nodded the fellow, looking from me to Charmian with the evil leer. Early to bed and come, get off said I angrily. What, are you going to turn me away at this time of night? It is not so far to Sissinghurst, said I. But, Lord, I won't disturb you, and there's two rooms, ain't there? There are plenty of comfortable beds to be had at the bull. So you won't give me a night's shelter, eh? No, I answered, greatly annoyed by the fellow's persistence. And you don't want to buy nothing for the young woman, a necklace, or, say, a pair of garters? And here, meeting my eye, he shouldered his brooms hastily, and moved off. And after he had gone some dozen yards or so, he paused and turned. Very well, then, he shouted. I hopes as you gets your head knocked off, ugh, oh, and gets it knocked off soon. Having said which, he spat up into the air toward me, and trudged off. End of Book 2, Chapter 13 Four of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Section 24. Chapter 14. Concerning Black George's Letter. It was with a feeling of great relief that I watched the fellow out of sight. Nevertheless, his very presence seems to have left a blight upon all things, for he, viewing matters with the material eye of common sense, had thereby contaminated them. Even the air seemed less pure and sweet than it had been heretofore, so that, glancing over my shoulder, I was glad to see that Charmian had re-entered the cottage. Here, said I to myself, here is common sense in the shape of a half-witted peddling fellow, blundering into Arcadia, in the shape of a haunted cottage, a woman and a man. Straightway our peddler, being common sense, misjudges us, as indeed would every other common sense individual the world over, for Arcadia, being of itself abstract and immaterial, is opposed to, and incapable of, being understood by concrete common sense and always will be and there's the rub and yet said i thanks to the wanderer of the roads who built this cottage and hanged himself here and thanks to a highland scot who performed wonderfully on the bagpipes there is little chance of any common-sense vagrant venturing near arcadia again at least until the woman is gone or the man is gone or here going on to rub my chin being somewhat at a loss I found that I had been standing all this while, the broom in one hand and the belt in the other, and now, hearing a laugh behind me, I turned and saw Charmian was leaning in the open doorway, watching me. And so you are the... the cove, with the white hands and the taking ways, are you, Peter? Why, you were actually listening, then? Why, of course I was. That, said I. That was very undignified, but very feminine, Peter. Hereupon I threw the belt from me one way, and the broom the other, and sitting down upon the bench began to fill my pipe rather awkwardly, being conscious of Charmian's mocking scrutiny. Poor, poor Black George, she sighed. What do you mean by that? said I quickly. Really, I can almost understand his being angry with you. Why? You walked with her, and talked with her, Peter, like Caesar. You came, you saw, you conquered. Here I dragged my tinder-box from my pocket so awkwardly as to bring the lining with it. And even smiled at her, Peter, and you so rarely smile. Having struck flint and steel several times without success, I thrust the tinder-box back into my pocket and fixed my gaze upon the moon. Is she so very pretty, Peter? I stared up at the moon without answering. I wonder if you bother her with your Epictetus and Andreas dust quotations. I bit my lips and stared up at the moon. Or perhaps she likes your musty books and philosophy. But presently, finding that I would not speak, Charmian began to sing, very sweet and low, as if to herself. Yet, when I chanced to glance towards her, I found her mocking eyes still watching me. Now the words of her song were these. Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. And so, at last, unable to bear it any longer, I rose and, taking my candle, went into my room and closed the door. But I had been there scarcely five minutes when Charmian knocked. Oh, Peter, I wish to speak to you, please. Obediently, I opened the door. What is it, Charmian? You dropped this from your pocket when you took out your tinder-box so clumsily, said she, holding towards me a crumpled paper. And looking down at it, I saw that it was Black George's letter to Prudence. Now, as I took it from her, I noticed that her hand trembled, while in her eyes I read fear and trouble. And seeing this, I was, for a moment, unwontedly glad, and then wondered at myself. You did not read it, of course, said I, well knowing that she had. Yes, Peter, it lay open, and... Then, said I, speaking my thought aloud, you know that she loves George. 
he means you harm said she speaking with her head averted and if he killed you i should be spared a deal of sorrow and and mortification and other people would be no longer bothered by epictetus and dry as dust quotations she turned suddenly and crossing to the open doorway stood leaning there but indeed i went on hurriedly there is no chance of such a thing happening not the remotest black george's bark is a thousand times worse than his bite this letter means nothing and er uh, nothing at all i ended somewhat lamely for she had turned and was looking at me over her shoulder if he has to wait and wait and follow you and follow you said she in the same low tone those are merely the words of a half-mad peddler said i and your blood will go soaking and soaking into the grass our peddler has a vivid imagination said i lightly but she shook her head and turned to look out upon the beauty of the night once more while i watched her chin in hand i was angry with you tonight peter said she at length because you ordered me to do something against my will and i did it and so i tried to torment you you will forgive me for that won't you there is nothing to forgive nothing and good night charmian here she turned and coming to me gave me her hand charmian brown will always think of you as a blacksmith said i as a blacksmith she repeated looking at me with a gleam in her eyes but oftener as a pedant said i as a pedant she repeated obediently but most of all as a well said i as a man she ended speaking with bent head and here again i was possessed of a sudden gladness that was out of all reason as i immediately told myself your hand is very small said i finding nothing better to say smaller even than i thought is it and she smiled and glanced up at me beneath her lashes for her head was still bent and wonderfully smooth and soft is it said she again but this time she did not look up at me now another man might have stooped and kissed those slender shapely fingers but as for me i loosed them rather suddenly and once more bidding her good-night re-entered my own chamber and closed the door but to-night lying upon my bed i could not sleep and fell to watching the luminous patch of sky framed in my open casement i thought of charmian of her beauty of her strange whims and fancies her swift changing moods and her contrariness comparing her in turn to all those fair women i had ever read of or dreamed over in my books little by little however my thoughts drifted to gabbing dick and black george and with my mind's eye i could see him as he was perhaps at this very moment fierce-eyed and grim of mouth sitting beneath some hedgerow while knife in hand he trimmed and trimmed his two bludgeons one of which was to batter the life out of me from such disquieting reflections i would turn my mind to sweet-eyed prudence to the ancient the forge and the thousand and one duties of the morrow i bethought me once more of the storm of the coming of charmian of the fierce struggle in the dark of the postilion and of charmian again and yet in spite of me my thoughts would revert to george and i would see myself even as the peddler pictured me out in some secluded corner of the woods lying stiffly upon my back with glassy eyes staring up sightlessly through the whispering leaves above while my blood soaked and soaked into the green and with a blackbird singing gloriously upon my motionless breast chapter fifteen which being in parenthesis may be skipped if the reader so desire as this life is a broad highway along which we must all of us pass whether we will or no as it is a thoroughfare sometimes very hard and cruel in the going and beset by many hardships sometimes desolate and hatefully monotonous so also must its aspect sooner or later change for the better and the stony track overpassed the choking heat and dust left behind we may reach some green refreshing haven shady with trees and full of the cool sweet sound of running waters 
then who shall blame us if we pause unduly in this grateful shade and lying upon our backs a while gaze up through the swaying green of trees to the infinite blue beyond ere we journey on once more as soon we must to front whatsoever of good or evil lies waiting for us in the hazy distance to just such a place i am now come in this my history the record of a period which i afterwards remembered as the happiest i had ever known the memory of which must remain with me green and fragrant everlastingly if in the forthcoming pages you shall find overmuch of charmian i would say in the first place that it is by her and upon her that this narrative hangs and in the second place that in this part of my story i find my greatest pleasure though here indeed i am faced with a great difficulty seeing that i must depict as faithfully as may be that most difficult that most elusive of all created things to wit a woman truly i begin to fear lest my pen fail me altogether for the very reason that it is of charmian that i would tell and of charmian i understand little more than nothing for what rule has ever been devised whereby a woman's mind may be accurately gauged and who of all those wise ones who have written hitherto poets romancers or historians has ever fathomed the why and wherefore of the mind feminine a fool indeed were i to attempt a thing impossible but i do seek to show her to you as i saw her and to describe her in so far as i learn to know her and yet how may i begin i might tell you that her nose was neither arched nor straight but perfect none the less i might tell you of her brows straight and low of her eyes long and heavy lashed of her chin firm and round and dimpled and yet that would not be charmian for i could not paint you the scarlet witchery of her mouth with the sudden bewildering changes nor show you how sweetly the lower lip curved up to meet its mate i might tell you that to look into her eyes was like gazing down into very deep water but i could never give you their varying beauty nor the way she had with her lashes nor can i ever describe her rich warm colouring nor the lithe grace of her body thus it is that i misdoubt my pen of its task and fear that when you shall have read these pages you shall at best have caught but a very imperfect reflection of charmian as she really is wherefore i will waste no more time or paper upon so unprofitable a task but hurry on with my narrative leaving you to find her out as best you may End of section 24five of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by arlene stebbins the broad highway by geoffrey farnall section 25 book 2 chapter 16 concerning among other matters the price of beef and the lady sophia sefton of camborne charmian sighed bit the end of her pen and sighed again she was deep in her housekeeping accounts adding and subtracting and between whiles regarding the result with a rueful frown her sleeves were rolled up over her round white arms and i inwardly wondered if the much vaunted frins were ever more perfect in their modelling or of a fairer texture had i possessed the genius of a praxiteles I might have given to the world a masterpiece of beauty to replace his vanished Venus of Crydus. But, as it happened, I was only a humble blacksmith, and she a fair woman who sighed, and nippled her pen, and sighed again. What is it, Charmian? Compound addition, Peter, and I hate figures. I detest, loathe, and abominate them, especially when they won't balance. "'Then never mind them,' said I. "'Never mind them, indeed, the idea, sir. "'How can I help minding them when living costs so much and we are so poor?' "'Are we?' said I. "'Why, of course we are.' 
"'Yes, to be sure, I suppose we are,' said I dreamily. Lais was beautiful, Thais was alluring, and Berenice was famous for her beauty. But then, could either of them have shown such arms, so long, so graceful in their every movement, so subtly rounded in their lines, arms which, for all their seeming firmness, must, I thought, be wonderfully soft to the touch, and smooth as ivory, and which found a delicate sheen where the light kissed them? "'We have spent four shillings for meat this week, Peter,' said Charmian, glancing up suddenly. "'Good,' said I. "'Nonsense, sir, four shillings is most extravagant.' "'Oh, is it, Charmian? Why, of course it is.' "'Oh,' said I, "'yes, perhaps it is.' "'Perhaps,' said she, curling her lip at me, "'perhaps, indeed.' Having said which, Charmian became absorbed in her accounts again, and I in Charmian. In Homer we may read that the loveliness of Briseis caused Achilles much sorrow. Ovid tells us that Shione was beautiful enough to inflame two gods, and that Antiope's beauty drew down from heaven the mighty Jove himself. And yet, was either of them formed and shaped more splendidly than she who sat so near me, frowning at what she had written? and petulantly biting her pen. Impossible, said I so suddenly that Charmian started and dropped her pen, which I picked up, feeling very like a fool. What did you mean by impossible, Peter? I was thinking, merely. Then I wish you wouldn't think so suddenly next time. I beg your pardon. Nor be so very emphatic about it. No, said I, uh, no. Hereupon, deigning to receive her pen back again, she recommenced her figuring while I began to fill my pipe. Two shillings for tea! Excellent, said I. I do wish, she sighed, raising her head to shake it reproachfully at me, that you would be a little more sensible. I'll try. Tea at twelve shillings a pound is a luxury. Undoubtedly. And to pay two shillings for a luxury when we are so poor is sinful. Is it, Charmian? Of course it is. Oh, said I, and yet life without tea, more especially as you brew it, would be very stale, flat, and unprofitable, and— Bacon and eggs, one shilling and fourpence, she went on, consulting her accounts. Ah! said I, not venturing on good this time. Butter, one shilling. Hmm, said I cautiously, with an air of turning this over in my mind. Vegetables, ten pence. To be sure, said I, nodding my head, ten pence, certainly. And bread, Peter, this in a voice of tragedy, eight pence. Excellent, said I recklessly, whereat Charmian immediately frowned at me. "'Oh, Peter,' said she with a sigh of resignation, "'you possess absolutely no idea of proportion. "'Here we pay four shillings for meat and only eight pence for bread. "'Had we spent less on luxuries and more on necessities, "'we should have had money in hand instead of—let me see.' "'And she began adding up the various items before her "'with soft, quick little pats of her fingers on the table.' Presently, having found the total, she leaned back in her chair, and, summoning my attention with a tap of her pen, announced, "'We have spent nine shilling and ten pence, Peter.' "'Good indeed,' said I, "'leaving exactly two pence over.' "'A penny for you and a penny for me.' "'I fear I am a very bad housekeeper, Peter.' "'On the contrary.' "'You earn ten shillings a week.' "'Well?' "'And here is exactly two pence left. Oh, Peter! "'You are forgetting the tea and the beef and, and the other luxuries,' said I, struck by the droop of her mouth. "'But you work so very, very hard and earn so little that the little—' "'I work that I may live, Charmian, and lo, I am alive, and dreadfully poor, and ridiculously happy. "'I wonder why—' said she, beginning to draw designs on the page before her. 
Indeed, though I have asked myself that question frequently of late, I have as yet found no answer, unless it be my busy, care-free life, and with the warm sun about me, and the voice of the wind in the trees. Yes, perhaps that is it. And yet, I don't know, I went on thoughtfully, for now I come to think of it, my life has always been busy and carefree, and I have always loved the sun and the sound of the wind in the trees. Yet, like Horace, have asked, What is happiness? And looked for it in vain. And now, here, in this out-of-the-world spot, working as a village smith, it has come to me all unbidden and unsought, which is very strange. Yes, Peter, said Charmian, still busy with her pen. Upon consideration, I think my thanks are due to my uncle for dying and leaving me penniless. Do you mean that he disinherited you? In a way, yes. He left me his whole fortune, provided that I marry a certain lady within the year. A certain lady? The Lady Sophia Sefton of Camborne, said I. Charmian's pen stopped in the very middle of a letter, and she bent down to examine what she'd been writing. Oh! said she very softly. The Lady Sophia Sefton of Camborne. Yes, said I. And your cousin, Sir Maurice, were the conditions the same in his case? Precisely. Oh, said Charmian, just as softly as before. And this lady, she will not marry you? No, I answered. Are you quite sure? Certain. You see, I never intend to ask her. Charmian suddenly raised her head and looked at me. Why not, Peter? Because should I ever marry, a remote contingency and most improbable, I am sufficiently self-willed to prefer to exert my own choice in the matter. Moreover, this lady is a celebrated toast, and it would be most repugnant to me that my wife's name should ever have been bandied from mouth to mouth, and hiccuped out over slopping wine-glasses. The pen slipped from Charmian's fingers to the floor and before I could pick it up she had forestalled me so that when she raised her head she was flushed with stooping. "'Have you never seen this lady, Peter?' "'Never, but I have heard of her. Who has not?' "'What have you heard?' "'That she galloped her horse up and down the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral, for one thing.' "'What more?' "'That she is proud and passionate and sudden of temper. In a word, a virago.' "'Virago?' said Charmian, flinging up her head. Virago, I nodded, though she is handsome, I understand, in a strapping way, and I have it on very excellent authority that she is a black-browed goddess, a peach, and a veritable plum. Strapping is a hateful word, Peter, but very descriptive. And doesn't she interest you a little, Peter? Not in the least, said I. And pray, why not? Because I care very little for either peaches or plums. Or black-browed goddesses, Peter? Not if she is big and strapping and possesses a temper. I suppose, to such a philosopher as you, a woman or a goddess, black-browed or not, can scarcely compare with, or hope to rival, an old book, can she, sir? Why, that depends, Charmian. On what? On the book, said I. Charmian rested her round elbows upon the table, and, setting her chin in her hands, stared squarely at me. Peter, said she. Yes, Charmian. If you did meet this lady, I think— Well? I know— What? that you would fall a very easy victim. I think not, said I. You would be her slave in a month, three weeks, or much less. Preposterous, I exclaimed. If she set herself out to make you? That would be very immodest, said I. Besides, no woman can make a man love her. Do your books teach you that, Peter? Here, finding I did not answer, she laughed and nodded her head at me. You would be head over ears in love before you knew it. 
"'I think not,' said I, smiling. "'You are the kind of man who would grow sick with love and never know what ailed him. "'Any man in such a condition would be a pitiful ass,' said I. Charmian only laughed at me again and went back to her scribbling. "'Then, if this lady married you,' said she suddenly, "'you would be a gentleman of good position and standing?' "'Yes, I suppose so, and probably miserable.' "'And rich, Peter. I should have more than enough. "'Instead of being a village blacksmith, with just enough, and absurdly happy and content,' I added, "'which is far more desirable. At least I think so.' "'Do you mean to say that you would rather exist here, and make horseshoes all your life, than live respected and rich?' and married to and married to the lady sophia infinitely said i then your cousin so far as you are concerned is free to woo and win her and your uncle's fortune and i wish him well of his bargain i nodded as for me i shall probably continue to live here and make horseshoes wifeless and content is marriage so hateful to you in the abstract no for in my mind there exists a woman whom I think I could love, very greatly, but in the actual yes, because there is no woman in all the world that is like this woman of my mind. Is she so flawlessly perfect, this imaginary woman? She is one whom I would respect for her intellect. Yes. Whom I would honor for her proud virtue. Yes, Peter whom I would worship for her broad charity, her gentleness and spotless purity. Yes, Peter, and love with all my strength for her warm, sweet womanhood. In a word, she is the epitome of all that is true and womanly. That is to say, as you understand such things, sir, and all your knowledge of woman and her virtues and failings you have learned from your books, Therefore misrepresented by history and distorted by romance, it is utterly false and unreal. And, of course, this imaginary creature of yours is ethereal, bloodless, sexless, unnatural, and quite impossible. Now, when she spoke thus, I laid down my pipe and stared. But before I could get my breath, she began again with curling lip and lashes that drooped disdainfully. I quite understand that there can be no woman worthy of Mr. Peter Vibart. She whom he would honour with marriage must be specially created for him. Ah, but some day a woman, a real live woman, will come into his life, and the touch of her hand, the glance of her eyes, the warmth of her breath will dispel this poor, flaccid, misty creature of his imagination, who will fade and fade and vanish into nothingness. And when the real woman has shown him how utterly false— and impossible this dream woman was. Then, Mr. Peter Vibart, I hope she will laugh at you, as I do, and turn her back upon you, as I do, and leave you for the very superior, very pedantic pedant that you are, and scorn you as I do, most of all because you are merely a creature. With the word she flung up her head and stamped her foot at me, and turning swept out through the open door into the moonlight, creature said i and so sat staring at the table and the walls and the floor and the rafters in blank amazement but in a while my amazement growing i went and stood in the doorway looking at charmian but saying nothing and as i watched she began to sing softly to herself and putting up her hand drew the comb from her hair so that it fell down rippling about her neck and shoulders and singing softly thus, she shook her hair about her, so that I saw it curled far below her waist, stooped her head, and parting it upon her neck, drew it over either shoulder, whence it flowed far down over her bosom, in two glorious waves, for the moon, peeping through the rift in the leaves above, sent down her beams to wake small fires in it that came and went, and winked with her breathing. "'Charmian, you have glorious hair,' said I, speaking on the impulse, a thing I rarely do. But Charmian only combed her tresses and went on singing to herself. "'Charmian, 
I said again. What did you mean when you called me a creature? Charmian went on singing. You called me a pedant once before. To be told that I am superior also is most disquieting. I fear my manner must be very unfortunate to afford you such an opinion of me. Charmian went on singing. Naturally, I am much perturbed and doubly anxious to know what you wish me to understand by the epithet creature. Charmian went on singing. Wherefore, seeing she did not intend to answer me, I presently re-entered the cottage. Now, it is ever my custom, when at all troubled or put out in any way, to seek consolation in my books. Hence I now took up my homer, and, trimming the candles, sat down at the table. In a little while Charmian came in, still humming the air of her song, and not troubling even to glance in my direction. Some days before, at her request, I had brought her linen and lace and ribbons from Cranbrook, and these she now took out, together with needle and cotton, and, sitting down at the opposite end of the table, began to sew. She was still humming, and this of itself distracted my mind from the lines before me. Moreover, my eye was fascinated by the gleam of her flying needle, and I began to debate within myself what she was making. It, whatever it might be, was ruffled and edged with lace, and caught here and there with little bows of blue ribband, and from these and diverse other evidences I had concluded it to be a garment of some sort, and was casting about in my mind to account for these bows of ribband, when, glancing up suddenly, she caught my eye. Whereupon, for no reason in the world, I felt suddenly guilty, to hide which I began to search through my pockets for my pipe. "'On the mantel-shelf,' said she, "'what is? Your pipe!' "'Thank you,' said I, and reached it down. "'What are you reading?' she inquired. "'Is it of Helen, or Aspasia, or Phryne?' "'Neither. It is the parting of Hector and Andromache,' I answered. Is it very interesting? Yes. Then why do your eyes wander so often from the page? I know many of the lines by heart, said I, and having lighted my pipe I took up the book and once more began to read. Yet I was conscious all the time of Charmian's flashing needle. Also she had begun to hum again. And after I had endeavoured to read and Charmian had hummed for perhaps five minutes, I lowered my book, and, sighing, glanced at her. "'I am trying to read, Charmian. So I see. And your humming confuses me. It is very quiet outside, Peter. But I cannot read by moonlight, Charmian. Then don't read, Peter.' Here she nibbled her thread with white teeth, and held up what she had been sewing to view the effect of a bow of ribband, with her head very much on one side and I inwardly wondered that she should spend so much care upon such frippery, all senseless bows and laces. "'To hum is a very disturbing habit,' said I. "'To smoke an evil-smelling pipe is worse, much worse, Peter.' "'I beg your pardon,' said I, and laid the offending object back upon the mantel. "'Are you angry, Peter?' "'Not the least. I am only sorry that my smoking annoyed you, had I known before.' It didn't annoy me in the least. But from what you said I understood— No, Peter, you did not understand. You never understand, and I don't think you ever will understand anything but your Helens and Frins, and your Latin and Greek philosophies, and that is what makes you so very annoying and so— so quaintly original. But you certainly found fault with my pipe. Naturally. Didn't you find fault with my humming? Really, said I, really, I fail to see. Of course you do, sighed Charmian, whereupon there fell a silence between us during which she sewed industriously, and I went forth with brave Hector to face the mighty Achilles. But my eye had traversed barely twenty lines when— Peter? Yes. Do you remember my giving you a locket? Yes. Where is it? Oh, I have it still, somewhere. "'Somewhere, sir?' she repeated, glancing at me with raised brows. "'Somewhere safe,' said I, fixing my eyes upon my book. "'It had a ribbon attached, hadn't it?' 
Yes. A pink ribbon, if I remember. Yes, pink. No, it was blue, said I unguardedly. Are you sure, Peter? And here, glancing up, I save that she was watching me beneath her lashes. Yes, I answered. That is, I think so. Then you are not sure? Yes, I am, said I. It was a blue ribbon, and I turned over a page very ostentatiously. Oh, said Charmian, and there was another pause during which I construed probably fifty lines or so. Peter? Well? Where did you say it was now, my locket? I didn't say it was anywhere. No, you said it was somewhere, in a rather vague sort of way, Peter. Well, perhaps I did, said I, frowning at my book. It is not very valuable, but I prized it for association's sake, Peter. Ah, yes, to be sure, said I, feigning to be wholly absorbed. I was wondering if you ever wear it, Peter. "'Wear it!' I exclaimed, glancing furtively down at myself. I was relieved to see that there were no signs of a betraying blue ribbon. "'Wear it!' said I again. "'Why should I wear it?' "'Why, indeed, Peter, unless it was because it was there to wear.' Suddenly she uttered an exclamation of annoyance, and, taking up a candle, began to look about the floor. "'What have you lost?' "'My needle, and I think it must have fallen under the table.' "'And needles are precious in this wilderness. Won't you please help me to find it?' "'With pleasure,' said I, getting down upon my hands and knees, and together we began to hunt for the lost needle. Now, in our search it chanced that we drew near together, and once her hand touched mine, and once her soft hair brushed my cheek, and there stole over me a perfume like the breath of violets, the fragrance that I always associated with her, faint and sweet and alluring so much so that I drew back from further chance of contact and kept my eyes directed to the floor. And after I had sought vainly for some time, I raised my head and looked at Charmian, to find her regarding me with a very strange expression. "'What is it?' I inquired. "'Have you found the needle?' Charmian sat back on her heels and laughed softly. "'Oh, yes, I've found the needle, Peter. That is, I never lost it. Why, then, what, what did you mean? For answer she raised her head and pointed to my breast. Then glancing hurriedly down, I saw that the locket had slipped forward through the bosom of my shirt and hung in plain view. I made an instinctive movement to hide it, but hearing her laugh, looked at her instead. So this was why you asked me to stoop to find your needle? Yes, Peter. Then you knew? Of course I knew. Hm, said I. A distant clock chimed eleven, and Charmian began to fold away her work, seeing which I rose and took up my candle. And pray? Well? And pray, said I, staring hard at the flame of my candle, how did you happen to find out? Very simply, I saw the ribbon round your neck days ago. Good night, Peter. Oh, said I, good night. End of section twenty five, book two, chapter sixteen. Section twenty six of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. THE BROAD HIGHWAY BY GEOFFREY FARNALL CHAPTER Twenty Seven, THE OMEN My lady sweet arise, my lady sweet arise, with everything that pretty is, my lady sweet arise, arise, arise. It was morning, and Charmian was singing. The pure rich notes floated in at my open lattice, and I heard the clatter of her pail as she went to fetch water from the brook. Wherefore I presently stepped out into the sunshine, my coat and neckcloth across my arm, to plunge my head and face into the brook, and carry back the heavy bucket for her, as was my custom. Being come to the brook, I found the brimming bucket, sure enough, but no Charmian. I was looking about wonderingly when she began to sing again, and guided by this I espied her kneeling beside the stream. The water ran deep and very still just here. 
overhung by ash and alder and willow, whose slender curving branches formed a leafy bower wherein she half knelt, half sat, bending over to regard herself in the placid water. For a long moment she remained thus, studying her reflection, intent in this crystal mirror, and little by little her song died away. Then she put up her hands, and began to rearrange her hair with swift, dexterous fingers, apostrophizing her watery image the while in this wise. "'My dear, you are growing positively apple-cheeked. I vow you are. Your enemies might almost call you strapping, alack. And then your complexion, my dear, your adorable complexion.' She went on with a rueful shake of her head. "'You are as brown as a gypsy. Not that you need go breaking your heart over it, for between you and me, my dear, I think it rather improves you. The pity of it is that you have no one to appreciate you properly, to render to your charms the homage they deserve. No one, not a soul, my dear, your hermit, bless you, can see or think of nothing that exists out of a book, which between you and me, and the bucket yonder, is perhaps just as well. And yet, hi yo, to be so lovely and so forlorn, Indeed, I could shed tears for you if it would not make your eyelids swell and your classic nose turn red. Here she sighed again, and taking a tendril of hair between her fingers, transformed it, very cleverly, into a small curl. Yes, your tan certainly becomes you, my dear, she went on, nodding to her reflection. Not that he will ever notice, dear heart, no. Were you suddenly to turn as black as a hottentot before his very eyes, he would go on serenely smoking his pipe and talk to you of Epictetus. hi yo sighing thus she broke off a spray of leaves and proceeded to twine them in among the lustrous coils of her hair bending over her reflection meanwhile and turning her head this way and that to note the effect yes she said at last nodding to her image with a satisfied air that touch of green sets off your gypsy complexion admirably my dear i could positively kiss you i vow i could and i am hard to please saint anthony himself meeting you alone in the desert would at least have run away from you and that would have been some tribute to your charms. But our philosopher will just glance at you with his slow, grave smile, and tell you in his solemn, affable way that it is a very fine morning. Hi o oh. Here, somewhat late in the day, perhaps, perceiving that I was playing eavesdropper, I moved cautiously away, and taking up the pail, returned to the cottage. I now filled the kettle and set it upon the fire, and proceeded to spread the cloth, a luxurious institution of Charmian's on which she insisted, and to lay out the breakfast things. In the midst of which, however, chancing to fall into a reverie, I became oblivious of all things, till roused by a step behind me, and turning, beheld Charmian standing, with the glory of the sun about her, like the spirit of summer herself, broad of hip and shoulder, yet slender and long of limb, all warmth and life, and long soft curves from throat to ankle, perfect with vigorous youth from the leaves that crowned her beauty, to the foot that showed beneath her gown. And as I gazed upon her, silent and wondering, lo, though her mouth was solemn, yet there was laughter in her eyes as she spoke. Well, sir, have you no greeting for me? It is a very fine morning, said I. And now the merriment overflowed her eyes, and she laughed, yet blushed a little too, and lowered her eyes from mine, and said, still laughing, Oh, Peter, the teapot, do mind the teapot. Teapot, I repeated, and then I saw that I still held it in my hand. Pray, sir, what might you be going to do with the teapot in one hand and that fork in the other? I was going to make tea, I remember, said I. Is that why you were standing there staring at the kettle while it boiled over? I forgot all about the kettle, said I. So Charmian took the teapot from me and set about brewing the tea, singing merrily the while. Anon she began to fry the bacon, giving each individual slice its due amount of care and attention. But her eyes chancing to meet mine, the song died upon her lip. Her lashes flickered and fell while up from throat to brow there crept a slow, hot wave of crimson, and in that moment I turned away and strode down to the brook. Now it happened that I came to that same spot where she had leaned, and flinging myself down I fell to studying my reflection in the water, even as she had done. Heretofore, though, I had paid scant heed to my appearance. I had been content, in a certain impersonal sort of way, had dressed in the fashion, and taken advantage of such adornments as were in favor, as much from habit as from any set design. But now, lying beside the brook with my chin propped in my hands, I began to study myself critically, feature by feature, as I had never dreamed of doing before. Mirrored in the clear waters I beheld a face lean and brown, and with lank black hair. Eyes, dark and of a strange brilliance, looked at me from beneath a steep prominence of brow. I saw a somewhat high-bridged nose, 
with thin, nervous nostrils, a long cleft chin, and a disdainful mouth. Truly a saturnine face, cold and dark and unlovely, and thus, even as I gazed, the mouth grew still more disdainful, the heavy brow lowered blacker and more forbidding, and yet in that same moment I found myself sighing, while I strove to lend some order to the wildness of my hair. Fool, said I, and plunged my head beneath the water, and held it there so long that I came up puffing and blowing. Whereupon I caught up the towel, and fell to rubbing myself vigorously, so that presently, looking down into the water again, I saw that my hair was wilder than ever, all rubbed into long elf-locks. Straight away I lifted my hands, and would have smoothed it somewhat, but checked the impulse. Let be, said I to myself, turning away, let be. I am as I am, and shall be henceforth in very truth a village blacksmith, and content so to be, absolutely content. At sight of me, Charmian burst out laughing, the which, though I had expected it, angered me nevertheless. Why, Peter, she exclaimed, you look like a very low fellow, said I, say a village blacksmith who has been at his ablutions. If you only had rings in your ears and a scarf round your neck, you'd be the image of a Spanish brigand, or like the man Mina, whose exploits the Gazette is full of. A Spanish general, I think. A guerrilla leader, said I, taking my place at the table, and a singularly cold-blooded villain. Indeed, I think it probable that we much resemble one another. Is it any wonder I am shunned by my kind, avoided by the ignorant, and regarded askance by the rest? Why, Peter, said Charmian, regarding me with grave eyes, what do you mean? I mean that the country folk hereabout go out of their way to avoid crossing my path, not that I suppose they ever heard of Mina, but because of my looks. Your looks? They think me possessed of the evil eye or some such folly. May I cut you a piece of bread? Oh, Peter! Already by diverse honest-hearted rustics I am credited with having cast a deadly spell upon certain unfortunate pigs, with having fought hand to hand with the hosts of the nethermost pit, and with having sold my soul to the devil. May I trouble you to pass the butter? Oh, Peter, how foolish of them! And how excusable, considering their ignorance and superstition, said I. Mine, I am well aware, is not a face to win me the heart of man, woman, or child. They, especially women and children, share in common with dogs and horses that divine attribute which, for want of a better name, we'll call instinct, whereby they love or hate for the mere tone of a voice, the glance of an eye, the motion of a hand. The love or hate, once given, the prejudice for or against, is seldom wholly overcome. Indeed, said Charmian. I believe in first impressions. Being a woman, said I. Being a woman, she nodded, and the instinct of dog and child and woman has often proved true in the end. Surely instinct is always true, said I. I'd thank you for another cup of tea. Yet, strangely enough, dogs generally make friends with me very readily, and the few children to whom I've spoken have neither screamed nor run away from me. Still, as I said before, I'm aware that my looks are scarcely calculated to gain the love of man, woman, or child. Not that it matters greatly, seeing that I am likely to hold very little converse with either. There is one woman, Peter, to whom you've talked by the hour together, and who is doubtless weary enough of it all, more especially of Epictetus and Trojan Helen. Two lumps of sugar, Peter? Thank you. Women are very like flowers, I began. That is a very profound remark, sir, more especially coming from one who has studied and knows womankind so deeply. And it is a pity that they should be allowed to waste their sweetness on the desert air. And philosophical blacksmiths, Peter? More so if they be poor blacksmiths. I said philosophical, Peter. You probably find your situation horribly lonely here? I went on after a pause. Yes, it's nice and lonely, Peter. And undoubtedly this cottage is very poor and mean and, er, humble. Charmian smiled and shook her head. But then Charmian Brown is a very humble person. And you haven't even the luxury of a mirror to dress your hair by. Is it so very clumsily dressed, sir? No, no, said I hastily. Indeed, I was thinking, well, Peter, that it was very beautiful. Why, you told me that last night. Come, what do you think of it this morning? With those leaves in it, it is even more so. Charmian laughed, and rising, swept me a stately curtsy. After all, sir, we find there to be exceptions to every rule. You mean even blacksmiths. And in a while, having finished my breakfast, I rose, and taking my hat bade Charmian good morning, and so came to the door. But on the threshold I turned and looked back at her. She had risen and stood leaning with one hand on the table. Now in the other she held the bread knife, and her eyes were upon mine. And lo, wonder of wonders, once again, but this time sudden and swift, up from the round full column of her throat, up over cheek and brow, there rushed that vivid tide of color. 
her eyes grew suddenly deep and soft, and then were hidden neath her lashes, and in that same moment the knife slipped from her grasp, and falling point downward stood quivering in the floor between us, an ugly thing that gleamed evilly. Was this an omen, a sign, vouchsafed of that which dark and terrible, was even then marching to meet us on this broad highway? Oh, blind, and more than blind! Almost before it had ceased to quiver, I stooped, and plucking it from the floor, gave it into her hand. Now as I did so, her fingers touched mine, and moved by a sudden impulse, I stooped, and pressed my lips upon them, kissed them, quick and fierce, and so turned and hurried upon my way. Yet as I went, I found that the knife had cut my chin, and that I was bleeding. Oh, blind and more than blind, surely this was a warning, an omen to heed, to shiver over, despite the warm sun. But seeing the blood, I laughed and strode villageward, blithe of heart and light of foot, oh, blind and more than blind. End of The Omen Section 27 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Section 27 Book 2 Chapter 18 in which I hear news of Sir Maurice Vibart. Which I says, Lord love me. I plunged the iron back into the fire, and, turning my head, espied a figure standing in the doorway, and, though the leather hat and short round jacket had been superseded by a smart groom's livery, I recognized the postilion. So help me, Bob, if this ain't a piece o' luck, he exclaimed, and, with the words, he removed his hat and fell to combing his short, thick hair with the handle of his whip. I'm glad you think so, said I. You can drown me if I ain't, said he. And, pray, how is the gentleman who happened to fall and hurt himself? if you remember, in the storm? Appen to fall and ert his self, repeated the postilion, winking knowingly, ert his self, says you, walker, says I, walker, with which he laid his forefinger against the side of his nose and winked again. What might you be pleased to mean? I means as a gent appen to fall in the dark may p'raps cut his ed open, but he don't give hisself two black eyes, a bloody nose, a split lip, and three broken ribs, all at once. It ain't natural, which if you says contrary, I remarks, Walker, Lord, continued the postilion, seeing I did not speak, Lord, it must have been a pretty warm go while it lasted. You put him to sleep sound enough. It took me over an hour to Tunbridge and he never moved till he'd been put to bed at the checkers and a doctor sent for ah and a nice time i ad of it what with chambermaids a runnin up and down stairs to see the poor gentleman and everybody a starin at me and a shakin their eds and all a axin questions one atop o the other till the doctor come ow did this appen me man says e a haxident says i a haxident says the doctor wi a look in his eye as i didn't just like ah says i fell on is ed out o the chase says i struck a stone or summit says i did he fall of his own accord says the doctor ah for sure says i oomph says the doctor what with his eyes and his nose and his lip looks to me as if some one ad elped him then you must be a damn fool says a voice and there's my gentleman number one you know a sittin up in bed and a doin his artist to frown sir says the doctor 
sir to you says my gentleman this honest fellow tells the truth i did fall out o the accursed chase and be damned to you says e don't excite yourself says the doctor in your present condition it would be dangerous then be so good as to go to the devil says my gentleman i will says the doctor and off e goes hi there you says my gentleman callin to me as soon as we were alone this accursed business as played the devil with me and i need a servant how much do you want to stay wi' me twenty-five shillin a week says i doin myself proud while i add the chance i'll give ye thirty says e what's ye name jacob trimble sir says i and a most accursed name it is i'll call you parks says e and when i ring let no one answer but yourself you can go parks ann parks get me another doctor well pursued the postilion seating himself near by we'd been there a couple o weeks and though he was better and his face near well again he still kept to his room when one day a smart phaeton and blood osses drives up and out steps a fine gentleman one of them pale sleepy sort i was a standin in the yard brushin my master's coat a bottle green with silver buttons each button avin what they calls a monogram stamped on to it ha me man says the sleepy gent steppin up to me a fine coat deuced fashionable cut curse me your master's yes sir says i brushin away silver buttons too says the gent let me see ah yes a v yes to be sure ave the goodness to step to your master and say as a gentleman begs to see him can't be done sir says i me master ain't seein nobody bein in indifferent elth nonsense says the gentleman yawnin and slippin a guinea into me and just run like a good feller and tell him as i bear a message from george from oo says i from george says the gent smilin and yawnin just say from george so to come to the end of it up i goes and finds me master walkin up and down and a swearin to isself as usual a gentleman to see you sir says i why devil burn your miserable carcass says e didn't i tell you as i'd seen nobody ay but this ere gent's a sayin e as a message from george sir my master raised both clenched fists above is ed and swore ah better than i'd heard for many a long day as ever downstairs e goes cursin on every stair in a time e comes back parks says e do you remember that that place where we got lost in the storm parks ah sir says i well go there at once says e and well e give me certain orders jumps into the phaeton with the sleepy gentleman and they drive off together and accordin to orders ere i am a very interesting story said i and so you are a groom now ah and you are a blacksmith eh yes well if it don't beat everything as i ever heard i'm a stiffen that's all what do you mean i means my droppin in on you like this ear just as if you wasn't the one man in all england as i was hopeful to drop in on and you find me very busy said i lord love me said the postilion combing his hair so very hard that it wrinkled his brow i comes up from tonbridge this ere very afternoon and avin drunk a pint over at the bull yonder 
and axed questions as none o they chaw bacons could give answer to i ears the chink o your ammer and comin over ear chance like i finds you i'll be gormed if it ain't the most unnatural and why cause you was the very identical chap as i come up from tonbridge to find were you sent to find me easy a bit you're a blacksmith ain't you i told you so before what's more you looks a blacksmith in that there leather apron and wi your face all smutty to be sure you're powerful like im number one as was my master as now is did he send you to find me some folks might take you for a gentleman meeting you off and like but i knows different as how well i never eard of a gentleman turnin isself into a blacksmith afore for one thing still one might i ventured no answered the postilion with a decisive shake of the head it's agin nater when a gentleman gets down in the world and as to do summit for a living he generally shoots hisself ah and i've knowed em to do it too and then i've noticed as you don't swear nor yet curse not even a dam seldom said i but what of that i've seed a deal o quality in my time one way or another many's the fine gentleman as of druv or groomed for and never a one on em as didn't curse me ah said the postilion sighing and shaking his head ow they did curse me specially one a young lord uncommon fond o me e were too in his way to the day his oss fell and rolled on him jacob says e short like for e were a goin fast jacob says e damn your infernally ugly mug says e you bet me as that cursed brute would do for me i did my lord says i and i remembered as the tears were a runnin down all our faces as we carried him along on the five barred gate that be an andiest well devil take your soul you were right jacob and be damned to you says e you'll find a tenner in my coat pocket ere you've won it for i shan't last the day out jacob and he didn't either for he died afore we got him ome and left me a hundred pound in his will ah gentlemen as his gents is all the same lord love you there never was one on em but damned my legs or my liver or the chase or the osses or the road or the inns or all on em together if you was to strip me as naked as the palm o your and and to strip a lord or a earl or a gentleman as naked as the palm o your and and was to place us side by side where'd be the difference we're both men both flesh and blood ain't we then where'd be the difference ooze to tell which is lord and which is the postilion who indeed said i setting down my hammer jack is often as good as his master and a great deal better why nobody nodded the postilion not a soul till we opened our mouths and then twould be easy enough for my lord or earl or gentleman being naked and not liking it which would only be natural would fall a swearin evans ard damning everybody and cursin everything and never stop to think while i not bein born to it should stand there a shiverin and tryin a curse or two myself maybe but lord mine wouldn't amount to nothin at all me not bein naturally gifted nor yet born to it and this brings me round to er her ah er number two er as quarrelled wit number one all the way from london er as run away from number one what about er 
here he fell to combing his hair again with his whip handle while his quick bright eyes dodged from my face to the glowing forge and back again and his clean-shaven lips pursed themselves in a soundless whistle and as i watched him it seemed to me that this was the question that had been in his mind all along seeing she did manage to run away from him number one she is probably very well i answered ah to be sure very well you say ah to be sure said the postilion apparently lost in the contemplation of the bellows and where might she be now that i am unable to tell you said i and began to blow up the fire while the postilion watched me sucking the handle of his whip reflectively you work uncommon ard drowned me if you don't pretty hard i nodded and gets well paid for it perhaps not so well as i could wish said i not so well as he could wish nodded the postilion apparently addressing the sledge-hammer for his gaze was fixed upon it of course not the arder a man works the wuss he gets paid how much did you say you got a week i named no sum i replied well how much might you be gettin a week ten shillings gets ten shillin a week he nodded to the sledge-hammer that ain't much for a chap like im kick me if it is yet i make it do very well the postilion became again absorbed in contemplation of the bellows indeed he studied them so intently viewing them with his head now on one side now on the other that i fell to watching him under my brows and so presently caught him furtively watching me hereupon he drew his whip from his mouth and spoke supposing said he and stopped well i inquired and leaning upon my hammer i looked him square in the eye supposing what are you a-staring at my feller you have said supposing twice well well said he fixing his eye upon the bellows again supposing you was to make a guinea over and above your wages this week i should be very much surprised said i you would i certainly should then why not surprise yourself you must speak more plainly said i well then said the postilion still with his gaze abstracted supposin i was to place a guinea down on that their anvil o' yours would that elp you to remember where number two er might be no it wouldn't no a guinea's a lot o money it is i nodded and you say it wouldn't it would not said i then say oh say two pun ten and have done with it no said i shaking my head what not do you say no to two pun ten i do well let's say three pound i shook my head and drawing the iron from the fire began to hammer at it well then shouted the postilion for i was making as much din as possible say four five ten fifteen twenty-five fifty here i ceased hammering tell me when you've done said i you're a cool customer you are ah and a rummun at that i never see a rummer other people have thought the same said i examining the half-finished horseshoe ere i set it back in the fire sixty guineas said the postilion gloomily 
come again said i seventy then said he his gloom deepening once more said i a hundred one hundred guineas said he removing his hat to mop at his brow any more i inquired no returned the postilion sulkily putting on his hat i'm done did he set the figure at a hundred guineas said i i'm oh he's mad for er he is it ruin his self body and soul for er he would but i ain't going to offer no more no woman has ever breathed no matter ow ansome and upstandin is worth more na hundred guineas it ain't as if she was a blood mare and i'm done then i wish you good day but just think a hundred guineas is a fortune it is said i come think it over said the postilion persuasively think it over now let me fully understand you then said i you propose to pay me one hundred guineas on behalf of your master known heretofore as number one for such information as shall enable him to discover the whereabouts of a certain person known as her number two is that how the matter stands ah that's ow it stands nodded the postilion the money to be yours as soon as ever e lays his ands on her is it a go no 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 why you must be stark starin mad that you must unless you're sweet on er yourself you talk like a fool said i angrily so you are sweet on er then yes said i fool and dropping my hammer i made towards him but he darted nimbly to the door where seeing i did not pursue he paused i may be a hass he nodded and i may be a fool but i don't go a fallin in love wi ladies as is above me and out o my reach and i don't chuck away a hundred guineas for one as ain't likely to look my way not me which i begs leave to say hass yourself and likewise fool bah with which expletive he set his thumb to his nose spread out his fingers wagged them and swaggered off above me and out of my reach one not likely to look my way and in due season having finished the horseshoe having set each tool in its appointed place in the racks and raked out the clinkers from the fire i took my hat and coat and closing the door behind me set out for the hollow end of section twenty seven book two chapter eighteen section twenty eight of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Section 28. Book 2. Chapter 19. How I Met Black George Again, and Wherein the Patient Reader Shall Find a Little Blood it was evening that time before the moon is up and when the earth is dark as yet and full of shadows now as i went by some chance there recurred to me the words of an old song i had read somewhere years ago words written in the glorious brutal knightly days of edward the first of warlike memory and the words ran thus for her love i cark and care for her love i droop and dare for her love my bliss is bare and i wax wan 
I wonder what poor, lovesick, long-dead and forgotten fool wrote that, I said aloud. For her love, in sleep I slake. For her love, all night I wake. For her love, I mourning make. More than any man. Some doughy squire at arms, or perhaps some wandering knight, probably of a dark, unlovely look, who rode the forest ways with his thoughts full of her, and dreaming of her loveliness. Howbeit, he was, beyond all doubt, a fool and a great one, said I, for it is to be inferred, from these few words he has left us, that his love was hopeless. She was, perhaps, proud and of high estate, one who was above him, and far beyond his reach, who was not likely even to look his way. Doubtless she was beautiful, and therefore haughty and disdainful, for disdainful pride is an attribute of beauty, and ever was and ever will be. And hence it came that our misfortunate squire, or knight-errant, was scorned for his pains, poor fool! which yet was his own fault, after all, and, indeed, his just reward, for what has any squire at arms or lusty knight, with the world before him, and glory yet unachieved, to do with love? Love is a bauble, a toy, a pretty pastime for idle folk who have no thought above such. Away with it! Bah! And, in my mind, that is to say, mentally, I set my thumb to my nose, and spread my fingers, and wagged them, even as the postilion had done. And yet, despite this, the words of the old song recurred again and again, pathetically insistent, voicing themselves in my footsteps so that, to banish them, I presently stood still and in that very moment a gigantic figure came bursting through the hedge, clearing the ditch in a single bound, and Black George confronted me. Haggard of face, with hair and beard matted and unkempt, his clothes all dusty and torn, he presented a very wild and terrible appearance, and beneath one arm he carried two bludgeons. The peddler had spoken truly, then, and, as I met the giant's smoldering eye, I felt my mouth become suddenly parched and dry, and the palms of my hands grew moist and clammy. For a moment neither of us spoke, only we looked at each other steadily in the eye, and I saw the hair of his beard bristle, and he raised one great hand to the collar of his shirt, and tore it open as if it were strangling him. "'George,' I said at last, and held out my hand. "'George never stirred. "'Won't you shake hands, George?' "'His lips opened, but no words came. "'Had I known where to look for you, "'I should have sought you out days ago,' I went on. "'As it is I have been wishing to meet you, "'hoping to set matters right.' Once again his lips opened, but still no word came. You see, Prudence is breaking her heart over you. A laugh burst from him, sudden and harsh. You, my liar, said he, and his voice quavered strangely. I speak gospel truth, said I. I be note to prue since the day you beat me at the ammer throwin, and ye know it. Prudence loves you, and always has, said I. Go back to her, George, go back to her, and to your work be the man I know you are. Go back to her, she loves you. If you still doubt my word, here, read that, and I held out his own letter the letter on which Prudence had written those four words, George, I love you. He took it from me, crumpled it slowly in his hand and tossed it into the ditch. You, my liar, he said again, 
an a uh, coward and you said i are a fool a blind gross selfish fool who in degrading yourself in skulking about the woods and lanes is bringing black shame and sorrow to as sweet a maid as ever it don't need you to tell me what she be and what she bean't said black george in a low repressed voice i knowed her long before you ever set eyes on her grew up wi her i did and i bean't deaf nor blind ye see i loved her all my life that's why one o us two's a gonna lie a ear all night ah and all tomorrow likewise if summon don't chance to find us saying which he forced a cudgel into my hand what do you mean george i means as if you don't do for me then i be a gonna do for e but why i cried in god's name why i be slow p'raps and thick p'raps but i be ain't a fool come man if she be worth winnin she be worth fightin for but i tell you she loves black george and no other she never had any thought of me or i of her this is madness and worse and i tossed the cudgel aside and i tell ee broke in the smith his repression giving way before a fury as fierce as it was sudden i tell ee you be a liar and a coward i know i know i heerd and i've seen your lion coward's tongue shan't save ee oh ye cod wi your white face and tremblin ands you be a shame to the woman as loves ye and the woman as bore ye stand up i say or by god i'll do for ee and he raised his weapon without another word i picked up the cudgel and pointing to a gate a little farther along the road i led the way into the meadow beyond on the other side of this meadow ran the lane i have mentioned before and beyond the lane was the hollow and glancing thitherward i bethought me that supper would be ready and charmaine waiting for me just about now and i sighed i remember as i drew off my coat and laid it together with my hat under the hedge the moon was beginning to rise casting the magic of her pale loveliness upon the world and as i rolled up my sleeves i glanced round about me with an eye that strove to take in the beauty of all things of hedge and tree and winding road the gloom of wood the sheen of water and the far soft sweep of hill and dale over all these my glance lingered yearningly for it seemed to me that this look might be my last and now as i stooped and gripped my weapon i remembered how i had that morning kissed her fingers and i was strangely comforted and glad the night air which had been warm heretofore struck chilly now and as i stood up fronting black george i shivered seeing which he laughed short and fierce and with the laugh came at me striking downwards at my head as he came and tough wood met tough wood with a shock that jarred me from wrist to shoulder to hit him upon the arm and disable him was my one thought and object i therefore watched for an opening parrying his swift strokes and avoiding his rushes as well as i might time and again our weapons crashed together now above my head now to right or left sometimes rattling in quick succession sometimes with pauses between strokes pauses filled in with the sound of heavy breathing and the ceaseless thud of feet upon the sward i was already bruised in a half a dozen places my right hand and arm felt numb and with a shooting pain in the shoulder that grew more acute with every movement my breath also was beginning to labor yet still black george pressed on untiring relentless 
showering blow on blow, while my arm grew ever weaker and weaker, and the pain in my shoulder throbbed more intensely. How long had we fought? Five minutes, ten, half an hour, an hour? I could see the sweat gleaming upon his cheek, his eyes were wild, his mouth gaped open, and he drew his breath in great sobbing pants. But, as I looked, his cudgel broke through my tired guard, and, taking me full upon the brow, drove me reeling back. My weapon slipped from my grasp, and, blinded with blood, I staggered to and fro, like a drunken man, and presently slipped to the grass. And how sweet it was to lie thus, with my cheek upon kind Mother Earth, to stretch my aching body, and with my weary limbs at rest. But Black George stood above me, panting, and, as his eyes met mine, he laughed. A strange-sounding, broken laugh, and rolled up his cudgel, to beat out my brains, even as the peddler had foretold. Tomorrow the blackbird would sing upon my motionless breast, and, looking into Black George's eyes, I smiled. Get up, he panted, and lowered the cudgel. Get up, or, by God, I'll do, for e. Sighing, I rose, and took the cudgel he held out to me, wiping the blood from my eyes as I did so. And now, as I faced him once more, all things vanished from my ken save the man before me. He filled the universe, and, even as he leaped upon me, I leaped upon him, and struck with all my strength. There was a jarring, splintering shock, and Black George was beaten down upon his knees, but as, dropping my weapon, I stepped forward, he rose, and stood panting, and staring at the broken cudgel in his hand. "'George,' said I. "'You ma bleedin', Peter.' "'For that matter, so are you. "'Bloodlettin' be. Good for a man. Sometimes eases un.' "'It does,' I panted. "'Perhaps you are willing to hear reason.' now we be even so far but fists be better nor sticks any day and i be gone to try ye with fists have we not bled each other sufficiently no cried george between set teeth there be more nor bloodlettin betwixt you and me I said as ow one of us would lie out ere all night, and so ye shall. By God, come on, fists be best arter all. This was the heyday of boxing, and, while at Oxford I had earned some small fame at the sport, but it was one thing to spar with a man my own weight in a padded ring, with limited rounds governed by a code of rules, and quite another to fight a man like Black George, in a lonely meadow, by light of moon. Moreover, he was well acquainted with the science, as I could see from the way he shaped, the only difference between us being that whereas he fought with feet planted square and wide apart, I balanced myself upon my toes, which is, I think, to be commended as being quicker, and more calculated to lessen the impact of a blow. Brief though the respite had been, it had served me to recover my breath, and, though my head yet wrung from the cudgel stroke, and the blood still flowed freely, getting, every now and then, into my eyes, my brain was clear as we fronted each other for what we both knew must be the decisive bout. The smith stood with his mighty shoulders stooped something forward, his left arm drawn back, his right flung across his chest, and, so long as we fought, I watched that great fist and knotted forearm, for, though he struck oftener with his left, it was in that passive right that I thought my danger really lay. It is not my intention to chronicle this fight blow by blow. 
enough and more than enough has already been said in that regard suffice it then that as the fight progressed i found that i was far quicker as i had hoped and that the majority of his blows i either blocked or avoided easily enough time after time his fist shot over my shoulder or over my head and time after time i countered heavily now on his body now on his face once he staggered and once i caught a momentary glimpse of his features convulsed with pain he was smeared with blood from the waist up but still he came on i fought desperately now savagely taking advantage of every opening for though i struck him four times to his once yet his blows had four times the weight of mine my forearms were bruised to either elbow and my breath came in gasps and always i watched that deadly right and presently it came with arm and shoulder and body behind it quick as a flash and resistless as a cannonball but i was ready and as i leaped i struck and struck him clean and true upon the angle of the jaw and spinning round black george fell and lay with his arms wide stretched and face buried in the grass slowly slowly he got upon his knees and thence to his feet and so stood panting hideous with blood and sweat bruised and cut and disfigured staring at me as one in amaze now as i looked my heart went out to him and i reached forth my right hand george i panted oh george but black george only looked at me and shook his head and groaned oh peter said he you be a man peter i fought ah many's the time and no man ever knocked me down afore oh peter i i could love ee for it if i didn't hate the very sight of ee come on and let's get it over and done with so once again fists were clenched and jaws set once again came the trampling of feet the hiss of breath and the thudding shock of blows given and taken a sudden jarring impact the taste of sulphur on my tongue a gathering darkness before my eyes and knowing this was the end i strove desperately to close with him but i was dazed blind my arms fell paralyzed and in that moment the smith's right fist drove forward a jagged flame shot up to heaven the earth seemed to rush up towards me a roaring blackness engulfed me and then silence end of section twenty eight book two chapter nineteen section twenty nine of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by ellen preckle the broad highway by geoffrey farnall chapter twenty how i came up out of the dark someone was calling to me a long way off someone was leaning down from a great height to call to me in the depths and the voice was wonderfully sweet but faint faint because the height was so very high and the depths so very great and still the voice called and called and i felt sorry that i could not answer because as i say the voice was troubled and wonderfully sweet and little by little it seemed that it grew nearer this voice it was descending to me in these depths of blackness or was i being lifted up to the heights where i knew blackness could not be i indeed i was being lifted for i could feel a hand upon my brow a smooth cool hand that touched my cheek and brushed the hair from my forehead a strong gentle hand it was with soft fingers and it was lifting me up and up from the loathly depths which seemed more black and more horrible the further i drew from them and so i heard the voice nearer 
and ever nearer, until I could distinguish words. And the voice had tears in it, and the words were very tender. Peter, speak, speak to me, Peter. Charmian, said I within myself, why, truly, whose hand but hers could have lifted me out of that gulf of death, back to light and life? Yet I did not speak aloud, for I had no mind to yet a while. Ah, speak to me, speak to me, Peter! How can you lie there so still and pale? And now her arms were about me, strong and protecting, and my head was drawn down upon her bosom. Oh, Peter! My Peter! Nay, but this was Charmian, the cold, proud Charmian? Truly, I had never heard that thrill in her voice before. Could this indeed be Charmian? And lying thus, with my head on this sweet pillow, I could hear her heart whispering to me, and it seemed that it was striving to tell me something. Striving! Striving to tell me something! Could I but understand! Ah! Could I but understand! I waited for you so long, so long, Peter, and the supper's all spoiled. A rabbit, Peter! You liked rabbit, and— Oh, God, I want you. Don't you hear me, Peter? I want you. Want you. And now her cheek was pressed to mine, and her lips were upon my hair and upon my brow. Her lips! Was this indeed Charmian, and was I Peter Vibart? Ah, if I could but know what it was in her heart was trying to tell me so quickly and passionately. And while I lay listening, listening, something hot splashed down upon my cheek, and then another, and another, her bosom heaved tumultuously, and instinctively raising my arms, I clasped them about her. Don't, I said, and my voice was a whisper. Don't, Charmian. For a moment her clasp tightened about me. She was all tenderness and clinging warmth. Then I heard a sudden gasp. Her arms loosened and fell away, and so I presently raised my head, and supporting myself upon my hand, looked at her. And then I saw her cheeks were burning. Peter. Yes, Charmian. Did you— she paused, plucking nervously at the grass and looking away from me. Well, Charmian, did you hear? Again she broke off, and still her head was averted. I heard your voice calling to me from a great way off, and so I came, Charmian. Were you conscious when, when I found you? No, I answered. I was lying in a very deep black pit. Here she looked at me again. I, I thought you were dead, Peter. My soul was out of my body until you recalled it. You were lying upon your back by the hedge here, and, oh, Peter, your face was white and shining in the moonlight, and there was blood upon it, and you looked like one that is dead, and she shivered. And you have brought me back to life, said I, rising, but being upon my feet, I staggered giddily to hide which I laughed and leaned back against a tree. Indeed, said I. I am very much alive still, and monstrously hungry. You spoke of a rabbit, I think? A rabbit, said Charmian in a whisper, and as I met her eye, I would have given much to have recalled that thoughtless speech. I, I think you did mention a rabbit, I said, floundering deeper. So then, you deceived me. You lay there and deceived me with your eyes shut and your ears open, taking advantage of my pity. No, no, indeed no, I thought myself still dreaming it. It all seemed so unreal, so... So beyond all belief and possibility, and I stopped, aghast at my crass folly, for with a cry she sprang to her feet and hid her face in her hands, while I stood dumbfounded like the fool I was. When she looked up, her eyes seemed to scorch me, and I thought Mr. Vibart a man of honor, like a knight of his old-time romances, high and chivalrous. Oh, I thought him a gentleman! Instead of which, said I, speaking as it were despite myself, instead of which you find me only a blacksmith, a low despicable fellow, eager to take advantage of your unprotected womanhood. She did not speak, standing tall and straight, her head thrown back, wherefore, reading her scorn of me in her eyes, seeing the proud contempt of her mouth, a very demon seemed suddenly to possess me, for certainly the laugh that rang from my lip proceeded from no volition of mine. And yet, madam, my voice went on, this despicable blacksmith fellow refused one hundred guineas for you to-day. Peter, she cried, and shrank away from me as if I'd threatened to strike her. Ah, you start at that. Your proud lip trembles. Do not fear, madam. The sum did not tempt him, though a large one. Peter, she cried again, and now there was a note of appeal in her voice. Indeed, madam, even so degraded a fellow as this blacksmith could not very well sell that which he does not possess, could he? And so the hundred guineas go a-begging, and you are still unsold. Long before I had done, she covered her face again, and coming near, I saw the tears running out between her fingers and sparkling as they fell, 
and once again the devil within me laughed loud and harsh. But while it still echoed I had flung myself down at her feet. "'Charmian!' I cried. "'Forgive me! You will! You must!' And kneeling before her I strove to catch her gown and kiss its hem, but she drew it close about her, and turning, fled from me through the shadows. Heedless of all else but that she was leaving me, I stumbled to my feet and followed. The trees seemed to beset me as I ran, and bushes reached out arms to stay me, but I burst from them, running wildly, blundering, for she was going, Charmian was leaving me, and so spent and panting I reached the cottage and met Charmian at the door. She was clad in the long cloak she had worn when she came, and the hood was drawn close about her face. I stood panting in the doorway, barring her exit. Let me pass, Peter. By God, no! I cried, and entering, closed the door, and leaned my back against it. And after we had stood thus a while, each looking upon the other, I reached out my hands to her, and my hands were torn and bloody. Don't go, Charmian, I mumbled. Don't go. Oh, Charmian, I I'm hurt. I didn't want you to know, but you mustn't leave me. I'm not well. It is my head, I think. I met Black George, and he was too strong for me. I'm deaf, Charmian, and half-blinded. Oh, don't leave me. I'm afraid, Charmian. Her figure grew more blurred and indistinct, and I sank down upon my knees. But in the dimness I reached out and found her hands and clasped them, and bowed my aching head upon them, and remained thus a great while, it seemed to me. And presently, through the mist, her voice reached me. Oh, Peter, I will not leave you. Lean on me. There, there. And little by little those strong, gentle hands drew me up once more to light and life. And so she got me to a chair, and brought cool water, and washed the blood and sweat from me, as she had done once before. Only now my hurts were deeper, for my head grew beyond my strength to support, and hung upon my breast, and my brain throbbed with fire, and a mist was ever before my eyes. Are you in much pain, Peter? My head, only my head, Charmian. There's a bell ringing there. N no, it's a hammer beating. And indeed I remembered little for a while, save the touch of her hand and the soothing murmur of her voice, until I found she was kneeling beside me, feeding me with broth from a spoon. Wherefore I presently took the basin from her, and emptied it at a gulp, and finding myself greatly revived thereby, made some shift to eat of the supper she set before me. So she presently came and sat beside me, and ate also, watching me at each morsel. "'Your poor hands,' said she, and looked down at them. I saw that my knuckles were torn and broken, and the fingers much swelled. "'And yet,' said Charmian, "'except for the cut on your head you are quite unmarked, Peter.' He fought mostly for the body, I answered, and I managed to keep my face out of the way. But he caught me twice, once upon the chin lightly, and once behind the ear heavily. Had his fist landed fairly, I don't think even you could have brought me back from those loathly depths, Charmian. And in a while, supper being done, she brought my pipe and filled it, and held the light for me. But my head throbbed woefully, and for once the tobacco was flavorless, so I sighed and laid the pipe by. "'Why, Peter,' said Charmian, regarding me with an anxious frown, "'can't you smoke?' "'Not just now, Charmian,' said I, and leaning my head in my hands, fell into a sort of coma, till feeling her touch upon my shoulder I started and looked up. "'You must go to bed, Peter.' "'No,' said I. "'Yes, Peter.' "'Very well, Charmian, yes. I will go to bed.' And I rose. "'Do you feel better now, Peter?' "'Thank you, yes, much better. Then why do you hold on to the chair?' I'm still a little giddy, but it will pass. And, Charmian, you forgive— Yes, yes, don't. Don't look at me like that, Peter, and— Oh, good night, foolish boy. I am twenty-five, Charmian. But as she turned away, I saw that there were tears in her eyes. Dressed as I was, I lay down upon my bed, and burying my head in the pillow groaned, for my pain was very sore. Indeed, I was to feel the effects of George's fist for many a day to come and it seems to me now that much of the morbid imaginings, the nightly horrors, and black despair that I endured in the time which immediately followed, was chiefly owing to that terrible blow upon the head. End of How I Came Up Out of the Dark Section 30 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 21. Of the Opening of the Door and How Charmian Blew Out the Light. He bestrode a powerful black charger, and his armor glittered through the green. And as he rode beneath the leafy arches of the wood, he lifted up his voice and sang, 
and the song was mournful, and of a plaintive seeming, and rang loud behind his visor bars. Therefore, as I sat beside the freshet, I hearkened to his song. For her love I cark and care, for her love I droop and dare, for her love my bliss is bare, and I wax wan. Forth he rode from the shadowy woodland, pacing very solemn and slow, and thrice he struck his iron hand upon his iron breast. For her love in sleep I slake, for her love all night I wake, for her love I mourning make more than any man. Now being come to where I sat beside the brook, he checked his horse, and gazed full long upon me, and his eyes shone from the gloom of his helmet. Miss Iyer, quoth B, how like you my song? But little, sir, to be plain with you, not a whit, I answered. And beseech you, wherefore? Because it is folly, away with it, for if your head be full of such, how shall you achieve any lasting good, glory, learning, power? But sighing he shook his head, quoth he, O blind one, glory is but a name, learning but a yearning emptiness, and whither leadeth ambition? Man is a mote dancing in a sun-ray, the world a speck hanging in space. All things vanish and pass utterly away, save only true love, and that abideth everlastingly. Tis sweeter than life, and stronger than death, and reacheth up beyond the stars. And thus it is I pray you tell me, where is she? She? She whom you love. I love no woman, said I. Liar! cried he in a terrible voice, and the voice was the voice of Black George. And who are you that says so? I demanded, and stood upon my feet. Look, behold, and know thyself, O blind and more than blind. And leaning down he raised his visor, so that the moonlight fell upon his face, and the face I looked upon was my own. And while I gazed he lifted up his voice, and cried, Ye spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that rideth in the green, dreaming ever of her beauty, and sighing forth his love everlastingly? Spirits of the wood, I charge ye! And out of the gloom of the wood, from every rustling leaf and opening bud, came a little voice that rose and blended in a soft, hushed chorus, crying, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart! Spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that walketh to and fro in the world, and having eyes seeth not, and ears heareth not, a very fool of love? Once again the voices cried in answer, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart! Spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that shall love with a love mightier than most, who shall suffer greatly for love and because of it, who shall think of it by day, and dream of it of nights? Who is he that must die to find love in the fullness of life? O oh, spirits of the wood, I charge ye! Again from out the green came the soft, hushed chorus, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart. But even as I laughed, came one from the wood with a horse and armor, and the armor he girded on me, and the horse I mounted, and there in the moonlit glade we fought and strove together, my other self and I, and sudden and strong he smote me, so that I fell down from my horse and lay there dead, with my blood soaking and soaking into the grass, and as I watched there came a blackbird that perched upon my breast, caroling gloriously. Yet little by little this bird changed, and lo, in its place was a new Peter Vibart, standing upon the old and the new trampled the old down into the grass, and it was gone. Then, with his eyes on the stars, the new Peter Vibart fell a-singing, and the words I sang were these, For her love I cark and care, for her love I droop and dare, for her love my bliss is bare, and I wax wan. And thus there came into my heart that which had been all unknown, undreamed of hitherto, yet which, once there, could never pass away. O spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that cometh, true love, sweeter than life, greater than wisdom, stronger than death? O spirits of the wood, I charge ye. And the hushed voices chorused softly, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart. And while I listened, one by one the voices ceased, till there but one remained, calling, calling, but ever soft and far away. And when I would have gone toward this voice, lo, there stood a knife quivering in the ground before me, that grew and grew until its haft touched heaven, yet still the voice called upon my name very softly, Peter, Peter, oh, Peter, I want you, oh, Peter, wake, wake. I sat up in bed, and as I listened grew suddenly sick, and a fit of trembling shook me violently, for the whisper was still in my ears, and the whisper was an agony of fear and dread indescribable. Peter. Oh, Peter, I am afraid. Wake, wake. 
A cold sweat broke out upon me, and I glared helplessly toward the door. Quick, Peter, come to me. Oh, God! I strove to move, but still could not. And now in the darkness hands were shaking me wildly, and Charmian's voice was speaking in my ear. The door, it whispered, the door! Then I arose and was in the outer room, with Charmian close beside me in the dark, and my eyes were upon the door. And then I beheld a strange thing, for a thin line of white light traversed the floor from end to end. Now as I watched this narrow line I saw that it was gradually widening and widening. Very slowly, and with infinite caution, the door was being opened from without. In this remote place, in this still dead hour of the night, full of the ghostly hush that ever precedes the dawn, there was something devilish, something very like murder in its stealthy motion. I heard Charmian's breath catch, and in the dark her hand came and crept into mine, and her fingers were cold as death. And now a great anger came upon me, and I took a quick step forward, but Charmian restrained me. No, Peter, she breathed, not yet, wait, and wound her arms round mine. In a corner nearby stood that same trusty staff that had been the companion of my wanderings, and now I reached and took it up, balancing it in my hand. And all the time I watched that line of light upon the floor, widening and widening, growing ever broader and more broad. The minutes dragged slowly by while the line grew into a streak and the streak into a lane, and upon the lane came a blot that slowly resolved itself into the shadow of a hand upon the latch. Slowly, slowly, to the hand came a wrist and the wrist an arm. Another minute and this maddening suspense would be over. Despite Charmian's restraining clasp, I crept a long pace nearer the softly moving door. The sharp angle of the elbow was growing obtuse as the shadowy arm straightened itself. Thirty seconds more, I began to count, and gripping my staff, braced myself for what might be, when, with a sudden cry, Charmian sprang forward and, hurling herself against the door, shut it with a crash. Quick, Peter, she panted. I was beside her almost as she spoke and had my hand upon the latch. I must see who this was, said I. You are mad, she cried. Let me open the door, Charmian. No, no, I say no. Whoever it was must not escape. Open the door. Never, never, I tell you, death is outside. There's murder in the very air. I feel it. And, dear God, the door has no bolt. They're gone now, whoever they were, said I reassuringly. The danger is over, if danger it could be called. Danger, cried Charmian. I tell you, it was death. Yet, after all, it may have been only some homeless wanderer. Then why that deadly silent caution? True, said I, becoming thoughtful. Bring the table, Peter, and set it across the door. Surely the table is too light to— But it will give sufficient warning. Not that I shall sleep again tonight. Oh, Peter, had I not been dreaming and happened to wake, had I not chanced to look toward the door, it would have opened wide, and then— Oh, horrible! You were dreaming? A hateful, hateful dream, it awoke in terror, and being afraid, glanced toward the door, and saw it opening, and now— Bring the table, Peter. Now groping about, my hand encountered one of the candles, and taking out my tinder-box, all unthinking, I lighted it. Charmian was leaning against the door, clad in a flowing white garment, a garment that was wonderfully stitched, all dainty frills and laces, with here and there a bow of blue riband, disposed, as it would seem, by the hand of chance, and yet most wonderfully and up from this foam of laces her shoulders rose, white and soft and dimpled, sweeping up in noble lines to the smooth round column of her throat. But as I stared at all this loveliness, she gave a sudden gasp, and stooped her head and crossed her hands upon her bosom, while up over the snow of shoulder, over neck and cheek and brow, ebbed that warm crimson tide, and I could only gaze and gaze, till with a movement swift and light she crossed to that betraying candle, and stooping, blew out the light. Then I set the table across the door, having done which I stood looking toward where she stood. Charmian, said I. Yes, Peter. Tomorrow. Yes, Peter. I will make a bar to hold the door. Yes, Peter. Two bars would be better, perhaps? Yes, Peter. You would feel safe then, safer than ever? Safer than ever, Peter. End of the opening of the door and how Charmian blew out the light. Section 31 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 22. In which the ancient discourses on love. 
I am forging a bar for my cottage door, such a bar as might give check to an army, or resist a battering ram, a bar that shall defy all the night prowlers that ever prowled, a stout solid bar, broad as my wrist and thick as my two fingers, that, looking upon it as it lies in its sockets across the door, Charmian henceforth may sleep and have no fear. The ancient sat perched on his stool in the corner, but for once we spoke little, for I was very busy, also my mind was plunged in a profound reverie. And of whom should I be thinking but of Charmian, and of the dimple in her shoulder? "'Tis bewitched you be, Peter,' said the old man suddenly, prodding me softly with his stick. "'Bewitched as ever was,' and he chuckled. "'Bewitched?' said I, starting. "'Ah, here you stand, with your hammer in your hand, and staring and a-staring at nobody nor nothing, leastways not as human I can see, and a sighin' and a sighin'. Did I indeed sigh, ancient? Ah, that you did, like a cow, Peter, or a horse, heavy and tired like, and slow you be, and dreamy. You as was so bright and spry, there's some fools like Joel Amos, as might think as twere the work of ghostess, or demons, a castin' their spells on ya, or that some vampire a bit you in the night and sucked your blood as you lay asleep. But I know different, you'm just bewitched, Peter and he chuckled again. Who knows, perhaps I am, but it will pass. Whatever it is, it will pass. Don't be ye too sure of that. There's bewitchments and bewitchments, Peter. Hereupon the smithy became full of the merry din of my hammer, and while I worked the ancient smoked his pipe and watched me, informing me, between whiles, that the Jersey cow was in calf, that the hops seemed more than usually forward, and that he had waked that morning with a touch of the rheumatics, but otherwise he was unusually silent. Moreover, each time that I happened to glance up it was to find him regarding me with a certain fixity of eye, which at another time would have struck me as portentous. "'You be palish this morning, Peter,' said he, dabbing me suddenly with his pipe stem. "'Shouldn't wonder if you was to tell me as your appetite was bad. Come now, you didn't eat much of a breakfast this morning, did you?' "'I don't think I did, Ancient.' "'A course not,' said the old man with a nod of profound approval. "'It aren't to be expected. Let's see, it be all of four months since I found you, bain't it?' Four months and a few odd days,' I nodded, and fell to work upon my glowing iron bar. "'You'll make a tidy smith one of these days, Peter,' said the old man encouragingly, as I straightened my back and plunged the iron back into the fire. "'Thank you, Ancient.' Ay, you've learned to use a hammer pretty well, considering though you be wasting your opportunity shameful, Peter, shameful. Am I, Ancient? Ay, that you be. Moon can't last much longer. She be on the way there, Eddie. Moon? said I, staring. Ah, moon, nodded the old man. There's nout like a moon, Peter, and if she be the full, so much the better. But what have the moon and I to do with each other, Ancient? Old I be, Peter, a old, old man, but I were young once, and I tell ye, the moon has a lot more to do with it than some folks think. Why, Lord lovey, there wouldn't be near so many children a-playin' in the sun if it wasn't for the moon. Ancient, said I, what might you be driving at? Love, Peter. Love, said I, letting go the handle of the bellows, and marriage, Peter. What in the world put such thoughts in your head? You did, Peter. I! Ah, some men is born lovers, Peter, and you be one. I never see such eyes as yourn afore. So burnin' ought they be. And, Peter, some maid will see the love light aflame in em some day, and drop her head and blush and tremble, for she'll know, Peter, she'll know. Maids was made to be loved, Peter. But, Ancient, I am not the kind of man women would be attracted by. I love books and solitude, and am called a pedant. And, besides, I am not of a loving sort. Some men, Peter, falls in love as easy as they falls out. It comes to some soft and quiet, like the dawn of a summer's day, Peter. But to others it comes like a garden terrible storm. Oh, that it do. There is a fire ready to burn up inside of ye at the touch of some women's hand, or the peep of her eye, ah, a fire as'll burn and burn, and never go out again, not even if you should live to be as old as I be, and you'll be strong and wild and fierce with it. And some day you'll find her, Peter, and she'll find you. And, said I, staring away into the distance, do you think that by any possible chance she might love me, this woman? Aye, for sure, said the ancient. For sure she will. Why don't ye up an ox, sir? With a fine round moon or head, and a pretty maid at your elber? It's easy enough to tell her you love her, ain't it? Indeed, yes, said I, beginning to rub my chin. Very easy. 
and I sighed. And when you looks into a pair of sweet eyes and sees the shine of the moon in em, why, it aren't so fur to her lips, are it, Peter? No, said I, rubbing my chin harder than ever. No, and there's the danger of it. Where's the danger, Peter? Everywhere, I answered. In her eyes, in her thick, soft hair, the warmth of her breath, the touch of her hand, the least contact of her garments, her very step. I knowed it, cried the ancient joyfully, peering at me under his brows. I knowed it. Knew what? You be in love. Good lad, good lad, and he flourished his pipe in the air. In love, I exclaimed. In love. I? Sure as sure. But love, according to Aristotle, is love, Peter, is what makes a man forget his breakfast, and his work, and his— But I work very hard. Besides, love is what makes a man so brave as a lion, Peter, and fall a-tremblin' like a coward when she stands a-lookin' up at him. Love makes the green earth greener, and the long road short, ah, almost too short. Sometimes the love of a woman comes betwixt a man, and all evils and dangers. Why don't he up an axe her, Peter? She'd laugh at me, Ancient. Not she. That soft, low laugh of hers. Well, what of that? Besides, she hardly knows me. The ancient took out his snuff-box and gave two double knocks upon the lid. A woman knows a man sooner than a man knows a woman. Ah, a sight sooner. Why, Lord bless you, Peter. She has him all reckoned up long afore he knows for sure if her eyes be black uns or brown uns, and that she has. Here he extracted a pinch of snuff. As for Prudence, she loves you with all her heart and soul. Prudence, said I, staring. Ah, Prudence. I be her grandfather, I know. Prudence, said I again. She am a handsome lass, and so pretty as a victor, you said so yourself. And what's more, she am a sensible lass, and will make ye as fine a wife as ever was, if only, if only she loved me, ancient. To be sure, Peter. But you see, she doesn't. Eh? What? What? Peter? Prudence doesn't love me. Doesn't? Not by any means. Peter, you're joking. No, ancient. But I... I be all took aback, mazed I be, not love ye and me with my art set on it. Are you sure? Certain. How do you know? She told me so. But why? Why shouldn't she love ye? Why should she? But I, I'd i set my art on it, Peter. It is very unfortunate, said I, and began blowing up the fire. Peter. Yes, ancient. Do ye love she? No, ancient. The old man rose and, hobbling forward, tapped me on the breast with the handle of his stick. Then who was ye a talkin' of a while back, bout her eyes and her hair and her dress and bein' afraid of em? To be exact, I don't know, Ancient. Oh, Peter! exclaimed the old man, shaking his head. I wonders at ye. Arter me a thinkin' and a thinkin' and a plannin' and a plannin' all these months after me a sendin' black charge about his business. Ancient, what do you mean? Why didn't I out and tell ye as you was sweet on Prue? Did you tell him that? I cried. Aye, to be sure I did, and what's more, I says, do an often and often. When you wasn't by, George, I'd say, Prue's a lovely maid, and Peter's a fine young chap, and they am beginning to find each other out. They be all as talkin' to each other and a lookin' at each other morn and noon and night, I says. Like as not, we'll have a marryin' each other afore very long, and George jud up and wrinkle up his brows and walk away and never say a word. But now it'll be terrible, hard to be disappointed like this, Peter, arter I set my heart on it, and me such an old man, such a very ancient man. Oh, Peter, you be full of disappointments, and all manner of contrariness. Sometimes I almost wishes as I'd never took the trouble to find you at all. And with this Parthian shot, the old man sighed and turned his back upon me and tottered out of the forge. Chapter 23 how Gabbing Dick, the peddler, set a hammer going in my head. Having finished my bars with four strong brackets to hold them, I put away my tools and donned hat and coat. It was yet early, and there was, besides, much work waiting to be done, but I felt unwontedly tired and out of sorts, wherefore, with my bars and brackets beneath my arm, I set out for the hollow. From the hedges on either side of me came the sweet perfume of the honeysuckle, and beyond the hedges the field stood high with ripening corn, a yellow, heavy-headed host nodding and swaying lazily. I stood a while to listen to its whisper as the gentle wind swept over it, and to look down the long green alleys of the hop gardens beyond, and at the end of one of these straight arched vistas there shone a solitary great star. And presently lifting my eyes to the sky, already deepening to evening, and remembering how I had looked round me ere I faced Black George, I breathed a sigh of thankfulness that I was yet alive, with strength to walk within a world so beautiful. Now as I stood thus, 
I heard a voice hailing me, and glancing about espied one some distance up the road, who sat beneath the hedge, whom, upon approaching, I recognized as gabbing Dick the peddler. He nodded and grinned as I came up, but in both there was a vague unpleasantness, as also in the manner in which he eyed me slowly up and down. "'You've stood a-looking up in the sky for a good ten minutes,' said he. "'And what if I have?' "'Nothing,' said the peddler. "'Nothing at all. Though if the moon had been up, a cove might have thought as he was dreaming of some eve or other. Love-sick folk always stares at the moon, leastwise so they tell me. Anyone stares at the moon when he might be doing summat better as a fool, as great a fool as any man who stares at a eve, for a eve never brought any man nothing but trouble, and sorrow, and never will, now. Don't frown, young cove, nor shake your head, for it's true. What's caused more sorrow and blood than them eaves? Blood? Ah, rivers of it! Oceans of good blood's been spilt all along o' women from the eve as tricked old Adam to the eve as tricks the like of me, or, say, yourself. Here he regarded me with so evil a leer that I turned my back in disgust. "'Don't go, young cove. I ain't done yet. I got summat to tell you.' "'Then tell it,' said I, stopping again, struck by the fellow's manner, "'and tell it quickly. I'm a coming to it as fast as I can, ain't I? Very well, then. You're a fine upstanding young cove, and may have white hands, which I don't see myself, but no matter, and may likewise be chock full of taken ways, which, though not noticing, I won't go for to deny.' But a eve's a eve, it always will be. You'll mind as I warned you against the last time I see you? Very well, then. Well, said I impatiently. Well, nodded the peddler, and his eyes twinkled malevolently. I says it again, I warns you again. You're a nice, civil-spoke young cove, and quiet, though I don't like the cock of your eye. And mind, I don't bear you no ill, though you did turn me from your door on a cold, dark night. It was neither a cold nor a dark night, said I. Well, it might have been, mightn't it? Very well, then. "'Still I don't,' said the peddler, spitting dejectedly into the ditch. "'I don't bear you no hard feelings for it, no how. "'Me always making it a pint to forgive them as woefully oppresses me. "'Likewise, them as despitefully uses me. "'It might have been cold and dark with ice and snow, "'and I might have froze to death, and we won't say no more about it.' "'You've said pretty well, I think,' said I. "'Supposing you tell me what you have to tell me. "'Otherwise, good night.' "'Very well, then,' said the peddler. "'Let's talk of somebody else. "'Still living in the aller, I suppose?' "'Yes.' "'Ah, well, I come through there to-day,' said he, grinning, and again his eyes grew malevolent. "'Indeed. Ah, indeed. I come through there this very afternoon, and uncommon pretty everything was looking, with the grass so green and the trees so, so shady.' "'Shady's the word,' nodded the peddler, glancing at me through his narrowed eyelids and chuckling. "'A paradise, you might call it. Ah, a paradise or a garden of Eden with Eve and the serpent and all.' And he broke out into a cackling laugh and in the look and the laugh, indeed, about his whole figure there was something so repellent, so evil, that I was minded to kick and trample him down into the ditch. Yet the leering triumph in his eyes held me. Yes, said I. You see, be and by, I happened to pass the cottage, and very pretty that looked too, and nice and neat inside. Yes, said I. And being so near, I happened to glance in the window, and there, sure enough, I see her as ye might say, Eve in the garden, and a fine figure of a Eve she be, and handsome with it. Tain't often you see a maid that likes her, so proud and naughty-like. Well, well, I just happened to look in the window. She happened to be standing with an open book in her hand, an old leather book with a broken cover. Yes, said I, and she was a laughing, and a pretty soft Eve's laugh it were, too. Yes, said I, and he were a looking at the book over her shoulder. The irons slipped from my grasp and fell with a harsh clang. "'Kitches ye, does it?' said the peddler. I did not speak, but meet in my eye. He scrambled hastily to his feet, and, catching up his pack, retreated some little way down the road. "'Kitches ye, does it, my cove?' he repeated. "'Turn me away from your door on a cold, dark night, would ye? Not as I bears ye any ill will for it, being of a forgiven nature. But I says to you, I says, look out!' A fine handsome lass she be with her soft eyes and red lips and long white arms, the eyes and lips and arms of the Eve, and Eve tricked Adam, didn't she? And you ain't a better man nor Adam, are ye? Very well, then. Saying which, he spat once more into the ditch, and shouldering his pack, strode away. And after some while I took up my iron bars and trudged on toward the cottage. As I went, I repeated to myself over and over again the word, liar. Yet my step was very slow and heavy, and my feet dragged in the dust, and somewhere in my head a small hammer had begun to beat, soft and slow and regular, but beating, beating upon my brain. 
now the upper cover of my Virgil book was broken. End of How Gabbing Dick the Peddler Set a Hammer Going in My Head Thirty-two of the Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Book Two, Chapter Twenty Four The Virgil Book. A man was leaning in the shadow of a tree, looking down into the hollow. I could not see him very distinctly because, though evening had scarcely fallen, the shadows where he stood were very dense, but he was gazing down into the hollow in the attitude of one who waits. For what? For whom? A sudden fit of shivering shook me from head to foot, and, while I yet shivered, I grew burning hot. The blood throbbed at my temples. The small hammer was drumming much faster now, and the cool night air seemed to be stifling me. Very cautiously I began creeping nearer the passive figure, while the hammer beat so loud that it seemed he must hear it where he stood, a shortish, broad-shouldered figure, clad in a blue coat. He held his hat in his hand, and he leaned carelessly against the tree, and his easy assurance of air maddened me the more. As he stood thus, looking always down into the hollow, his neck gleamed at me above the collar of his coat. Wherefore I stooped, and, laying my irons in the grass, crept on once more, and, as I went, I kept my eyes upon his neck. A stick snapped sharp and loud beneath my tread, and lounging back stiffened and grew rigid. The face showed for an instant over the shoulder, and, with a spring, he had vanished into the bushes. It was a vain hope to find a man in such a dense tangle of boughs and underbrush, yet I ran forward nevertheless. But, though I sought eagerly upon all sides, he had made good his escape. So, after a while, I retraced my steps to where I had left my irons and brackets, and taking them up, turned aside to that precipitous path which, as I have already said, leads down into the hollow. Now as I went, listening to the throb of the hammer in my head, whom should I meet but Charmian, coming gaily through the green and singing as she came? At sight of me she stopped, and the song died upon her lip. Why, why, Peter, you look pale, dreadfully pale. Thank you, I am very well, said I. You have not been fighting again. Why should I have been fighting, Charmian? Your eyes are wild and fierce, Peter. Were you coming to... to meet me, Charmian? Yes, Peter. Now, watching beneath my brows, it almost seemed that her colour had changed, and that her eyes, of set purpose, avoided mine. Could it be that she was equivocating? But I am much before my usual time tonight, Charmian. Then there will be no waiting for supper, and I am ravenous, Peter. And as she led the way along the path, she began to sing again. Being come to the cottage, I set down my bars and brackets with a clang. These, said I, in answer to her look, are the bars I promised to make for the door. Do you always keep your promises, Peter? I hope so. Then, said she, coming to look at the great bars with a fork in her hand, for she was in the middle of dishing up. Then, if you promise me always to come home by the road, and never through the coppice. You will do so, won't you? Why should I? I inquired, turning sharply to look at her. Because the coppice is so dark and lonely, and if... I say, if I should take it into my head to come and meet you sometimes, there would be no chance of my missing you. And so she looked at me, and smiled, and going back to her cooking, fell once more a-singing, the while I sat and watched her beneath my brows. Surely. Surely no woman whose heart was full of deceit could sing so blithely and happily, or look at one with such sweet candour in her eyes. And yet the supper was a very ghost of a meal, for when I remembered the man who had watched and waited, the very food grew nauseous and seemed to choke me. She's a Eve, a 
Eve rang a voice in my ear Eve tricked Adam didn't she and you ain't a better man nor Adam she's a Eve a Eve Peter you eat nothing yes indeed said I staring unseeingly down at my plate and striving to close my ears against the fiendish voice and you are very pale I shrugged my shoulders Peter look at me I looked up obediently yes you are frightfully pale are you ill again is it your head Peter what is it and with a sudden half shy gesture she stretched her hand to me across the table and as I looked from the mute pity in her eyes to the mute pity of that would-be comforting hand I had a great impulse to clasp it close in mine to speak and tell her all my base and unworthy suspicions and once more to entreat her pardon and forgiveness the words were upon my lips but I checked them madman that I was and shook my head it is nothing I answered unless it be that I have not yet recovered from black George's fist it is nothing and so the meal drew to an end and though feeling my thoughts base I sat with my head on my hand and my eyes upon the cloth yet I knew she watched me and more than once I heard her sigh a man who acts on impulse may sometimes be laughed at for his mistakes but he will frequently attain to higher things and be much better loved by his fellows than the colder more calculating logician who rarely makes a blunder and Simon Peter was a man of impulse supper being over and done Charmian must needs take my coat despite my protests and fall to work upon its threadbare shabbiness mending a great rent in the sleeve and watching her through the smoke of my pipe noting the high mould of her features the proud poise of her head the slender elegance of her hands i was struck sharply by her contrast to the rough bare walls that were my home and the toil-worn unlovely garment beneath her fingers as i looked she seemed to be suddenly removed from me far above and beyond my reach that's the fourth time peter what Charmian? that is the fourth time you have sighed since you lighted your pipe and it is out and you never noticed it yes said i and laid the pipe upon the table and sighed again before i could stop myself charmian raised her head and looked at me with a laugh in her eyes oh my philosophical dreamy blacksmith where be your thoughts i was thinking how old and worn and disreputable my coat looked indeed sir said charmian holding it up and regarding it with a little frown forsooth it is ancient and hath seen better days like the wearer said i and sighed again hark to this ancient man she laughed this hoary-headed blacksmith of ours who sighs and for ever sighs if it could possibly be that he had met any one sufficiently worthy i should think that he had fallen philosophically in love how think you sir knight of the rueful countenance i remember said i that among other things you once called me superior mr smith charmian laughed and nodded her head at me you have been describing to me some quite impossible idealistic creature alone worthy of your regard sir do you still think me superior charmian do you still dream of your impalpable bloodlessly perfect ideals sir no i answered no i think i have done with dreaming and i have done with this thy coat for behold it is finished and rising she folded it over the back of my chair now as she stood thus behind me her hand fell and for a moment rested lightly upon my shoulder peter yes charmian i wish yes i do wish that you were either much younger or very much older why because you wouldn't be quite so so cryptic such a very abstruse problem sometimes i think i understand you better than you do yourself and sometimes i am utterly lost now if you were younger i could read you easily for myself and if you were older you would read yourself for me i was never very young said i no you were always too repressed peter yes perhaps i was 
Repression is good up to a certain point, but beyond that it is dangerous, said she, with a portentous shake of the head. Hey ho, was it a week or a year ago that you avowed yourself happy and couldn't tell why? I was the greater fool, said I. For not knowing why, Peter? For thinking myself happy. Peter, what is happiness? An idea, said I, possessed generally of fools. And what is misery? Misery is also an idea. Possessed only by the wise Peter. Surely he is wiser who chooses happiness. Neither happiness nor misery comes from choice. But if one seeks happiness, Peter? One will assuredly find misery, said I, and, sighing, rose, and taking my hammer from its place above the bookshelf, set to work upon my brackets, driving them deep into the heavy framework of the door. All at once I stopped, with my hammer poised, and, for no reason in the world, looked back at Charmian over my shoulder, looked to find her watching me with eyes that were, if it could well be, puzzled, wistful, shy, and glad at one and the same time, eyes that veiled themselves swiftly before my look, yet that shot one last glance between their lashes, in which were only joy and laughter. Yes, said I, answering the look, but she only stooped her head and went on sewing, yet the colour was bright in her cheeks, and, having driven in the four brackets or staples and closed the door, I took up the bars and showed her how they were to lie crosswise across the door, resting in the brackets. We shall be safe now, Peter, said she. Those bars would resist an elephant. I think they would, I nodded, but there is yet something more. Going to my shelf of books, I took thence the silver-mounted pistol she had brought with her and balanced it in my hand. Tomorrow I will take this to Cranbrook and buy bullets to fit it. Why, there are bullets there, in one of the old shoes, Peter. They are too large. This is an unusually small caliber, and yet it will be deadly enough at close range. I will load it for you, Charmian, and give it into your keeping, in case you should ever grow afraid again, when I am not by. This is a lonely place for a woman at all times. Yes, Peter. She was busily employed upon a piece of embroidery, and began to sing softly to herself again as she worked, that old song which worthy Mr. Pepys mentions having heard from the lips of mischievous-eyed Nell Gwynne. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling, made every youth cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. Are you so happy, Charmian? Oh, sir, indifferent well, I thank you. All in the merry month of May, when green buds they were swelling, young Jimmy Grove on his deathbed lay for love of Barbara Allen. Are you so miserable, Peter? Why do you ask? Because you sigh and sigh like poor Jimmy Grove in the song. He was a fool, said I. For sighing, Peter? For dying. I suppose no philosopher could ever be so foolish, Peter. No, said I, certainly not. It is well to be a philosopher, isn't it, Peter? Hm, said I, and once more set about lighting my pipe. Anon I rose and, crossing to the open door, looked out upon the summer night, and sighed, and coming back sat watching Charmian's busy fingers. Charmian, said I at last. Yes, Peter? Do you ever see any any men lurking about the hollow when i am away her needle stopped suddenly and she did not look up as she answered no peter never are you sure charmian the needle began to fly to and fro again but still she did not look up no of course not how should i see anyone i scarcely go beyond the hollow and i'm busy all day a eve a eve said a voice in my ear eve tricked adam didn't she a eve after this i sat for a long time without moving my mind harassed with doubts and a hideous morbid dread why had she avoided my eye her own were pure and truthful and could not lie why why had they avoided mine if only she had looked at me presently i rose and began to pace up and down the room 
You are very restless, Peter. Yes, said I. Yes, I fear I am. You must pardon me. Why not read? Indeed, I had not thought of my books. Then read me something aloud, Peter. I will read you the sorrow of Achilles for the loss of Briseis. And, going into the corner, I raised my hand to my shelf of books, and stood there, with hand upraised yet touching no book, for a sudden spasm seemed to have me in its clutches, and once again the trembling seized me, and the hammer had recommenced its beat, beating upon my brain. And in a while I turned from my books, and crossing to the door, leaned there with my back to her, lest she should see my face just then. I... I don't think I... will read... tonight, said I at last. Very well, Peter. Let us talk. Or talk, said I. I... I think I'll go to bed. Pray, I went on hurriedly, for I was conscious that she had raised her head, and was looking at me in some surprise. Pray excuse me. I am very tired. So, while she yet stared at me, I turned away, and mumbling a good night, went into my chamber, and closing the door, leaned against it, for my mind was sick with dread, and sorrow, and a great anguish. For now I knew that Charmian had lied to me. My Virgil book had been moved from its usual place. End of Book Two Chapter Twenty Four Section 33 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 25, in which the reader shall find little to do with the story, and may, therefore, skip. Is there anywhere in the world so damnable a place of torment as a bed? to lie awake through the slow dragging hours, surrounded by a sombre quietude, from whose stifling blackness thoughts, like demons, leap to catch us by the throat, or like waves come rolling in upon us ceaselessly, remorselessly, burying us beneath their resistless flow, catching us up, whirling us dizzily aloft, dashing us down into depths, infinite, now retreating, now advancing, from whose oncoming terror there is no escape, until we are once more buried beneath their stifling rush. To lie awake staring wide-eyed into a crowding darkness, wherein move terrors unimagined, to bury our throbbing temples in pillows of fire, to roll and toss until the soul within us cries out in agony, and we reach out frantic hands into a void that mocks us by contrast of its deep, awful quiet. At such times fair reason runs affrighted to hide herself, and foaming madness fills her throne, at such times our everyday sorrows, howsoever small and petty they be, grow and magnify themselves until they overflow the night, filling the universe above and around us. And of all the woes the human mind can bear, surely suspicion gnaws deeper than them all. So I lay beneath the incubus, my temples clasped tight between my burning palms, to stay the maddening ring of the hammer in my brain. And suspicion grew into certainty, and with certainty came madness. Imagination ran riot. She was a Messalina, a Julia, a Joan of Naples, a veritable succuba, a thing polluted, degraded, and abominable. And because of her beauty I cursed all beautiful things, and because of her womanhood I cursed all women. And ever the hammer beat upon my brain, and foul shapes danced before my eyes, shapes so insanely hideous and revolting that of a sudden I rose from my bed groaning, and coming to the casement I leaned out. Oh, the cool, sweet purity of the night! I heard the soft stir and rustle of leaves all about me, and down from heaven came a breath of wind, and in the wind a great raindrop that touched my burning brow like the finger of God. And leaning there with parted lips and closed eyes, gradually my madness left me, and the throbbing in my brain grew less. How many poor mortals since the world began, sleepless and anguish-torn, even as I, have looked up into that self-same sky and sorrowed for the dawn. For her love in sleep I slake, for her love all night I wake, for her love I mourning make, more than any man. Poor fool, to think that thou couldst mourn more than thy kind. 
thou'rt but a little handful of grey dust, ages since, thy name and estate long out of mind, where'er thou art, thou shouldst have got you wisdom by now perchance. Poor fool, that thou must love a woman and worship with thy love, building for her an altar in thine heart. If altar crumble and heart burst, is she to blame, who is but woman, or thou, who wouldst have made her all divine? Well, thou art dead, a small handful of grey dust long since. Perchance thou hast got thee wisdom ere now, poor fool, O oh, fool divine! As thou art now, thy sleepless nights forgot, the carking sorrows of thy life all overpast and done. So must I some time be, and, ages hence, shall smile at this, and reckon it no more than a broken toy, hi-o! And so I presently turned back to my tumbled bed, but it seemed to me that torment and terror still waited me there. Moreover, I was filled with a great desire for action. This narrow chamber stifled me, while outside was the stir of leaves, the gentle breathing of the wind, the cool murmur of the brook, with night brooding over all, deep and soft and still. Being now dressed, I stood a while, deliberating how I might escape, without disturbing her who slumbered in the outer room. So I came to the window, and thrusting my head and shoulders sideways through the narrow lattice, slowly and with much ado wriggled myself out. Rising from my hands and knees, I stood up, and threw wide my arms to the perfumed night, inhaling its sweetness in great deep breaths, and so turned my steps toward the brook, drawn thither by its rippling melody. For a brook is a companionable thing at all times to a lonely man, and very full of wise counsel and friendly admonitions, if he but have ears to hear withal. Thus as I walked beside the brook, it spoke to me of many things, grave and gay, delivering itself of observations upon the folly of humans, comparing us very unfavorably with the godlike dignity of the trees, the immutability of mountains, and the profound philosophy of brooks. Indeed, it waged most eloquent upon this theme, caustic, if you will, but with a ripple between whiles, like the deep-throated chuckle of the wise old philosopher it was. Go to, chuckled the brook, O oh, heavy-footed, heavy-sighing human, go to! It is written that man was given dominion over birds and beasts and fishes, and all things made, yet how doth man in all his pride compare with even a little mountain? And as to birds and beasts and fishes, they provide for themselves day in and day out, while man doth starve and famish. To what end is man born but to work, beget his kind, and die? O oh, man, lift up thy dull-sighted eyes, behold the wonder of the world, the infinite universe about thee, Behold thyself, and see thy many failings and imperfections, and thy stupendous littleness. Go to! Man was made for the world, and not the world for man. Man is a leaf in the forest, a grain of dust, borne upon the wind. And, when the wind faileth, dust to dust returneth. Out upon thee with thy puny griefs and sorrows. O oh, man who hath dominion over all things save thine own heart, and who in blind egotism setteth thyself much above me, who am but a runlet of water, O oh, man, I tell thee, when thou art dusty bones, I shall still be here, singing to myself in the sun, or talking to some other poor human fool in the dark. Go to, chuckled the brook. The wheel of life turneth ever faster and faster. The woes of to-day shall be the woes of last year, or ever thou canst count them all. Out upon thee, go to. Chapter 26 of Storm and Tempest and How I Met One Praying in the Dawn on I went, chin on breast, heedless of all direction, now beneath the shade of trees, now crossing grassy glades, or rolling meadow, or threading my way through long alleys of hop vines, on and on, skirting hedges by haycocks looming ghostly in the dark, by rustling cornfields, through wood and coppice, where branches touched me as I passed, like ghostly fingers in the dark. On I went, lost to all things but my own thoughts, and my thoughts were not of life nor death, nor the world, nor the spaces beyond the world but of my Virgil book with the broken cover, and of him who had looked at it over her shoulder. And raising my hands, I clasped them about my temples, and leaning against a tree, stood there a great while. Yet when the trembling fit had left me, I went on again, and with every footstep there rose a voice within me, crying, Why? 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 Why should I, Peter Vibart, hale and well in body, healthy in mind, why should I fall thus into ague spasms because of a woman, of whom I knew nothing, who had come I knew not whence, accompanied by one whose presence under such conditions meant infamy to any woman. Why should I burn thus in a fever if she chose to meet another while I was abroad? 
Was she not free to follow her own devices? Had I any claim upon her? By what right did I seek to compass her goings and comings, or interest myself in her doings? Why? 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 As I went, the woods gradually fell away, and I came out upon an open place. The ground rose sharply before me, but I climbed on and up, and so in time stood upon a hill. Now standing upon this elevation, with the woods looming dimly below me, as if they were a dark tide hemming me in on all sides, I became conscious of a sudden greater quietude in the air, a stillness that was like the hush of expectancy. Not a sound came to me, not a whisper from the myriad leaves below. But as I stood there listening, very faint and far away, I heard a murmur that rose and died and rose again, that swelled and swelled into the roll of distant thunder. Down in the woods was a faint rustling, as if some giant were stirring among the leaves, and out of their depths breathed a puff of wind that fanned my cheek, and so was gone. But in a while it was back again, stronger, more insistent than before, till, sudden as it came, it died away again, and all was hushed and still, save only for the tremor down there among the leaves. But lightning flickered upon the horizon, the thunder rolled nearer and nearer, and the giant grew ever more restless. Round about me in the dark were imps that laughed and whispered together and mocked me amid the leaves. Who is the madman that stands upon a lonely hill at midnight, bareheaded, half-clad, and hungers for the storm? Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart! Who is he that having eyes sees not, and having ears hears not? Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart! Blow, wind, and buffet him, flame, O lightning, that he may see, roar, O thunder, that he may hear and know. Upon the stillness came a rustling louder and ever louder, drowning all else, for the giant was awake at last, and stretching himself, and now up he sprang with a sudden bellow, and gathering himself together swept up toward me through the swaying treetops, pelting me with broken twigs and flying leaves, and filling the air with the tumult of his coming. Oh, the wind, the bellowing giant wind! On he came, exulting, whistling through my hair, stopping my breath, roaring in my ears his savage, wild halloo, and, as if in answer, forth from the inky heaven burst a jagged, blinding flame that zigzagged down among the tossing trees, and vanished with a roaring thunderclap that seemed to stun all things to silence. But not for long, for in the darkness came the wind again, fiercer, wilder than before, shrieking a defiance. The thunder crashed above me, and the lightning quivered in the air about me, till my eyes ached with the swift transitions from pitch darkness to dazzling light, light in which distant objects started out clear and well-defined, only to be lost again in a swirl of blackness. And now came rain, a sudden hissing downpour, long threads of scintillating fire, where the lightning caught it, rain that wetted me through and through. The storm was at its height, and as I listened, rain and wind and thunder became merged and blended into awful music, a symphony of life and death played by the hands of God, and I was an atom, a grain of dust, an insect, to be crushed by God's little finger. And yet needs must this insect still think upon its little self, for half-drowned, deafened, blind, and half-stunned though I was, still the voice within me cried, Why? 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 Why was I here, instead of lying soft and sheltered and sleeping the blessed sleep of tired humanity? Why was I here with death about me? And why must I think, and think, and think of her? The whole breadth of heaven seemed torn asunder. Blue flame crackled in the air. It ran hissing along the ground, then blackness and a thunderclap that shook the very hill beneath me, and I was down on my knees with the swish of the rain about me. Little by little upon this silence stole the rustle of leaves, and in the leaves were the imps who mocked me. Who is he that doth love, in spite of himself, and shall do all his days, be she good or evil, whatever she was, whatever she is? Who is the very fool of love? Peter Vibart. Peter Vibart. And so I bowed my face upon my hands, and remained thus a great while, heeding no more the tempest about me, for now indeed was my question answered and my fear realized. I love her. Whatever she was, whatever she is, good or evil, I love her. O oh, fool! O oh, most miserable fool! And presently I rose and went on down the hill. Fast I strode, stumbling and slipping, plunging on heedlessly through bush and brake, until at last, Looking about me, I found myself on the outskirts of a little spinney or copse. Then I became conscious that the storm had passed, for the thunder had died down to a murmur, and the rain had ceased. Only all about me were little soft sounds, as if the trees were weeping silently together. Pushing on, I came to a sort of narrow lane 
grassy underfoot and shut in on either hand by very tall hedges that loomed solid and black in the night and being spent and weary i sat down beneath one of these and propped my chin in my hands how long i remained thus i cannot say but i was at length aroused by a voice a strangely sweet and gentle voice at no great distance and the words it uttered were these o oh, give thanks unto the lord for he is good for his mercy endureth for ever o oh, lord i beseech thee look down in thine infinite pity upon this thy world for to-day is at hand and thy children must soon awake to life and toil and temptation o oh, thou who art the lover of men let thy holy spirit wait to meet with each one of us upon the threshold of the dawn and lead us through this coming day like as a father pitieth his children so dost thou pity all the woeful and heavy-hearted look down upon all those who must so soon awake to their griefs speak comfortably to them remember those in pain who must so soon take up their weary burdens look down upon the hungry and the rich the evil and the good that in this new day finding each something of thy mercy they may give thanks unto the lord for he is good for his mercy endureth for ever so the voice ended, and there was silence and a profound stillness upon all things. Wherefore, lifting my eyes into the east, I saw that it was dawn. End of section 33section 34 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 27. The Epileptic. Now when the prayer was ended, I turned my back upon the lightening east and set off along the lane. But as I went, I heard one hailing me, and glancing round, saw that in the hedge was a wicket gate, and over this gate a man was leaning a little thin man with the face of an ascetic or a medieval saint a face of a high and noble beauty upon whose scholarly brow sat a calm serenity yet beneath which glowed the full bright eye of the man of action good morning friend said b welcome to my solitude i wish you joy of this new day of ours it is cloudy yet but there's a rift down on the horizon it will be a fair day i think on the contrary, sir, said I, to me there are all evidences of the bad weather continuing. I think it will be a bad day, with rain, and probably thunder and lightning. Good morning, sir. Stay, cried he, as I turned away, and with the word set his hand upon the gate, and vaulting nimbly over, came toward me, with a broad-brimmed straw hat in one hand, and a long-stemmed wooden pipe in the other. Sir, said he, my cottage is close by. You look worn and jaded. Will you not step in and rest a while? thank you sir but i must be upon my way and whither lies your way to sissinghurst sir you have a long walk before you and with your permission i will accompany you a little way with pleasure sir i answered though i fear you will find me a moody companion and somewhat silent one but then i shall be the better listener so light your pipe sir and while you smoke talk my pipe said he glancing down at it ah yes i was about to compose my sunday evening's sermon you are a clergyman sir no no a preacher or say rather a teacher and a very humble one who striving himself after truth seeks to lend such aid to others as he may truth said i what is truth truth sir is that which can never pass away the truth of life is good works which abide everlastingly sir said i you smoke a pipe i perceive and should therefore be a good preacher for smoking begets thought and yet, sir, is not to act greater than to think? Why, thought far outstrips puny action, said I. It reaches deeper, soars higher. In our actions we are pygmies, but in our thoughts we may be gods, and embrace a universe. But, sighed the preacher, while we think, our fellows perish in ignorance and want. Huh, said I. Thought, pursued the preacher, may become a vice, as it did with the old-time monks and hermits, who, shutting themselves away from their kind, wasted their lives upon their knees, thinking noble thoughts, and dreaming of holy things, but leaving the world very carefully to the devil. And as to smoking, I am seriously considering giving it up. Here he took the pipe from his lips and thrust it behind his back. Why? It has become, unfortunately, too human. 
"'It is a strange thing, sir,' he went on, smiling and shaking his head, "'that this my one indulgence should breed me more discredit than all the cardinal sins, and become a stumbling-block to others. Only last Sunday I happened to overhear two white-headed old fellows talking. "'A fine sermon, Giles?' said the one. "'Ah, good enough,' replied the other. "'But it might have been better, you see. He smokes!' So I am seriously thinking of giving it up, for it would appear that if a preacher prove himself as human as his flock, they immediately lose faith in him and become deaf to his teaching. Very true, sir, I nodded. It has always been human to admire and respect that only which is in any way different to ourselves. In archaic times, those whose teachings were above men's comprehension, or who were remarkable for any singularity of action, were immediately deified. Pythagoras recognized this truth when he shrouded himself in mystery, and delivered his lectures from behind a curtain, though to be sure he has become regarded as something of a charlatan in consequence. "'Pray, sir,' said the preacher, absent-mindedly puffing his pipe again, "'may I ask what you are?' "'A blacksmith, sir.' "'And where did you read of Pythagoras and the like?' "'At Oxford, sir.' "'How comes it, then, that I find you in the dawn, wet with rain, buffeted by wind, and, most of all, a shewer of horses?' but instead of answering I pointed to a twisted figure that lay beneath the opposite hedge. "'A man!' exclaimed the preacher, "'and asleep, I think.' "'No,' said I, "'not in that contorted attitude.' "'Indeed you are right,' said the preacher. "'The man is ill, poor fellow.' And hurrying forward he fell on his knees beside the prostrate figure. He was a tall man, roughly clad, and he lay upon his back, rigid and motionless, while upon his blue lips were flecks and bubbles of foam. "'Epilepsy,' said I. The preacher nodded, and busied himself with loosening the sodden neckcloth, while I unclasped the icy fingers to relieve the tension of the muscles. The man's hair was long and matted, as was also his beard, and his face all drawn and pale and very deeply lined. Now as I looked at him I had a vague idea that I had somewhere, at some time, seen him before. "'Sir,' said the preacher, looking up, "'will you help me to carry him to my cottage? It is not very far.' So we presently took the man's wasted form between us, and bore it easily enough to where stood a small cottage, bowered in roses and honeysuckle. And having deposited our unconscious burden upon the preacher's humble bed, I turned to depart. Sir, said the preacher, holding out his hand, it is seldom one meets with a blacksmith who has read the Pythagorean philosophy at Oxford, and I should like to see you again. I am a lonely man, save for my books. Come and sup with me some evening, and let us talk. And smoke? said I. The little preacher sighed. "'I will come,' said I. "'Thank you, and good-bye.' Now even as I spoke, chancing to cast my eyes upon the pale, still face on the bed, I felt more certain than ever that I had somewhere seen it before. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, IN WHICH I COME TO A DETERMINATION As I walked through the fresh green world there ensued within me the following dispute, as it were, between myself and two voices. The first voice I will call Pro and the other, Contra, myself. May the devil take that gabbing dick. Pro, he probably will. Myself, had he not told me of what he saw, of the man who looked at my Virgil over her shoulder. Pro, or had you not listened. Myself, ah, yes, but then I did listen, and that he spoke the truth is beyond all doubt. The misplaced Virgil proves that. However, it is certain, yes, very certain, that I can remain no longer in the hollow. Contra, well, there is excellent accommodation at the bull. Pro. And pray, why leave the hollow? Myself. Because she is a woman. Pro. And you love her? Myself. To my sorrow. Pro. Well, but woman was made for man, Peter, and man for woman. Myself. Sternly. Enough of that. I must go. Pro. Being full of bitter jealousy. Myself. No. Pro. Being a mad, jealous fool. Myself. As you will. Pro, who has condemned her unheard with no chance of justification. Myself, to-morrow at the very latest I shall seek some other habitation. Pro, has she the look of guilt? Myself, no, but then women are deceitful by nature, and very skillful in disguising their faults, at least so I have read in my books. Pro, contemptuously, books, books, books. Myself, shortly, no matter, I have decided. Pro, do you remember how willingly she worked for you with those slender, capable hands of hers? Myself, why remind me of this? Pro, you must needs miss her presence sorely, her footstep that was always so quick and light. Myself, truly wonderful in one so nobly formed. Pro, and the way she had of singing softly to herself. 
myself, a beautiful voice. Pro, with a caress in it, and then her habit of looking at you over her shoulder. Myself, ah, yes, her lashes a little drooping, her brow a little wrinkled, her lips a little parted. Contra, a comfortable inn is the bull. Myself, hastily, yes, yes, certainly. Pro, ah, her lips, the scarlet witchery of her lips. Do you remember how sweetly the lower one curved upward to its fellow, a mutinous mouth with its sudden bewildering changes? You never quite knew which to watch oftenest, her eyes or her lips. Contra, hoarsely, excellent cooking at the bowl. Pro, and how she would berate you and scoff at your master Epictetus and dry-as-dust philosophers. Myself, I have sometimes wondered at her pronounced antipathy to Epictetus. Pro, and she called you a creature. Myself, the meaning of which I never quite fathomed. Pro, and frequently a pedant. Myself, I think not more than four times. Pro, on such occasions you will remember she had a petulant way of twitching her shoulder towards you and frowning, and occasionally stamping her foot, and deep within you you loved it all you know you did. Contra, but that is all over and you are going to the bull. Myself, hurriedly, to be sure, the bull. Pro, and lastly, you cannot have forgotten, you never will forget, the soft tumult of the tender bosom that pillowed your battered head, the pity of her hands, those great scalding tears, the sudden swift caress of her lips, and the thrill of her voice when she said, myself hastily, stop, that is all forgotten. Pro, you lie, you have dreamed of it ever since, working at your anvil or lying upon your bed, with your eyes upon the stars, you have loved her from the beginning of things. Myself, and I did not know it, I was very blind. The wonder is that she did not discover my love for her long ago, for not knowing it was there, how should I try to hide it? Contra, oh, blind and more than blind, why should you suppose she hasn't? Myself, stopping short, what? Can it be possible that she has? Contra, didn't she once say that she could read you like a book? Myself, she did. Contra, and have you not often surprised a smile upon her lips and wondered? Myself, many times. Contra, have you not beheld a thin-veiled mockery in her look? Why, poor fool, has she not mocked you from the first? You dream of her lips, were not their smiles but coquetry and derision. Myself, but why should she deride me? Contra, for your youth and innocence. Myself, my youth, my innocence. Contra, being a fool in grain, didn't you boast that you had known but few women? Myself, I did, but— Contra, didn't she call you boy, 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 and laugh at you? Myself, well, even so. Contra, with bitter scorn. Oh, boy, oh, innocent of the innocent. Go to for a bookish fool. Learn that lovely ladies yield themselves but to those who are masterful in their wooing, who have wooed often and triumphed as often. Oh, innocent of the innocent. Forget the maudlin sentiment of thy books and old romances, thy pure Sir Galahads, thy, quote, very parfait, gentil knights, unquote, thy meek and lowly lovers, serving their ladies on bended knee. Open thine eyes, learn that women to-day love only the strong hand, the bold eye, the ready tongue. Kneel to her, and she will scorn and contemn you. What woman, think you, would prefer the solemn, stern-eyed purity of a Sir Galahad, though he be the king of men? to the quick-witted gaiety of a debonair Lothario, though he be but the shadow of a man. Out upon thee, pale-faced student! Thy tongue hath not the trick, nor thy mind the nimbleness for the winning of a fair and lovely lady. Thou art well enough in want of a better, but when Lothario comes, must she not run to meet him with arms outstretched? To-morrow, said I, clenching my fists, to-morrow I will go away. Being now come to the hollow, I turned aside to the brook at that place where was the pool, in which I was wont to perform my morning ablutions, and kneeling down I gazed at myself in the dark, still water, and I saw that the night had indeed set its mark upon me. "'Tomorrow,' said I again, nodding to the wild face below, "'tomorrow I will go far hence.' Now while I yet gazed at myself I heard a sudden gasp behind me, and turning, beheld Charmian. "'Peter, is it you?' she whispered drawing back from me. Who else, Charmian? Did I startle you? Yes. Oh, Peter, are you afraid of me? You are like one who has walked with death. I rose to my feet and stood looking down at her. Are you afraid of me, Charmian? No, Peter. I am glad of that, 
said I, because I want to ask you to marry me, Charmian. End of In Which I Come to a Determination Section 35 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 29. In which Charmian answers my question. Peter! Yes? I wish you wouldn't. Wouldn't what, Charmian? Stir your tea round and round and round. It's really most exasperating. I beg your pardon, said I humbly. And you eat nothing, and that is also exasperating. I am not hungry. And I was so careful with the bacon. See, it is fried. Beautifully. Yes, you are very exasperating, Peter. Here, finding I was absent-mindedly stirring my tea round and round again, I gulped it down out of the way, whereupon Charmian took my cup and refilled it, having done which she set her elbows upon the table, and propping her chin in her hands looked at me. You climbed out through your window last night, Peter? Yes. It must have been a dreadfully tight squeeze. Yes. And why did you go by the window? I did not wish to disturb you. That was very thoughtful of you, only, you see, I was up and dressed. The roar of the thunder woke me. It was a dreadful storm, Peter. Yes. The lightning was awful. Yes. And you were out in it? Yes. Oh, you poor, poor Peter! How cold you must have been! On the contrary, I began, I— And wet, Peter, miserably wet and clammy. I did not notice, I murmured. Being a philosopher, Peter, and too much engrossed in your thoughts? I was certainly thinking. Of yourself? Yes. You are a great egoist, aren't you, Peter? Am I, Charmian? Who but an egoist could stand with his mind so full of himself and his own concerns as to be oblivious to thunder and lightning, and not know that he is miserable, clammy, and wet? I thought of others beside myself. But only in connection with yourself. Everything you have ever read or seen you apply to yourself, to make that self more worthy in Mr. Vibart's eyes. Is this worthy of Peter Vibart? Can Peter Vibart do this, that, or the other, and still retain the respect of Peter Vibart? Then why, being in all things so very correct and precise, why is Peter Vibart given to prowling abroad at midnight, quite oblivious to thunder, lightning, wet, and clamminess? I answer, because Peter Vibart is too much engrossed by Peter Vibart. There! That sounds rather cryptic and very full of Peter Vibart, but that is as it should be. And she laughed. And what does it mean, Charmian? Good sir, the Sibyl hath spoken. Find her meaning for yourself. You have called me on various occasions a creature, a pedant, very frequently a pedant, and now it seems I'm an egoist, and all because— Because you think too much, Peter. You never open your lips without having first thought out just what you are going to say. You never do anything without having laboriously mapped it all out beforehand that you may not outrage Peter Vibart's tranquillity by an impulsive act or speech. Oh! You are always thinking and thinking, and that is even worse than stirring and stirring at your tea as you are doing now. I took the spoon hastily from my cup and laid it as far out of reach as possible. If ever you write the book you once spoke of, it would be just the sort of book that I should hate. Why, Charmian? Because it would be a book of artfully turned phrases, a book in which all the characters, especially women, would think and speak and act by rote and rule, as according to Mr. Peter Vibart. It would be a scholarly book of elaborate finish and care of detail, with no irregularities of style or anything else to break the monotonous harmony of the whole. Indeed, sir, it would be a most unreadable book. Do you think so, Charmian? said I once more, taking up the teaspoon. Why, of course, she answered with raised brows, it would probably be full of Greek and Latin quotations, and you would polish and rewrite until you had polished every vestige of life and spontaneity out of it, as you do out of yourself with your thinking and thinking. But I never quote you Greek or Latin, that is surely something, and as for thinking, would you have me a thoughtless fool or an impulsive ass? Anything rather than a calculating, introspective philosopher, seeing only the mote in the sunbeam and nothing of the glory. Here she gently disengaged the teaspoon from my fingers, and laid it in her own saucer, having done which, she sighed, and looked at me with her head to one side. Were they all like you, Peter, I wonder, those old philosophers? 
grim and stern and terribly repressed, with burning eyes, Peter, and very long chins. Epictetus was, of course. And you dislike Epictetus, Charmian? I detest him. He was just the kind of person, Peter, who, being unable to sleep, would have wandered out into a terrible thunderstorm in the middle of the night, and being cold and wet and clammy, Peter, would have drawn moral lessons and made epigrams upon the thunder and lightning. Epictetus, I am sure, was a person. He was one of the wisest, gentlest, and most lovable of all the Stoics, said I. Can a philosopher possibly be lovable, Peter? Here I very absent-mindedly took up a fork, but finding her eye upon me laid it down again. You are very nervous, Peter, and very pale and worn and haggard, and all because you habitually overthink yourself. And indeed there is something very far wrong with a man who perseveringly stirs an empty cup with a fork, and with a laugh she took my cup, and having once more refilled it, set it before me. And yet, Peter, I don't think, no, I don't think I would have you very much changed after all. You mean that you would rather I remained the pedantic, egotistical creature? I mean, Peter, that being a woman I naturally love novelty, and you are very novel, and very interesting. Thank you, said I, frowning, and more contradictory than any woman. Hm, said I. You are so strong and simple, so wise and brave, so very weak and foolish and timid. Timid? said I. Timid, nodded she. I am a vast fool, I acknowledged, and I never knew a man anything like you before, Peter. And you have known many, I understand. Very many. Yes, you told me so once before, I believe. Twice, Peter, and each time you became very silent and gloomy. Now you, on the other hand, she continued, have known very few women and my life has been calm and unruffled in consequence. You had your books, Peter, and your horseshoes. My books and horseshoes, yes. And were content? Quite content. Until one day a woman came to you. Until one day I met a woman. And then? And then I asked her to marry me, Charmian. Here there ensued a pause, during which Charmian began to pleat a fold in the tablecloth. That was rather unwise of you, wasn't it? said she at last. How unwise! "'Because she might have taken you at your word, Peter. "'Do you mean that, that you won't, Charmian? "'Oh, dear, no. "'I have arrived at no decision yet. "'How could I? "'You must give me time to consider.' "'Here she paused in her pleading to regard it critically, "'with her head on one side. "'To be sure,' said she with a little nod, "'to be sure you need someone to look after you. "'That is very evident. "'Yes. "'To cook and wash for you. "'Yes. "'To mend your clothes for you. "'Yes.' And you think me sufficiently competent? Oh, Charmian, I... Yes. Thank you, said she, very solemnly, and though her lashes had drooped, I felt the mockery of her eyes, wherefore I took a sudden great gulp of tea and came near choking, while Charmian began to pleat another fold in the tablecloth. And so Mr. Vibart would stoop to wed so humble a person as Charmian Brown. Mr. Vibart would, actually, marry a woman who of whose past he knows nothing. Yes said I. That again would be rather unwise, wouldn't it? Why? Considering Mr. Vibart's very lofty ideals in regard to women. What do you mean? Didn't you once say that your wife's name must be above suspicion, like Caesar's, or something of the kind? Did I? Yes, perhaps I did. Well? Well, this woman, this humble person, has no name at all, and no shred of reputation left her. She has compromised herself beyond all redemption in the eyes of the world. But then, said I, this world and I have always mutually despised each other. She ran away, this woman, eloped with the most notorious, the most accomplished rake in London. Well, oh, is that not enough? Enough for what, Charmian? I saw her busy fingers falter and tremble, but her voice was steady when she answered, enough to make any wise man think twice before asking this humble person to marry him. I might think twenty times, and it would be all one. You mean that if Charmian Brown will stoop to marry a village blacksmith, Peter Vibart will find happiness again, a happiness that is not of the sunshine, nor the wind in the trees. Lord, what a fool I was! Her fingers had stopped altogether now, but she neither spoke nor raised her head. Charmian, said I, leaning nearer across the table, speak. Oh, Peter, said she, with a sudden break in her voice, and stooped her head lower, yet in a little she looked up at me, and her eyes were very sweet and shining. 
now as our glances met thus up from throat to brow there crept that hot slow wave of colour and in her face and in her eyes i seemed to read joy and fear and shame and radiant joy again but now she bent her head once more and strove to plead another fold and could not while i grew suddenly afraid of her and of myself and longed to hurl aside the table that divided us and thrust my hands deep into my pockets and finding there my tobacco pipe brought it out and fell to turning it aimlessly over and over i would have spoken only i knew that my voice would tremble so i sat mum chance staring at my pipe with unseeing eyes and with my brain in a ferment and presently came her voice cool and sweet and sane your tobacco peter and she held the box toward me across the table ah thank you said i and began to fill my pipe while she watched me with her chin propped in her hands peter yes charmian i wonder why so grave a person as mr peter vibart should seek to marry so impossible a creature as the humble person i think i answered i think if there is any special reason it is because of your mouth my mouth or your eyes or the way you have with your lashes charmian laughed and forthwith drooped them at me and laughed again and shook her head but surely peter surely there are thousands millions of women with mouths and eyes like the humble persons it is possible said i but none who have the same way with their lashes what do you mean i can't tell i don't know don't you peter no it is just a way and so it is that you want to marry this very humble person i think i have wanted to from the very first but did not know it being a blind fool and did it need a night walk in a thunderstorm to teach you no that is yes perhaps it did and are you quite quite sure quite quite sure said i and as i spoke i laid my pipe upon the table and rose and because my hands were trembling i clenched my fists but as i approached her she started up and put out a hand to hold me off and then i saw that her hands were trembling also and standing thus she spoke very softly peter yes charmian do you remember describing to me the perfect woman who should be your wife yes how that you must be able to respect her for her intellect yes honor her for her virtue yes charmian and worship her for her spotless purity i dreamed a paragon perfect and impossible i was a fool said i impossible oh peter w what do you mean she was only an impalpable shade quite impossible of realization a bloodless thing as you said and quite unnatural a sickly figment of the imagination i was a fool and you are too wise now to expect such virtues in any woman yes said i N no oh charmian i only know that you have taken this phantom's place that you fill all my thoughts sleeping and waking no no she cried and struggled in my arms so that i caught her hands and held them close and kissed them many times oh charmian charmian don't you know can't you see it is you i want you and only you forever whatever you were whatever you are i love you love you and always must marry me charmian marry me and you shall be dearer than my life more to me than my soul but as i spoke her hands were snatched away her eyes blazed into mine and her lips were all bitter scorn and at the sight fear came upon me marry you she panted marry you no and no and no and so she stamped her foot and sobbed and turning fled from me out of the cottage and now to fear came wonder and with wonder was despair truly was ever man so great a fool end of in which charmian answers my question thirty six of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by ellen preckle the Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall Chapter 30 Concerning the Fate of Black George A broad white road, on either hand some half-dozen cottages, with roofs of thatch or red tile, backed by trees gnarled and ancient, among which rises the red conical roof of some Osthouse. Such, in a word, is Sissinghurst. Now upon the left-hand side of the way there stands a square, comfortable, whitewashed building, peaked of roof, bright as to windows, and with a mighty sign before the door, whereon you shall behold the picture of a bull, 
a bull rolling of eye, astonishingly curly of horn, and stiff as to tail, and with a prodigious girth of neck and shoulder. Such a snorting, fiery-eyed, curly-horned bull, as was never seen off an inn sign. It was at this bull that I was staring, with much apparent interest, though indeed had that same curly-horned monstrosity been changed by some enchanter's wand into a green dragon, or a griffin, or swan with two necks, the chances are that I should have continued sublimely unconscious of the transformation. Yet how should honest Silas Hoskins, ostler, and general factotum of the Bull Inn, be aware of this fact, who, being thus early at work, and seeing me lost in contemplation, paused to address me in all good faith. "'A fine bully be, eh, Peter? Look at them horns! And that there tail! It's seldom as you sees horns or a tail like of them, eh?' "'Very seldom,' I answered, and sighed. "'And then is nose holes, Peter. Just cast your eyes on them nose holes, will ya? Why, dang me, if I can't hear him a-snortin' when I looks at him. And you were all painted by a chap, a little old chap with grey whiskers no taller than your elber, Peter. Think of that, a little chap no taller than your elber. I seen him do my own two eyes, a-sittin' on a box. Drored to bull with a bit of chalk first, then he outs with a couple of brushes. Dab he goes, and dab, dab again, and by goals there was a pair of eyes a-rollin' themselves at me. Just a pair of eyes, Peter. Ah! He were a wonder, that little chap with grey whiskers. The way he went at that dear bull, a-dabbin' at him here, and a-dabbin' at him there, till he come to his tail. He'd done his tail last of all, Peter. Given a good tail, I says. Ay, that I will, says he, and a good stiff un, says I. Ye just keep your eye on it and watch, says he. Talk about tails, Peter. He put in that there tail so quick, nigh made me eyes water, and as for stiffness, well, look ye that. I'll tell you that chap could paint a bull with his eyes shut, I had he could, and him such a very small man with grey whiskers. No, nope, you don't see many bulls like that in there, I'm thinking, Peter. They would be very hard to find, said I, and sighed again. Whereupon Silas sighed for company's sake, and nodding, went off about his many duties, whistling cheerily. So I presently turned about and crossed the road to the smithy, but upon the threshold I stopped all at once and drew softly back, for despite the early hour Prudence was there upon her knees before the anvil, with George's great hand-hammer clasped to her bosom, sobbing over it, and while she sobbed she kissed its worn handle, and because such love was sacred and hallowed that dingy place, I took off my hat as I once more crossed the road. Seeing the bull was not yet astir, for the day was still young, as I say, I sat me down on the porch and sighed, and after I had sat there for some while, with my chin sunk upon my breast, plunged in bitter meditation, I became aware of the door opening and the next moment a tremulous hand was upon my head, and looking round I beheld the ancient. Bless ye, Peter, bless ye, lad, and an old man's blessing be no light thing, especially such a old, old man as I be, and if but ain't as often as I feels in a blessing spirit, but, oh, Peter, twere me as found ye, weren't it? Why, to be sure it was, ancient, very nearly five months ago, and I'll be all us ready with some news for ye, bain't I? Yes, indeed. Well, I got more news for ye, Peter, girt news. And what is it this time? I be allus full up a news, bain't I? he repeated. Yes, ancient, said I, and sighed. And what is your news? Why, first of all, Peter, just reach me my snuff box, will he? Here it be, in my back eind pocket. Thank ye, thank ye. Hereupon he knocked upon the lid with a bony knuckle. I do be that full of news this marnin' that my innards be all of a quake, Peter, all of a quake, he nodded, saying which he sat down close beside me. Peter. Yes, ancient. Some day, when dear old Stip will be all rusted away, and these old bones are resting in the churchyard over to Cranbrook, Peter, you'll think, sometimes, of the very old man as was always so full of news, won't ye, Peter? Surely, ancient, I shall never forget you, said I, and sighed. And now, Peter, said the old man, extracting a pinch of snuff, now for your news, about Black Jarge it be. What of him, ancient? The old man shook his head. It took eight on em to do it, Peter, and now four on em's layin' in their beds, and four on em's oblin' on crutches, and all over a couple of rabbits. Though dear be some fools who say it was partridges. Why, what do you mean? Why, ye see, Peter, Black Jarge be such a girt strong man. I were much such another when I were young. Like lion in his wrathy be, ah! A bull ain't nothing to Black Jarge. 
and they keepers come and found him under a tree fast asleep like david in the cave of adullam peter with a couple of rabbits he'd snared and when they keepers tried to tack him he rose up he did and throwed some on em this way and some on em that way twere like samson and the philistines if only he'd happened to find the jawbone of an ass lying handy he'd a killed em all and got away sure as sure but it weren't to be peter no dead donkeys be scarce nowadays and as for asses jawbones do you mean that george is taken prisoner the ancient nodded and inhaled his pinch of snuff with much evident relish it be girt new spant it peter what have they done with him where is he ancient but before the old man could answer simon appeared oh peter said he shaking his head the gaffer's been telling you how they've took charge for poaching i suppose simon cried the ancient shut thy mouth lad hold thy gab and give thy poor old feather a chance i be telling him so fast as i can as i was a saying peter like a furish lion were jarge with the keepers ate on em peter like dogs a growlin and growlin and leapin and worryin all around him ah like a lion he were waitin for a chance to use is right do you see peter added simon with his eyes a rollin and flamin peter and his mane all bristlin cool as any cucumber peter a roarin and lashin of his tail and sparrin for an openin peter and when he sees one down in his man every time leapin in the air rollin in the grass with thy keepers clingin to him like leeches ah leeches and every time they rush tap but go his left and bang good go his right and up he'd get like samson again peter and give himself a shake bellerin like a bull of bashan you see they fought so close together that the keepers were afeard to use their guns guns who's a talking of guns simon me boy you be all as a maggin and a maggin bridle thy tongue lad bridle thy tongue afore it runs away wi ye all right holden fire away but at this juncture old amos hove in view followed by the apologetic dutton with job and sundry others on their way to work and as they came they talked together with much solemn wagging of heads having reached the door of the bull they paused and greeted us and i thought old amos's habitual grin seemed a trifle more pronounced than usual so poor george has been gone and done for himself at last eh oh my soul think of that now sighed old amos all us knowed he would added job many's the time i've said he would and you know it all on ya it be the barbadies or australia grinned amos transportation it'll be oh my soul think of that now and him a sissonerst man and all along a couple of rabbits said the ancient emphasizing the last word with a loud rap on his snuff-box partridges gaffer they was partridges returned old amos i always said as black jarge had come to a bad end reiterated job and what's more he aren't got nobody to blame but hisself and all for a couple of rabbits sighed the ancient staring old amos full in the eye patridges gaffer they was patridges you james dutton was they patridges or was they not speak up james hereupon the man dutton all perspiring apology as usual shuffled forward and mopping his reeking brow delivered himself in this wise which i must say meanin no offence to nobody and if is so be apologizin which i must say me avin seen em they was least a ways he added as he met the ancient's piercing eye least a ways they might have been which if they ain't no matter having said which he apologetically smeared his face all over with his shirt sleeve and subsided again ye do wring my heart eye that it do to think of poor jarge a convict at botany bay said old amos a workin and diggin and slavin with irons on his legs and arms a jinglin and a janglin when he walks well but it's justice aren't it demanded job a poacher's a thief and a thief's a convict or should be i've heard said old amos shaking his head i've heard as they ties their convicts to posts and lashes and lashes em with the cat and nine tails they generally most deserves it nodded job but tis hard to think of poor jarge tied up to one of them flogging posts with his back all raw and bleedin pursued old amos Grow lard it be, and him such a fine strapping young chap. 
he were always a sight too fond o' pitchin into folk jarge were said job it'd be a mercy as my back weren't broke more'n once ah nodded the ancient you must be amazin strong in the back job the way i've seen ee come a-rollin and a-wallerin out o that dear smithy's wonderful wonderful lord job how you did roll well he won't never do it no more said job glowering well with poachin his game and knockin his keepers about t'aren't likely a squire beverly'll let em off very easy who said i looking up and speaking for the first time squire beverly'll burn em all sir peregrine beverly ay for sure and how far is it to burnham hall how fur repeated job staring why it lays to other side of horse maunden it'll be a matter of eight miles peter said the ancient nine peter cried old amos nine mile it be though i won't swear peter continued the ancient i won't swear as it aren't seven call it six and three quarters said he with his eagle eye on old amos then i'd better start now said i and rose why peter where you be going to burnham hall ancient what you exclaimed job do you think the squire'll see you i'd think so yes well you won't they'll never let the likes of you or me beyond the gates that remains to be seen said i so you am goin are ya i certainly am all right nodded job if they sets the dogs on you or chucks you into the road don't go blamin it on me that's all what be really a goin peter i really am ancient then by the lord i'll go with ya it's a long walk nay simon shall drive us in the cart that i will nodded the innkeeper ay lad cried the ancient laying his hand upon my arm we'll up and see squire you and me shall us pierre there'll be some fuels said he looking round upon the staring company some fuels as talk of botany bay and irons and whipping posts all i say is let em peter let em you and me'll up and see squire peter shan't us black jarge aren't a convict yet let fuels say what they will we'll show em peter we'll show em so saying, the old man led me into the kitchen of the bull, while Simon went to have the horses put to. End of chapter 30 Concerning the Fate of Black George Seven of the Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Book Two, Chapter Thirty One, in which the ancient is surprised. A cheery place at all times is the kitchen of an English inn, a comfortable place to eat in, to talk in, or to doze in, a place with which your parlors and with the drawing rooms, your salons, a la the three Louis, with their irritating rococo, their gilt and satin and spindle legged discomforts, are not, to my mind, worthy to compare. And what inn kitchen in all broad England was ever brighter, neater, and more comfortable than this kitchen of the bull, where sweet Prue held supreme sway, with such grave dignity, and with her two white-capped maids to do her bidding and behests? Surely none. And surely in no inn, tavern, or hostelry soever, great or small, was there ever seen a daintier, prettier, sweeter hostess than this same Prue of ours and her presence was reflected everywhere, and if ever the kitchen of an inn possessed a heart to lose, then beyond all doubt this kitchen had lost its heart to prue long since. Even the battered cutlasses crossed upon the wall, the ponderous jack above the hearth, with its legend, Anno Domini 1643, took on a brighter sheen to greet her when she came, and as for the pots and pans, they fairly twinkled. But today Prue's eyes were red, and her lips were all a-droop, the which, though her smile was brave and ready, the ancient was quick to notice. "'Why, Prue, lass, you've been weepin'. "'Yes, Granfer. "'Your pretty eyes be all swole, red they be. "'What's the trouble?' "'Oh, tis nothing, dear. "'Tis just a maid's foolishness. "'Never mind me, dear.' "'Ah, but I love ye, Prue. "'Come, kiss me.' There now, tell me all about it, all about it, Prue. Oh, Granfer, said she from the hollow of his shoulder, tis just Jarge. The old man grew very still, his mouth opened slowly and closed with a snap. Did he, did he say, Jarge, Prue, is it breaking your art ye be for that dear poachin' black Jarge? 
To think as my Prue should come down to a poachin'. Prudence slipped from his encircling arm and stood up very straight and proud. There were tears thick upon her lashes, but she did not attempt to wipe them away. Granfer, she said very gently, you mustn't speak of Jarge to me like that. Ye mustn't. Ye mustn't because I love him, and if he ever comes back, I'll marry him if, if he will only ax me. And if he never comes back, then I think I shall die. The ancient took out his snuff box, knocked it, opened it, glanced inside, and shut it up again. Did he tell me as you love Black Jarge, Prue? Yes, Grandfer, I always have, and always shall. Loves Black Jarge, he repeated. Allus has, allus will. Oh, Lord, what have I done? Now, very slowly, a tear crept down his wrinkled cheek, at sight of which Prue gave a little cry, and, kneeling beside his chair, took him in her arms. Oh, my lass, my little Prue, tis all my doin'. I thought, oh, Prue, twere me as parted you. I thought, the quivering voice broke off. Tis all right, Granfer, never think of it. See there, I be smilin'. And she kissed him many times. A danged fool I be, said the old man, shaking his head. No, no, Granfer. That's what I be, Prue, a danged fool. If I do go afore that dear old rusty staple, twill serve me right. A danged fool I be. Allus loved him, allus will, and wishful to wed with him. Why then, said the ancient, swallowing two or three times, so he shall, my sweet, so he shall, sure as sure. So come and kiss me, and forgive the old man as loves he so. What do we mean, Granfer? said Prue between two kisses. A fine, strappin' chap be Jarge. After all, Peter, you been to patch on Jarge for looks, be you? No, indeed, ancient. Wishful to wed him she is, and so she shall. Lordy, Lord! Kiss me again, Prue, for I be goin' to see Squire. Ay, I be goin' to up and speak with Squire for Jarge, and Peter be comin' too. Oh, Mr. Peter, faltered Prudence, be this true? And in her eyes was the light of a sudden hope. Yes, I nodded. Do you think Squire'll see you, listen to you? She cried breathlessly. I think he will, Prudence, said I. God bless you, Mr. Peter, she murmured. God bless you. But now came the sound of wheels and the voice of Simon, calling, wherefore I took my hat and followed the ancient to the door. But there Prudence stopped me. Last time you met with George, he tried to kill you. Oh, I know, and now you be going to... Nonsense, Prue, said I. But as I spoke, she stooped and would have kissed my hand, but I raised her and kissed her upon the cheek instead. For good luck, Prue, said I, and so turned and left her. In the porch sat Job, with old Amos and the rest, still in solemn conclave over pipes and ale, who watched with gloomy brows as I swung myself up beside the ancient in the cart. A fool's journey, remarked old Amos sententiously with a wave of his pipe. A fool's journey. The ancient cast an observing eye up at the cloudless sky, and also nodded solemnly. There be some fools in this world, Peter, as mixes up rabbits with partridges, and honest men, like Jarge, with thieves, and lazy wagabones, like Job. But we'll show em, Peter, we'll show em, dang em. Drive on, Simon, my boy. So with this Parthian shot, feathered with the one strong word the ancient kept for such occasions, we drove away from the silenced group, who stared mutely after us until we were lost to view. But the last thing I saw was the light in Prue's sweet eyes as she watched us from the open lattice. CHAPTER Thirty Two: HOW WE SET OUT FOR BURNHAM HALL Peter, said the ancient, after we had gone a little way, Peter, I do opes as you aren't been and gone and rose my Prue's opes only to dash them down again. I can but do my best, ancient. Olden, said Simon, twert Peter as rose her hopes, twere you. 
Peter never said naught about bringing Jarge home. Simon, commanded the ancient, hold thy tongue, lad. I says again, if Peter's been and rose Prue's opes only to dash em, twill be a bad day for Prue. You mark my words. Prue's a lass as don't love easy, and don't forget easy. Why, true, gaffer, true, God bless her. She'd be one as'd pine, slow and quiet, like a flower in the woods or a leaf in autumn. Ah, fade she would, fade and fade. Well, she bain't a-goin' to do no fadin', please the Lord. Not if me and Peter and you can help it, Simon, my boy. But we'm but poor worms, after all, as the Bible says. And if Peter has been in roser hopes of freein' Jarge, and don't free Jarge, if Jarge should have to go a convict to Australia, or to the other place, why then she'll fade, fade as ever was, and be laid in the churchyard afore her poor old grandfather. Lord, Olden, exclaimed Simon, who's a talkin' of fadins in churchyards? I don't like it. Let's talk of summat else. Simon, said the ancient, shaking his head reprovingly, ye be a good boy. Ah, a steady, dutiful lad ye be, I don't deny it. But the Lord aren't give you no imagination, which, after all, you should be main thankful for. An imagination's a troublesome thing, aren't it, Peter? It is, said I, a damnable thing. Ay, many's the man as have been ruinated by his imagination. There was one, Nicodemus Blight were his name. And a very miserable cove he sounds, too, added Simon. But a very decent, civil-spoke, quiet young chap he were, continued the ancient. Only for his imagination, Lord. He were that full of imagination he couldn't drink his ale like an ordinary chap. Sip, he'd go, and sip, sip, till twere all gone. And then he'd forget as ever he'd add any, and go away without paying for it, if someone didn't remind him. He were no fool, Olden, nodded Simon. And that weren't all, neither, not by no manner of means, the ancient continued. I've knowed that their chap sit and listen to a pretty lass by the hour together, and never say a word, not one. Didn't get a chance to, perhaps, said Simon. It weren't that. No, it were just his imagination a workin' and workin' inside of him and fillin' him up. Owls ever, at last, one day, he up and axed her to marry him. And she, being all took by surprise, said yes, and went and married someone else. Lord, said Simon, what did she go and marry another chap for? Simon, returned the ancient, don't go askin' foolish questions. How's ever she did, and poor Nicodemus growed more imaginative than ever. After that, he took to turnips. Turnips, exclaimed Simon, staring. Turnips, as ever was nodded the ancient, used to stand for hours at a time a-looking at his turnips and shaking his head over em. But what for? A man must be a danged fool to go shaking of his head over a lot of turnips. Well, I don't know, rejoined the ancient. His turnips was very good uns as a rule, and fetched top prices in the markets. At this juncture there appeared a man in a cart ahead of us, who flourished his whip and roared a greeting a coarse-visaged, loud-voiced fellow, whose beefy face was adorned with a pair of enormous fiery whiskers that seemed forever striving to hide his ears, which last, being very large and red, stood boldly out at right angles to his head, refusing to be thus ambushed and scorning all concealment. "'What? Be that the olden? Be you alive and kicking yet?' "'Aye, God be thanked, John!' "'And what be all this I hear about that dear black Jarge? "'He never were much good. "'But what be all this?' "'Lies, mostly, you may take your oath,' nodded the ancient. "'But he've been took for poaching, ah, and locked up at the all. "'And we'm going to fetch him. "'We be going to see Squire. "'What? You, olden? "'You see Squire? Ah, ha! "'Ah, me, and Peter.' and Simon here. Why not? You see his worship, Sir Peregrine Beverly, Baronet, and Justice of the Peace? You? Ecod, that's a good un. Danged if it ain't. And what might you be wishful to do when you see him? Which you won't? Fetch back George, of course. 
Olden, you must be crazed in your head, after George killin' four keepers, Sir Peregrine's own keepers, too, shootin' em stone dead, and three more a-dyin'. John, said the ancient, shaking his head, that's the worst of being cursed with ears like yourn. My ears is all right, returned John, frowning. Oh, ah, chuckled the old man. Your ears is all right, John. Prize ears, you might call em. I never seed a pair better growed. Never, no. A bit large they may be, growled John, giving a furtive pull to the nearest ambush. But large as ever was, John, nodded the ancient, uncommon large and consequent they catches a lot too much. I've kept my eye on them ears of yourn for thirty years and more, John. If so be as they grows any bigger, you'll be earin' things afore they're spoke, and— John gave a fierce tug to the ambush, muttered an oath, and lashing up his horse, disappeared down the road in a cloud of dust. "'Twere nigh on four year ago since Black Jarge thrashed John, weren't it, Simon?' "'Ah,' nodded Simon. John were in the ring then, Peter, and a pretty tough chap he were, too, though a bit too fond of swinging with his right to please me. He were very sweet on Prue then, weren't he, Simon? Ah, nodded Simon again. He were always hanging around the bull, till I warned him off. And he laughed at he, Simon. Ah, he did that, and I were going to have a go at him myself and the chances are he'd have beat me, seeing I hadn't been inside of a ring for ten year when— "'Up comes Jarge,' chuckled the ancient. "'What's all this?' say Jarge. "'I be going to teach John here to keep away from my prue,' says Simon. "'No, no,' says Jarge. "'John's young, and you beat the man you was ten years ago. "'Let me,' says Jarge. "'You,' says John, "'you get back to your bellers. "'You be pretty big, but I've beat the heads off better men nor you.' "'Why, then, have a try at mine,' says Jarge, and with the word, bang, comes John's fist against his jaw, and they was at it. "'Oh, Peter, that were a fight. I seed a few in my time, but nothing like that air. "'And when twere all over,' added Simon, "'Jarge went back to his ammer and bellers, and we picked John up, and I drove him home in this ere very cart, and nobody's cared to stand up to Jarge since.' "'You have both seen Black George fight, then?' I inquired. "'Many's the time, Peter.' "'And have you ever seen him knocked down?' "'No,' returned the ancient, shaking his head. "'I've seen him all blood from head to foot, "'and once a girt big sailor-man knocked him sideways, "'after which Jarge got up furious like and put him to sleep.' "'No, Peter,' added Simon. I don't think as there be a man in all England as could knock Black Jarge off his pins in a fair stand-up fight. Hm, said I. You see, he be that ard, Peter, nodded the ancient. Why, look, he cried, looky there. Now, looking where he pointed, I saw a man dart across the road some distance away. He was hidden almost immediately, for there were many trees thereabouts but there was no mistaking that length of limb and breadth of shoulder. "'Twere Black George's self!' exclaimed Simon, whipping up his horses. But when we reached the place, George was gone, and though we called and sought for some time, we saw him no more. So in a while we turned and jogged back toward Sissinghurst. "'What be you a-shaking your head over, Olden?' inquired Simon, after we had ridden some distance. I were wondering what that old fool Amos'll say when we drive back without Jarge. Being come to the parting of the ways, I descended from the cart, for my head was strangely heavy, and I felt much out of sorts. And though the day was still young, I had no mind for work. Therefore I bade adieu to Simon and the Ancient, and turned aside towards the hollow, leaving them staring after me in wonderment. End of Book 2, Chapter 32 Read by Laurie Ann Walden Section 38 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 33. In Which I Fall From Folly Into Madness. It was with some little trepidation that I descended into the hollow and walked along beside the brook, 
for soon i should meet charmian and the memory of our parting and the thought of this meeting had been in my mind all day long she would not be expecting me yet for i was much before my usual time wherefore i walked on slowly beside the brook deliberating on what i should say to her until i came to that large stone where i had sat dreaming the night when she had stood in the moonlight and first bidden me in to supper and now sinking upon this stone i set my elbows upon my knees and my chin in my hands and fixing my eyes upon the ever-moving waters of the brook fell into a profound meditation from this i was suddenly aroused by the clink of iron and the snort of a horse wondering i lifted my eyes but the bushes were very dense and i could see nothing but in a little borne upon the gentle wind came the sound of a voice low and soft and very sweet whose rich tones there was no mistaking followed almost immediately by another deeper gruffer the voice of a man with a bound i was upon my feet and had somehow crossed the brook but even so i was too late there was the crack of a whip followed by the muffled thud of a horse's hoofs which died quickly away and was lost in the stir of leaves I ground my teeth and cursed that fate which seemed determined that I should not meet this man face to face, this man whose back I had seen but once, a broad-shouldered back clad in a blue coat. I stood where I was, dumb and rigid, staring straight before me, and once again a tremor passed over me that came and went, growing stronger and stronger, and once again in my head was the thud, thud, thud of the hammer. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling, made every youth cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. She was approaching by that leafy path that wound its way along beside the brook, and there came upon me a physical nausea, and ever the thud of the hammer grew more maddening. All in the merry month of May, when green buds they were swelling, young Jemmy Grove on his deathbed lay. For love of Barbara Allen. Now as she ended the verse she came out into the open and saw me, and seeing me, looked deliberately over my head and went on singing while I stood shivering. So slowly, slowly raised she up, and slowly she came nigh him, and when she drew the curtain by, young man, I think you're dying. And suddenly the trees and bushes swung giddily round, the grass swayed beneath my feet, and Charmian was beside me with her arm about my shoulders, but I pushed her from me and leaned against a tree nearby, and hearkened to the hammer in my brain. "'Why, Peter!' said she. "'Oh, Peter!' "'Please, Charmian,' said I, speaking between the hammer strokes, "'do not touch me again. It is too soon after.' "'What do you mean, Peter? What do you mean? He has been with you again.' "'What do you mean?' she cried. "'I know of his visits.' if he was the same as last time in a blue coat no don't don't touch me but she had sprung upon me and caught me by the arms and shook me in a grip so strong that giddy as i was i reeled and staggered like a drunken man and still her voice hissed what do you mean and her voice and hands and eyes were strangely compelling i mean i answered in a low even voice like one in a trance that you are a messalina a julia a joan of naples beautiful as they and as wanton now at the word she cried out and struck me twice across the face blows that burnt and stung beast she cried liar oh that i had the strength to grind you into the earth beneath my foot oh you poor blind self-deluding fool and she laughed and her laughter stung me most of all as i look at you she went on the laugh still curling her lip you stand there what you are a beaten hound this is my last look and I shall always remember you as I see you now, scarlet-cheeked, shame-faced, a beaten hound. And speaking, she shook her hand at me and turned upon her heel, but with that word and in that instant the old, old demon leapt up within me, and as he leapt I clasped my arms about her and caught her up and crushed her close and high against my breast. Go? said I. Go? No. No, not yet and now as her eyes met mine i felt her tremble yet she strove to hide her fear and heaped me with bitter scorn but i only shook my head and smiled and now she struggled to break my clasp fiercely desperately her long hair burst its fastenings and enveloped us both in its rippling splendor she beat my face she wound her fingers in my hair but my lips smiled on for the hammer in my brain had deadened all else and presently she lay still i felt her body relax and grow suddenly pliable and soft 
Her head fell back across my arm, and as she lay, I saw the tears of her helplessness ooze out beneath her drooping lashes. But still I smiled. So, with her long hair trailing over me, I bore her to the cottage. Closing the door behind me with my foot, I crossed to the room and set her down upon the bed. She lay very still, but her bosom heaved tumultuously, and the tears still crept from beneath her lashes. But in a while she opened her eyes and looked at me, and shivered, and crouched farther from me among the pillows. Why did you lie to me, Charmian? Why did you lie to me? She did not answer, only she watched me as one might watch some relentless oncoming peril. I asked you once if you ever saw men hereabouts, when I was away, do you remember? You told me no, and while you spoke I knew you lied, for I had seen him standing among the leaves, waiting and watching for you. I once asked you if you were ever lonely when I was away, and you answered no. You were too busy, seldom went beyond the hollow, do you remember? And yet you had brought him here, here into the cottage. He had looked at my Virgil over your shoulder, do you remember? You played the spy, she whispered with trembling lips, yet with eyes still fierce and scornful. You know I did not. Had I seen him, I should have killed him, because I loved you. I had set up an altar to you in my heart, where my soul might worship. Poor fool that I was! I loved you with every breath I drew. I think I must have shown you something of this from time to time, for you are very clever, and you may have laughed over it together, you and he. And lately I have seen my altar foully desecrated, shattered, and utterly destroyed, and with it your sweet womanhood dragged in the mire, and yet I loved you still. Can you imagine, I wonder, the agony of it, the haunting horrors of imagination, the bitter days, the sleepless nights? To see you so beautiful, so glorious, and know you so base. Indeed, I think it came near driving me mad. It has sent me out into the night. I have held out my arms for the lightning to blast me. I have wished myself a thousand deaths. If Black George had but struck a little harder, or a little lighter. I am not the man I was before he thrashed me. My head grows confused and clouded at times. Would to God I were dead! But now you would go? Having killed my heart, broken my life, driven away all peace of mind, you would leave me. No, Charmian, I swear by God you shall not go yet a while. I have bought you very dear, bought you with my bitter agony, and by all the blasting torments I have suffered. Now as I ended she sprang from the bed and faced me, but meeting my look she shrank a little and drew her long hair about her like a mantle, then sought with trembling hands to hold me off. Peter, be sane! Oh, Peter, be merciful and let me go! Give me time, let me explain! My books, said I, have taught me, that the more beautiful a woman's face, the more guileful is her heart, and your face is wonderfully beautiful, and as for your heart, you lied to me before. I— Oh, Peter, I am not the poor creature you think me. Were you the proudest lady in the land, you have deceived me and mocked me and lied to me. So saying, I reached out and seized her by each rounded arm and slowly drew her closer. And now she strove no more against me. Only in her face was bitter scorn and an anger that cast out fear. I hate you, despise you, she whispered. I hate you more than any man was ever hated. Inch by inch I drew her to me, until she stood close within the circle of my arms. And I think I love you more than any woman was ever loved, said I. For the glorious beauty of your strong, sweet body, for the temptation of your eyes, for the red lure of your lips. And so I stooped and kissed her full on the mouth. She lay soft and warm in my embrace, all unresisting, only she shivered beneath my kiss and a great sob rent her bosom. And I also think, said I, that because of the perfidy of your heart I hate you as much as you do me, as much as ever woman, dead or living, was hated by man, and shall, forever. And while I spoke I loosed her and turned, and strode swiftly out and away from the cottage. CHAPTER Thirty Four, IN WHICH I FIND PEACE AND JOY AND AN ABIDING SORROW I hurried on, looking neither to right nor left, seeing only the face of Charmian, now fearful and appealing, now blazing with scorn, and coming to the brook I sat down, and thought upon her marvellous beauty, of the firm roundness of the arms that my fingers had so lately pressed. Anon I started up again and plunged knee-deep through the brook, and strode on and on, bursting my way through bramble and briar, heedless of their petty stings, till at last I was clear of them, being now among trees. And here, where the shadow was deepest, I came upon a lurking figure, a figure I recognized, 
a figure there was no mistaking in which I should have known in a thousand. A shortish, broad-shouldered man, clad in a blue coat, who stood with his back towards me, looking down into the hollow, in the attitude of one who waits. For what? For whom? He was cut off from me by a solitary bush, a bramble that seemed to have strayed from its kind and lost itself, and running upon my toes I cleared this bush at a bound, and before the fellow had realized my presence I had pinned him by the collar. "'Damn you! Show your face!' I cried, and swung him round so fiercely that he staggered and his hat fell off. Then, as I saw, I clasped my head between my hands and fell back, staring. A grizzled man with an honest open face, a middle-aged man whose homely features were lighted by a pair of kindly blue eyes, just now round with astonishment. "'Lord! Mr. Peter!' he exclaimed. "'Adam!' I groaned. "'Oh, God forgive me, it's Adam!' "'Lord, Mr. Peter!' said he again. "'You sure give me a turn. What's the matter with you, sir? Come, Mr. Peter, never stare so wild-like. Come, sir, what is it?' "'Tell me quick,' said I, catching his hand in mine. "'You have been here many times before of late?' "'Why, yes, Mr. Peter, but—' "'Quick,' said I, on one occasion. She took you into the cottage yonder and showed you a book. You looked at it over her shoulder? "'Yes, sir, but—' "'What sort of book was it?' "'An old book, sir, with the cover broken, with your name ripped down inside of it. "'Twas that way she found out who you was. "'Oh, Adam!' I cried. "'Oh, Adam, now may God help me!' And dropping his hand, I turned— and ran until I reached the cottage. But it was empty. Charmian was gone. In a fever of haste I sought her along the brook, among the bushes and trees, even along the road, and as I sought night fell, and in the shadows was black despair. I searched the hollow from end to end, calling upon her name, but no sound reached me save the hoot of an owl and the far-off dismal cry of a corncrake. With some faint hope that she might have returned to the cottage I hastened thither, but finding it dark and desolate, I gave way to my despair. Oh, blind, self-deceiving fool! She had said that, and she was right, as usual. She had called me an egoist. I was an egoist, a pedant, a blind, self-deceiving fool, who had willfully destroyed all hopes of a happiness, the very thought of which had so often set me trembling. And now she had left me, was gone. The world, my world, was a void. Its emptiness terrified me. How could I live without Charmian, the woman whose image was ever before my eyes, whose soft low voice was ever in my ears? And I had thought so much to please her, I who had set my thoughts to guard my tongue, lest by word or look I might offend her, and this was the end of it. Sitting down at the table I leaned my head there, pressing my forehead against the hard wood, and remained thus a great while. At last, because it was very dark, I found and lighted a candle, and came and stood beside her bed. Very white and trim it looked, yet I was glad to see its smoothness rumpled where I had laid her down, and to see the depression in the pillow that her head had made. And while I stood there, up to me stole a perfume very faint, like the breath of violets in a wood at evening time, wherefore I sank down upon my knees beside the bed. And now the full knowledge of my madness rushed upon me in an overwhelming flood, but with misery was a great and mighty joy, for now I knew her worthy of all respect and honour and worship for her intellect, for her proud virtue, for her spotless purity. And thus with joy came remorse, and with remorse an abiding sorrow. And gradually my arms crept about the pillow where her head had so often rested, wherefore I kissed it, and laid my head upon it, and sighed, and so fell into a troubled sleep. End of In Which I Find Peace and Joy and an Abiding Sorrow Section 39 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 35. How Black George Found Prudence in the Dawn. The chill of dawn was in the air when I awoke, and it was some few moments before, with a rush, I remembered why I was kneeling there beside Charmian's bed. Shivering, I rose and walked up and down to reduce the stiffness in my limbs. The fire was out, and I had no mind to light it, for I was in no mood to break my fast, though the necessary things stood ready, as her orderly hands had set them, and the plates and cups and saucers twinkled at me from the little cupboard I had made to hold them, a cupboard whose construction she had overlooked with a critical eye. 
and I must needs remember how she had insisted on being permitted to drive in three nails with her own hand. I could put my finger on those very nails. How she had tapped at those nails for fear of missing them. How beautiful she had looked in her coarse apron, with her sleeves rolled up over her round white arms. How womanly and sweet! Yet I had dared to think, had dared to call her a Messalina. Oh, that my tongue had withered, or ever I had coupled one so pure and noble with a creature so base and common! So thinking, I sighed and went out into the dawn. As I closed the door behind me, its hollow slam struck me sharply, and I called to mind how she had called it a bad and ill-fitting door. And indeed, so it was. With dejected step and hanging head, I made my way toward Sissinghurst, for since I was up, I might as well work, and there was much to be done. And as I went, I heard a distant clock chime four. Now when I reached the village, the sun was beginning to rise, and thus lifting up my eyes, I beheld one standing before the bull, a very tall man, much bigger and greater than most, a wild figure in the dawn, with matted hair and beard, clad in tattered clothes. Yet hair and beard gleamed a red gold where the light touched them, and there was but one man I knew so tall and so mighty as this. Wherefore I hurried toward him all unnoticed, for his eyes were raised to a certain latticed casement of the inn. And being come up, I reached out and touched this man upon the arm. George, said I, and held out my hand. He turned swiftly, but seeing me, started back a pace, staring. "'George,' said I again, "'oh, George!' But George only backed still further, passing his hand once or twice across his eyes. "'Peter,' said he at last, speaking hardly above a whisper, "'but you am dead, Peter, dead. I killed thee. "'No,' I answered, "'you didn't kill me. "'George, indeed, I wish you had. "'You came pretty near it, but you didn't quite manage it. "'And, George, I'm very desolate. "'Won't you shake hands with a desolate man?' if you can, believing that I have always been your friend, and a true and loyal one, then give me your hand. If not, if you think me still the despicable traitor you once did, then let us go into the field yonder, and if you can manage to knock me on the head for good and all this time, why, so much the better. Come, what do you say? Without a word, Black George turned and led the way to a narrow lane a little distance beyond the bull, and from the lane into a meadow. Being come thither, I took off my coat and neckerchief, but this time I cast no look upon the world about me, and though indeed it was fair enough. But Black George stood half-turned from me, with his fists clenched and his broad shoulders heaving oddly. Peter, said he in his slow, heavy way, never clench your fist to me. I don't, I can't abide it. But, oh man, Peter, how may I clasp hands with a chap as I've tried to kill? I can't do it, Peter. But don't, don't clench your fists agin me no more. I were jealous of you from the first, you see. You beat me at thammer throwin', and she took your part agin me, and, and then you be so taken in your ways, and I be so big and clumsy, so very slow and heavy. There beat no chance betwixt us for a maid like Prue. She always was different from the likes of me, and any lass with half an eye could see you as be a, a gentleman. Ah, and a good un, and so, Peter, and so. I be going away, a soldier, perhaps. I shan't love the dear lass quite so much after her a bit, perhaps. It won't be so sharp-like, arter a bit. But what's to be is to be. I've learned wisdom, and you and she was made for each other, and meant for each other from the first. So don't go to clench your fist again me no more, Peter. Never again, George, said I. Unless, he continued, as though struck by a bright idea, unless you are minded to have a whack at me. If so be, why, well, take it, Peter, and welcome. You see, I tried so hard to kill ye, so cruel hard, Peter, and I thought I had. I thought twere for that as they took me, and so I broke my way out of the lock-up, and come to say good-bye to Prue's winder, and then I were going back to give myself up and let em hang me if they wanted to. Were you, George? Yes. Here George turned to look at me, and looking, drooped his eyes, and fumbled with his hands, while up under his tanned skin there crept a painful burning crimson. Peter, said he, yes, George, I got some at more to tell thee, some it as I never meant to tell a soul, when you was down, lying at my feet. Yes, George, I, I kicked thee once. Did you, George? I, I were mad, mad with rage and bloodlust. Oh, man, Peter, I kicked thee. Veer, said he, straightening his shoulders. Leastwise, I can look ye in the eye. Now that be off my mind. And now, if so be you am wishful to tack your whack at me, let it be a good un, Peter. 
No, I shall never raise my hand to you again, George. Tis likely you be thinking me a poor sort of man, arter what, what I just told ye. A coward? I think you're more of a man than ever, said I. Why, then, Peter, if you do that, here's my hand, if you'll take it, I bid you good-bye. I'll take your hand, and gladly, George, but not to wish you good-bye. It shall be rather to bid you welcome home again. No, he cried, no, I couldn't. I couldn't abide to see you and Prue married, Peter. No, I couldn't abide it. And you never will, George. Prue loves a stronger, a better man than I, and she has wept over him, George, and prayed over him, such tears and prayers as surely might win the blackest soul to heaven, and has said that she would marry that man. Ah, even if he came back with fetter marks upon him, even then she would marry him if he would only ask her. Oh, Peter, cried George, seizing my shoulders in a mighty grip, and looking into my eyes with tears in his own. Oh, man, Peter, you has knocked me down, and as I love for it, be this true? It is God's truth, said I, and look, there's a sign to prove I'm no liar. Look, and I pointed toward the bull. George turned, and I felt his fingers tighten suddenly, for there, in the open doorway of the inn, with the early glory of the morning all about her, stood Prue. As we watched, she began to cross the road toward the smithy, with laggard step and drooping head. "'Do you know where she's going, George? I can tell you. She's going to your smithy to pray for you. Do you hear? To pray for you. Come!' And I seized his arm. "'No, Peter, no! I durstn't. I couldn't!' But he suffered me to lead him forward nevertheless. Once he stopped and glanced round, but the village was asleep about us. So we presently came to the open door of the forge. And behold! Prue was kneeling before the anvil, with her face hidden in her arms and her slender body swaying slightly, but all at once, as if she felt him near her, she raised her head and saw him, and sprang to her feet with a glad cry, and as she stood George went to her and knelt at her feet, and raising the hem of her gown stooped and kissed it. "'Oh, my sweet maid,' said he, "'oh, my sweet Prue, I bain't worthy, I bain't,' but she caught the great shaggy head to her bosom and stifled it there and in her face was a radiance, a happiness beyond words, and the man's strong arms clung close about her. So I turned, and left them in paradise together. CHAPTER Thirty Six, WHICH SYMPATHIZES WITH A BRASS JACK, A BRACE OF CUTLASSES, AND DIVERSE POTS AND PANS. I found the ancient sunning himself in the porch before the inn as he waited for his breakfast. Peter, says he, I be turble cold sometimes. It comes a creepin' on me all at once, even if I'd be sittin' before a roarin' fire or a baskin' in this good warm sun. A cold as reaches down to me poor old art. Grave chills, I calls em, Peter. Ah, grave chills. Catches me by the art they do. You see, I be that old, Peter, that old and wore out. But you're a wonderful man for your age, said I, clasping the shriveled hand in mine, and very lusty and strong. So strong as a bull I be, Peter, he nodded readily, but then even a bull gets old and wore out and these grave chills catches me oftener and oftener. Tis like as if the angel of death reached out and touched me, just touched me with his finger soft-like, as much to say, Here be a poor old wore-out creeter, as I shall be wantin' soon. Well, I'll be ready. Tis only the young or the fool who fears to die. Three score years and ten, says the Bible, and I be years and years older than that. Oh, I shan't be afeard to answer when I'm called, Peter. Here I be, Lord, I'll say, here I be, thy poor old servant. But, oh, Peter, if I could be sure that dear roll rusty staple being took first, why, then I'd go joyful, joyful. But, why, there be that old fool Amos. Lord, what a daughter an old fool he be, and there be Job and Dutton. They be coming to plague me, Peter, I can feel it in me bones. Just reach me my snuff-box out of my iron pocket, and you shall see me smite the Amalekites hip and thigh. Gaffer, began old Amos, saluting with his usual grin as he came up, we be wishful to wax a question. We be wishful to know where be Black Jarge, which you haven't gone to fetch him, and bring him home again, them was you words. Ah, nodded Job, them was your very words. Bring him home again, says you. But you didn't bring him home, continued old Amos, leastwise not in the cart with you, Dutton here. James Dutton, see you come driving home. But he didn't see no Jarge along with you. No, not so much as you could shake a stick at, you might say. Speak up, James Dutton, that you was a-leaning over your front gate as Gaffer came driving home, wasn't you? And you see Gaffer plain as plain, didn't you? 
"'Which me wisha, no offence, and no one objectin' I did,' began the apology, perspiring profusely as usual, "'but I takes the liberty to say as it were a spade, and not a gate, leastways—' "'But you didn't see no sign of Jarge, did you?' demanded old Amos. "'As you might say, neither I nor air of him. Speak up, James Dutton!' "'Which, since you axes me, I makes so bold as to answer, and very glad, I'm sure, no, though as to I nor air, I aren't wishing to swear to, me not being near enough, which could only be expected, and very much obliged, I'm sure. You see, Gaffer, pursued Amos, if you didn't bring Jarge back with you, which you said you would, the question we axes is, where be Jarge? Ah, where? nodded Job gloomily. Here the ancient was evidently at a loss, to cover which he took a vast pinch of snuff. I'll be we know as he bean't pining away in a dungeon cell, irons on his legs, strapped in a straight jacket, and old Amos stopped, open mouthed and staring, for out from the gloom of the smithy issued Black Jarge himself, with Prue upon his arm. The ancient stared also, but dissembling his vast surprise, he dealt the lid of his snuff box two loud triumphant knocks. Peter, said he, rising stiffly, Peter, lad, I were beginning to think as Jarge were never coming in to breakfast at all. I've waited and waited till I be so ravenous as a lion and tiger. But here he be at last, Peter, here he be. So let's go in and eat some it. Saying which, he turned his back upon his discomfited tormentors, and led me into the kitchen of the inn. And there were the white-capped maids, setting forth such a breakfast as only such a kitchen could produce. And presently there was Prue herself, with George hanging back, something shamefaced, till the ancient had hobbled forward to give him welcome. And there was honest Simon, all wonderment and hearty greeting. And last, but by no means least, there were the battered cutlasses, the brass jack, and the glittering pots and pans, glittering and gleaming and twinkling a greeting likewise, and with all their might. Ah! but they little guessed why Prue's eyes were so shy and sweet, or why the color came and went in her pretty cheeks. Little they guessed why this gold-haired giant trod so lightly, and held his tall head so very high. Little they dreamed of the situation as yet. Had they done so, surely they must, one and all, have fallen upon that curly golden head, and buried it beneath their gleaming, glittering, twinkling jealousy. And what a meal was that! With those deft, white-capped maids, to wait upon our wants, and with prudence hovering here and there, to see that all were duly served, and refusing to sit down until George's great arm, a very gentle arm for one so strong and big, drew her down beside him. Guess truly what a meal that was, and how the ancient chuckled and dug me with one bony elbow, and George with the other, and chuckled again till he choked and choked, till he gasped and gasped, till he had us all on our feet, and then demanded indignantly why we couldn't let him enjoy himself in peace. And now, when the meal was nearly over, he suddenly took it into his head that Prue didn't love George as she should, and as he deserved to be, and nothing would content him but that she must kiss him then and there, and not on the forehead, mind nor on the cheek, but on the place as God made for it, the mouth, my lass. And now, who so shy and blushing as Prue, and who so nervous for her sake as Black George, very evidently clasping her hand under the table, and bidding her never mind, as he was content and never to put herself out over such as him. Whereupon Mistress Prue must needs turn, and taking his head between her hands, kissed him, not once, or twice, but three times, and upon, the place God made for it, the mouth. O oh, gleaming cutlasses, O oh, great brass jack and glittering pots and pans, can ye any longer gleam and glitter and twinkle in doubt? Alas, I trow not. Therefore it is only natural and to be expected that beneath your outward polish lurk black and bitter feelings against this curly-headed giant, and a bloodthirsty desire for vengeance. If so, then one and all of you have, at least, the good feeling not to show it, a behavior worthy of gentlemen. What do I say? Of gentlemen? Fie! rather let it be said, of pots and pans. End of Which Sympathizes with a Brass Jack, a Brace of Cutlasses, and Diverse Pots and Pans. Forty of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. THE BROAD HIGHWAY by Geoffrey Farnall CHAPTER Thirty Seven: THE PREACHER It is a wise, and to some extent a true saying, that hard work is an antidote to sorrow, a panacea for all trouble. 
but when the labor is over and done when the tools are set by and the weary worker goes forth into the quiet evening how then for we cannot always work and sooner or later comes the still hour when memory rushes in upon us again and sorrow and remorse sit dark and gloomy on either hand a week dragged by a season of alternate hope and black despair a restless fever of nights and days for with each dawn came hope that lived a while beside me only to fly away with the sun and leave me to despair. I hungered for the sound of Charmian's voice, for the quick light fall of her foot, for the least touch of her hand. I became more and more possessed of a morbid fancy that she might be existing nearby, could I but find her, that she had passed along the road only a little while before me, or at this very moment might be approaching, might be within sight, were I but quick enough. Often at such times I would fling down my hammer or tongs, to George's surprise, and hurry to the door, stare up and down the road, or pause in my hammer strokes, fiercely bidding George to do the same, fancying I heard her voice calling to me from a distance. And George would watch me with a troubled brow, but with rare delicacy, said no word. Indeed, the thought of Charmian was with me everywhere. The ringing hammers mocked me with her praises, the bellows sang of her beauty, the trees whispered Charmian, Charmian, and Charmian was in the very air. But when I had reluctantly bidden George good night and set out along the lanes full of the fragrant dusk of evening, when, reaching the hollow, I followed that leafy path beside the brook which she and I had so often trodden together, when I sat in my gloomy disordered cottage with the deep silence unbroken save for the plaintive murmur of the brook, then indeed my loneliness was well nigh more than I could bear. There were dark hours when the cottage rang with strange sounds, when I would lie face down upon the floor, clutching my throbbing temples between my palms, fearful of myself and dreading the oncoming horror of madness. It was at this time, too, that I began to be haunted by the thing above the door, the rusty staple upon which a man had choked out his wretched life sixty and six years ago, a wanderer, a lonely man, perhaps acquainted with misery or haunted by remorse one who had suffered much and long, even as I, but who had eventually escaped it all, even as I might do. Thus I would sit, chin in hand, staring up at this staple, until the light failed, and sometimes in the dead of night I would steal softly there to touch it with my finger. Looking back on all this, it seems that I came very near to losing my reason, for I had then by no means recovered from Black George's fist, and indeed, even now, I am at times not wholly free from its effect. My sleep, too, was often broken and troubled with wild dreams, so that bed became a place of horror, and, rising, I would sit before the empty hearth, a candle guttering at my elbow, and think of Charmian, until I would fancy I heard the rustle of her garments behind me, and start up, trembling and breathless. At such times the tap of a blown leaf against the lattice would fill me with a fever of hope and expectation. Often and often her soft laugh stole to me in the gurgle of the brook, and she would call to me in the deep night silences, in a voice very sweet and faint and far away. Then I would plunge out into the dark and lift my hands to the stars that winked upon my agony and journey on through a desolate world to return with the dawn, weary and despondent. It was after one of these wild night expeditions that I sat beneath a tree watching the sunrise, and yet I think I must have dozed for I was startled by a voice close above me, and glancing up I recognized the little preacher. As our eyes met he immediately took the pipe from his lips and made as though to cram it into his pocket. Though indeed it is empty, he explained as though I had spoken, old habits cling to one, young sir, and my pipe here has been the friend of my solitude these many years. I cannot bear to turn my back upon it yet, so I carry it with me still, and sometimes when at all thoughtful I find it between my lips. But though the flesh, as you see, is very weak, I hope in time to forego even this. And he sighed, shaking his head in gentle deprecation of himself. But you look pale. Haggard, he went on. You are ill, young sir. No, no, said I, springing to my feet. Look at this arm. Is it the arm of a sick man? No, no, I am well enough. But what of him we found in the ditch, you and I, the miserable creature who lay bubbling in the grass? He has been very near death, sir. Indeed, his days are numbered, I think. Yet he is better for the time being, and last night declared his intention of leaving the shelter of my humble roof and setting forth upon his mission. His mission, sir? He speaks of himself as one chosen by God to work his will, and asks but to live until this mission, whatever it is, be accomplished. 
a strange being said the little preacher puffing at his empty pipe again as we walked on side by side a dark incomprehensible man and a very very wretched one poor soul wretched said i is that not our human lot man is born to sorrow as the sparks fly upward and job was accounted wise in his generation that was a cry from the depths of despond but job stood at last upon the heights and felt once more god's blessed son and rejoiced even as we should but as regards this stranger he is one who would seem to have suffered some great wrong the continued thought of which has unhinged his mind his heart seems broken dead i have sitting beside his delirious couch heard him babble a terrible indictment against some man i've also heard him pray and his prayers have been all for vengeance poor fellow said i it were better we had left him to die in his ditch for if death does not bring oblivion it may bring a change of scene sir said the preacher laying his hand upon my arm such bitterness in one so young is unnatural you are in some trouble i would that i might aid you be your friend know you better oh sir that is easily done i am a blacksmith hard-working sober and useful to my fellows they call me peter smith a certain time since i was a useless dreamer spending more money in a week than i now earn in a year and getting very little for it i was studious egotistical and pedantic wasting my time upon impossible translations that nobody wanted and they knew me as peter vibart vibart exclaimed the preacher starting and looking up at me vibart i nodded related in any way to sir maurice vibart his cousin sir my companion appeared lost in thought, for he was puffing at his empty pipe again. "'Do you happen to know Sir Maurice?' I inquired. "'No,' returned the preacher. "'No, sir, but I have heard mention of him, and lately, though just when or where I cannot for the life of me recall.' "'Why, the name is familiar to a great many people,' said I. "'You see, he is rather a famous character in his way.' Talking thus, we presently reached a stile, beyond which the footpath led away through swaying corn and by shady hop-garden to Sissinghurst village. Here the preacher stopped and gave me his hand, but I noticed he still puffed at his pipe. "'And you are now a blacksmith? And mightily content so to be. You are a most strange young man,' said the preacher, shaking his head. "'Many people have told me the same, sir,' said I, and vaulted over the stile. Yet, turning back when I had gone some way, I saw him leaning where I had left him, and with his pipe still in his mouth. End of The Preacher Section 41 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 38. In which I meet my cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart. As I approached the smithy, late though the hour was, and George made it a rule to have the fire going by six every morning, no sound of hammer reached me, and coming into the place I found it empty that i remembered that to-day george was to drive over to tonbridge with prudence and the ancient to invest in certain household necessities for in a month's time they were to be married hereupon i must needs contrast george's happy future with my dreary one and fall bitterly to cursing myself and sitting on the ancient's stool in the corner i covered my face and my thoughts were very black now presently as i sat thus i became conscious of a very delicate perfume in the air and also that some one had entered quietly my breath caught in my throat, but I did not at once look up, fearing to dispel the hope that tingled within me. So I remained with my face still covered, until something touched me, and I saw that it was the gold-mounted handle of a whip, wherefore I raised my head suddenly and glanced up. Then I beheld a radiant vision in polished riding-boots and speckless moleskins, in handsome flowered waistcoat and perfect-fitting coat, with snowy frills at throat and wrists a tall gallant figure of a graceful easy bearing who stood a picture of cool gentlemanly insolence tapping his boot lightly with his whip but as his eye met mine the tapping whip grew suddenly still his languid expression vanished and he came a quick step nearer and bent his face nearer my own a dark face handsome in its way pale and aquiline with a powerful jaw and dominating eyes and mouth a face nay a mask rather that smiled and smiled but never showed the man beneath. Now glancing up at his brow I saw there a small newly healed scar. "'Is it possible?' said he, speaking in that softly modulated voice I remembered to have heard once before. 
can it be possible that I address my worthy cousin? That shirt, that utterly impossible coat and belcher, and yet the likeness is remarkable. Have I the honour to address Mr. Peter Vibart, late of Oxford? The same, sir, I answered, rising. Then, most worthy cousin, I salute you, and he removed his hat, bowing with an ironic grace. Believe me, I have frequently desired to see that paragon of all the virtues, whose dutiful respect a revered uncle rewarded with the proverbial shilling. Egad, he went on, examining me through his glass, with a great show of interest. Had you been any other than the same virtuous cousin Peter, whose graces and perfections were forever being thrown at my head, I could have sympathized with you positively if only on account of that most obnoxious coat and belcher, and the grime and sootiness of things in general. Puff! he exclaimed, pressing his perfumed handkerchief to his nostrils. Phew! How damnably sulphur and brimstony you do keep yourself, cousin! Oh, gad! You would certainly find it much clearer outside, said I, beginning to blow up the fire. But then, cousin Peter, outside one must become a target for the yokel eye, and I detest being stared at by the uneducated, who naturally lack appreciation. On the whole I prefer the smoke, though it chokes one most infernally. Where may one venture to sit here? I tendered him the stool, but he shook his head, and crossing to the anvil, flicked it daintily with his handkerchief, and sat down, dangling his leg. "'Pon my soul,' said he, eyeing me languidly through his glass again, "'pon my soul, you are damnably like me, you know, in features. Damnably, I nodded. He glanced at me sharply and laughed. My man, a creature of the name of Parks, said he, swinging his spurred boot to and fro, led me to suppose that I should meet a person here, a blacksmith fellow. Your man, Parks, informed you correctly, I nodded. What can I do for you? The devil! exclaimed Sir Maurice, shaking his head. But no, you are as I gather somewhat eccentric, but even you would never take such a desperate step as to—to—' to "'Become a blacksmith fellow?' I put in. "'Precisely!' Alas, Sir Maurice, I blush to say that rather than become an unprincipled adventurer, living on my wits, or a mean-spirited hanger-on, fawning upon acquaintances for a livelihood, or doing anything rather than soil my hands with honest toil, I became a blacksmith fellow some four or five months ago. Really, it is most distressing to observe to what depths virtue may drag a man. You are a very monster of probity and rectitude, exclaimed Sir Maurice. Indeed, I am astonished. You manifest not only shocking bad judgment, but a most deplorable lack of thought. Virtue is damnably selfish as a rule. Really, it is quite disconcerting to find oneself first cousin to a blacksmith. Fellow, I added. Fellow, nodded Sir Maurice. Oh, the devil! to think of my worthy cousin reduced to the necessity of laboring with hammer and saw. Not a saw, I put in. We will say chisel, then. A vibart with a hammer and chisel. Deuce take me! Most distressing. And you will pardon my saying so. You do not seem to thrive on hammers and chisels. No one could say you looked blooming, or even flourishing, like the young bay tree, which is, I fancy, an eastern expression. Sir, said I, may I remind you that I have work to do? A deuced interesting place, though, this, he smiled, staring round imperturbably through his glass. So, er, so devilishly grimy and smutty and gritty. Quite a number of horseshoes, too. Do you know, cousin, I've never before remarked what a number of holes there are in a horseshoe. But live and learn. Here he paused to inhale a pinch of snuff, very daintily, from a jeweled box. It is a strange thing, he pursued, as he dusted his fingers on his handkerchief, a very strange thing, that being cousins, we have never met till now, especially as I have heard so very much about you. Pray, said I, pray, how should you hear about one so very insignificant as myself? Oh, I have heard of good cousin Peter since I was an imp of a boy, he smiled. Cousin Peter was my chart whereby to steer through the shoals of boyish mischief into the haven of our Uncle George's good graces. Oh, I have heard over much of you, cousin, from dear, kind, well-meaning relatives and friends, damn them. They rang your praises in my ears morning, noon, and night. And why? Simply that I might come to surpass you in virtue, learning, wit, and appearance, and so win our Uncle George's regard, and incidentally his legacy. 
but I was a young demon, romping with the grooms in the stable, while you were a young angel in nankings, passing studious hours with your books. When I was a scapegrace of Harrow, you were winning gold opinions at Eton. When you were honours man at Oxford, I was rusticating at Cambridge. Naturally enough, perhaps, I grew sick of the name Peter, and indeed it smacks damnably of fish, don't you think? You, or your name, crossed me at every turn. If it wasn't for Cousin Peter, I was heir to ten thousand a year. But good Cousin Peter was so fond of Uncle George, and Uncle George was so fond of good Cousin Peter, that Maurice might go hang for a graceless dog and be damned to him. You have my deepest sympathy and apologies, said I. Still, I have sometimes been curious to meet worthy Cousin Peter, and it's rather surprising that I've never done so. On the contrary, I began, but his laugh stopped me. Ah, to be sure, he nodded, our ways have lain widely separated hitherto. You, a scholar, treading the difficult path of learning, I, oh, egad, a terrible fellow, a mauvais sujet, a sad dog. But after all, cousin, when one comes to look at you to-day, you might stand for a terrible example of virtue run riot, a distressing spectacle of dutiful respect and good precedent cut off with a shilling. Really, it is horrifying to observe to what depths virtue may plunge an otherwise well-balanced individual. Little dreamed those dear, kind, well-meaning relatives and friends, damn them, that while the willful Maurice lived on, continually getting into hot water and out again, up to his eyes in debt, and pretty well esteemed, the virtuous pattern Peter would descend to a hammer and saw, I should say chisel, in a very grimy place, where he is, it seems, the presiding genius. Indeed, this first meeting of ours under these circumstances is somewhat dramatic, as it should be. And yet we have met before, said I, and the circumstances were then even more dramatic, perhaps. We met in a tempest, sir. Ha! he exclaimed, dwelling on the word and speaking very slowly. A tempest, cousin. There was much wind and rain, and it was very dark. Dark, cousin? But I saw your face very plainly as you lay on your back, sir, by the aid of a postilion's lanthorn. It was greatly struck by our mutual resemblance. Sir Maurice raised his glass and looked at me, and as he looked, smiled, but he could not hide the sudden passionate quiver of his thin nostrils, or the gleam of the eyes beneath their languid lids. He rose slowly and paced to the door. When he came back again he was laughing softly, but still he could not hide the quiver of his nostrils, or the gleam of the eyes beneath their languid lids. So it was you, he murmured, with a pause between the words. Oh, was ever so damnably contrary, to think that I should hunt her into your very arms, to think that of all men in the world it should be you to play the squire of dames. And he laughed again, but as he did so, the stout riding-whip snapped in his hands like a straw. He glanced down at the broken pieces, and then from them to me. You see, I'm rather strong in the hands, cousin, said he, shaking his head, but I was not quite strong enough last time we met though to be sure, as you say, it was very dark. Had I known it was worthy Cousin Peter's throat I grasped, I think I might have squeezed just a little tighter. Sir, said I, shaking my head, I really don't think you could have done it. Yes, he sighed, tossing his broken whip into a corner. Yes, I think so. You see, I mistook you for merely an interfering country bumpkin. Yes, I nodded while I, on the other hand, took you for a fine gentleman, nobly intent on the ruin of an unfortunate, friendless girl, whose poverty would seem to make her an easy victim, in which it appears you were as much mistaken as I, Cousin Peter. Here he glanced at me with a sudden keenness. Indeed. Why, surely, said he, surely you must know. He paused to flick a speck of soot from his knee, and then continued. Did she tell you nothing of herself? Very little beside her name. Ah, she told you her name, then. Yes, she told me her name. Well, cousin. Well, sir. We had both risen, and now fronted each other across the anvil, Sir Maurice, debonair and smiling, while I stood frowning and gloomy. Come, said I at last, let us understand each other once for all. You tell me that you have always looked upon me as your rival for our uncle's good graces. I never was. You have deceived yourself into believing that, because I was his ward, and that alone augmented my chances of becoming the heir. It never did. He saw me as seldom as possible, and if he ever troubled his head about either of us, it would have seemed that he favored you. I tell you, I never was your rival in the past, and never shall be in the future. Meaning, cousin? Meaning, sir, in regard to either the legacy or the Lady Sophia Sefton. 
I was never fond enough of money to marry for it. I have never seen this lady, nor do I propose to thus. So as far as I'm concerned, you are free to win her and the fortune as soon as you will. I, as you see, prefer horseshoes. And what, said Sir Maurice, flicking a speck of soot from his cuff, and immediately looking me again, what of Charmian? I don't know, I answered, nor should I be likely to tell you, if I did. Wherever she may be, she is safe, I trust, beyond your reach. No, he broke in, she will never be beyond my reach until she is dead, or I am, perhaps not even then, and I shall find her again, sooner or later, depend upon it. Yes, you may depend upon that. Cousin Maurice, said I, reaching out my hand to him, wherever she may be, she is alone and unprotected, pursue her no farther. Go back to London, marry your Lady Sefton, inherit your fortune, but leave Charmian Brown in peace. And pray, said he, frowning suddenly, whence this solicitude de on her behalf? What is she to you, this Charmian Brown? Nothing, I answered hurriedly, nothing at all, God knows, nor ever can be. Sir Maurice suddenly leaned forward, and catching me by the shoulder, peered into my face. By heaven, he exclaimed, the fellow actually loves her. Well, said I, meeting his look, why not? Yes, I love her. A very fury of rage seemed suddenly to possess him. The languid, smiling gentleman became a devil with vicious eyes and evil, snarling mouth, whose fingers sank into my flesh as he swung me back and forth in a powerful grip. "'You love her? You? You?' he panted. "'Yes,' I answered, flinging him off so that he staggered. "'Yes, yes, I, who fought for her once and am willing, most willing, to do so again, now or at any other time. For though I hold no hope of winning her, ever, Yet I can serve her still, and protect her from the pollution of your presence. And I clenched my fists. He stood poised as though about to spring at me, and I saw his knuckles gleam whiter than the laces above them. But all at once he laughed lightly, easily as ever. A very perfect gentle knight, he murmured, sans peur et sans reproche, though somewhat grimy and in a leather apron. Chivalry, kneeling amid hammers and horseshoes, worshipping her with a reverence distant and lowly. How like you, worthy cousin, how very like you, and how very affecting! But, and here his nostrils quivered again, but I tell you, she is mine. Mine, and always has been, and no man living shall come between us. No, by God! That, said I, that remains to be seen. Ha! Though indeed I think she is safe from you while I live. But then, cousin Peter, life is a very uncertain thing. At best, he returned, glancing at me beneath his drooping lids. Yes, I nodded. It is sometimes a blessing to remember that. Sir Maurice strolled to the door, and being there, paused, and looked back over his shoulder. I go to find Charmian, said he, and I shall find her, sooner or later, and when I do, should you take it upon yourself to come between us again, or presume to interfere again, I shall kill you, worthy cousin without the least compunction, if you think this sufficient warning, act upon it. If not, he shrugged his shoulders significantly, farewell, good and worthy cousin Peter, farewell, or shall we say au revoir? End of In Which I Meet My Cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart Section 42 of The Broad Highway this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 39. How I Went Down Into the Shadows. Peter, said George one evening, turning to me with troubled look I'd seen so often on his face of late, what be wrong with you, my chap? You be growing paler every day. Oh, Peter, you be like a man as is dying by inches, if tis any o' my doin'. Nonsense, George, I broke in, with sudden asperity. I am well enough. Yet I've seen your hands fall a-trembling sometimes, Peter, all at once. And you missed your stroke yesterday. Come square down on the anvil. You can't have forgot. I remember, I muttered, I remember. And twice again to-day. And you be silent, Peter, and don't seem to hear when spoken to, and short in your temper. Oh, you bean't the man you was. I've seen it a-coming on you more and more. Oh, man, Peter, he cried, turning his back on me suddenly. You as I'd let walk over me. You as I'd be cut in pieces for. If it be me as done it. No, no, George, it wasn't you. Of course not. 
If I'm a little strange, it's probably due to lack of sleep, nothing more. You see, Peter, I tried so hard to kill you, and you said yourself as I come nigh doing it. But then you didn't quite manage it, I cried harshly. Would to God you had. As it is, I'm alive, and there's an end of it. Twere a woundy blow I give you the last one. I never forget the look on your face as you went down. Oh, Peter, you've never been the same since. It be all my doing. I know it, I know it and sinking upon the ancient's stool in the corner, Black George covered his face. "'Never think of it, George,' I said, laying my arm across his heaving shoulders. "'That's all over and done with, dear fellow, and I would not have it otherwise, since it gained me your friendship. I am all right, well and strong. It's only sleep that I need, George, only sleep.' Upon the still evening air rose the sharp tap-tap of the ancient's stick, whereat up started the smith, and coming to the forge began raking out the fire, with great dust and clatter, as the old man hobbled up, saluting us cheerily as he came. "'Lord!' he exclaimed, pausing in the doorway to lean upon his stick, and glance from one to the other of us with his quick, bright eyes. "'Lord, there be it! Two other such fine, upstanding, lively-looking chaps, in all the South Country, as you two chaps be! No, nor such smiths!' It do warm my old heart to look at ye. Puts me in a mind o' what I were myself ages and ages ago. I weren't quite so tall as George, perhaps, by about say a half inch, but then I were wider, wider a uh, sight wider in the shoulder, and so strong as four bulls, and with eyes big and sharp and piercing like Peter's. Only Peter's beyond quite so sharp, no nor yet so piercing, and that minds me as I've got news for ye, Peter. What news? said I, turning. Surprising news it be, ah, and astonishing too. But first of all, Peter, I wants to ax you a question. What is it, Ancient? Why, it be this, Peter, said the old man, hobbling nearer and peering up into my face. Ever since the time as I went and found you, I've thought as there was somewhat strange about ye. What with your soft voice and gentle ways, and it came to me all at once, about three o'clock this afternoon, as you might be a duke in disguise, Peter. Yes or nay, Peter and he fixed me with his eye. No, ancient, I answered, smiling. I am no duke. Ah, well, an earl, then. Nor an earl. A baronet, perhaps. No, not even a baronet. Ah, said the old man, eyeing me doubtfully. I've often thought as you might be one or two others, of em especially since about three o'clock this afternoon. Why so? Well, that's the point. That's the very news I got to tell ye, chuckled the ancient, as he seated himself in the corner. You must know, then, he began, with an impressive rap on the lid of his snuff-box, about three o'clock, sarter noon, I was sitting on the stile by Simon's five-acre field, when along the road comes a lady, handsome and proud-looking, and as fine as fine could be, a riding of a horse, and with a servant riding another horse behind her. As she comes up, she gives me a look, out o'er her eyes. Soft they was, and dark, and up I gets to touch me at. All at once she smiles at me, and her smile were as sweet and gentle as her eyes, and she pulls up her horse. Why, you must be the ancient, says she. Why, so Peter calls me, my lady, says I. And now is Peter, she says. Quick like, how is Peter, says she. Fine and hearty, says I. Eats well, sleeps sound, says I. His arms is strong, his legs is strong, and he ain't afeard of nobody, like a young lion be Peter, says I. Now, while I'm a-sayin' this, she looks at me, soft and thoughtful-like, and takes out a little book, and begins to write in it, a-wrinklin' her pretty black brows over it, and shakin' her head to herself. Presently, she tears out what she's been a-writin', and gives it to me. "'Will you give this to Peter for me?' says she. "'That I will, my lady,' says I. "'Thank ye,' says she, smiling again, and holdin' out her white hand to me, which I kisses. "'Indeed,' says she, "'I understand now why Peter's so fond of you. I think I could be very fond of you, too.' says she. And so she turns her horse, and the servant he turns his, and off they go. And here, Peter, here be the letter. Saying which, the ancient took a slip of paper from the cavernous interior of his hat, and tendered it to me. With my head in a whirl, I crossed to the door and leaned there a while, staring sightlessly out into the summer evening, for it seemed that in this little slip of paper lay that which meant life or death to me. So for a long minute I leaned there, fearing to learn my fate. Then I opened the little folded square of paper, and holding it before my eyes, read, Charmian Brown presents, this scratched out, While you busied yourself forging horseshoes, your cousin Sir Maurice sought and found me. I do not love him, but Charmian. Farewell. This also scored out. 
Again I stared before me with unseeing eyes, but my hands no longer trembled, nor did I fear any more. The prisoner had received his sentence, and suspense was at an end. And all at once I laughed, and tore the paper across, and laughed and laughed till George and the Ancient came to stare at me. "'Don't he!' cried the old man. "'Don't he, Peter! You be like a corp laughing, don't he!' But the laugh still shook me, while I tore and tore at the paper, and so let the pieces drop and flutter from my fingers. "'There,' said I, "'there goes a fool's dream. See how it scatters, a little here, a little there. So long as this world lasts, these pieces shall never come together again.' So saying, I set off along the road, looking neither to right nor left. But when I had gone some distance, I found that George walked beside me, and he was very silent as he walked, and I saw the trouble was back in his eyes again. "'George,' said I, stopping, "'why do you follow me?' "'I don't follow you, Peter,' he answered. "'I be only wishful to walk with you a ways. I'm in no mood for company, George.' "'Well, I be in company, Peter. Your friend I be,' he said doggedly, and without looking at me. "'Yes,' said I. "'Yes, my good and trusty friend.' "'Peter,' he cried suddenly, laying his hand upon my shoulder, "'don't go back to that dear ghastly holler to-night. "'It's the only place in the world for me to-night, George.' And so we went on again, side by side, through the evening, and spoke no more until we had come to the parting of the ways. Down in the hollow the shadows lay black and heavy, and I saw George shiver as he looked. "'Good-bye,' said I, clasping his hand. "'Good-bye, George.' "'Why do we say good-bye?' "'Because I'm going away.' "'Going away, Peter, but where?' "'God knows,' I answered. But wherever it be, I shall carry with me the memory of your kind, true heart, and you, I think, will remember me. It is a blessed thing, George, to know that, how so far we go, a friend's kind thoughts journey on with us, untiring to the end. Oh, Peter, man, don't go for to leave me. To part is our human lot, George, and as well now as later. Good-bye. No, no, he cried, throwing his arm about me. Not down there. It be so deadly and lonely down there in the darkness. Come back with me, just for to-night but I broke from his detaining hand and plunged on down into the shadows. And presently, turning my head, I saw him yet standing where I had left him, looming gigantic upon the sky behind, and with his head sunk upon his breast. Being now come at last to the cottage, I paused, and from that place of shadows I lifted my gaze to the luminous heaven, where were a myriad eyes that seemed to watch me with a new meaning to-night, wherefore I entered the cottage hastily, and closing the door, barred it behind me. Then I turned to peer up at that which showed above the door, the rusty staple upon which a man had choked his life out sixty and six years ago, and I began very slowly to loosen the belcher neckerchief about my throat. "'Peter!' cried a voice. "'Peter!' and a hand was beating upon the door. CHAPTER Forty: HOW IN PLACE OF DEATH I FOUND THE FULLNESS OF LIFE she came in swiftly, closing the door behind her, found and lighted a candle, and setting it upon the table between us, put back the hood of her cloak and looked at me, while I stood mute before her, abashed by the accusation of her eyes. Coward, she said, and with the word snatched the neckerchief from my grasp, and casting it upon the floor, set her foot upon it. Coward, said she again. Yes, I muttered. Yes, I was lost, in a great darkness and full of horror of coming rites and days, and so I would have run away from it all like a coward. Oh, hateful, hateful, she cried, and covered her face as from some horror. Indeed, you cannot despise me more than I do myself, said I, now or ever. I am a failure in all things, except perhaps the making of horseshoes, and this world has no place for failures. And as for horseshoes, fool, she whispered, oh, fool that I dreamed so wise, oh, coward that seemed so brave and strong, oh, man that was so gloriously young and unspoiled, that it should end here, that it should come to this. And though she kept her face hidden, I knew that she was weeping. A woman's love transforms the man till she sees him, not as he is, but as her heart would have him be. The dross becomes pure gold, and she believes, and believes, until one day her heart breaks. Charmian, what, what do you mean? Oh, are you still so blind? Must I tell you? She cried, lifting her head proudly. Why did I live beside you here in the wilderness? Why did I work for you, contrive for you, and seek to make this desolation a home for you? Often my heart cried out its secret to you, but you never heard. Often it trembled in my voice, looked at you from my eyes, but you never guessed. Oh, blind, blind! And you drove me from you with shameful words, but, oh, I came back to you, and now I know you, for but common clay after all, and even yet, she stopped suddenly, and once more hid her face from me in her hands. 
"'And even yet, Charmian?' I whispered. Very still she stood, with her face bowed upon her hands, but she could not hide from me the swift rise and fall of her bosom. "'Speak, O oh Charmian, speak! I am so weak, so weak,' she whispered. "'I hate myself.' "'Charmian!' I cried. "'Oh, Charmian!' and seized her hands. Despite her resistance, drew her into my arms, and, clasping her close, forced her to look at me. And even yet, what more? What more, tell me? But lying back across my arm, she held me off with both hands. Don't, she cried. Don't, you shame me. Let me go. God knows I am all unworthy, Charmian, and so low in my abasement that to touch you is presumption. But, oh, woman whom I have loved from the first, and shall to the end, have you stooped in your infinite mercy to lift me from these depths? Is it a new life you offer me? Was it for this you came to-night? Let me go! Oh, Peter, let me go! Why? Why did you come? Loose me! Why did you come? To meet Sir Maurice Vibart! To meet Sir Maurice! I repeated dully. Sir Maurice? And at that moment she broke from me, and stood with her head thrown back, and her eyes very bright as though defying me, but I remained where I was, my arms hanging. He was to meet me here at nine o'clock. Oh, Charmian, I whispered, are all women so cruel as you, I wonder? And turning my back upon her, I leaned above the mantel, staring down at the long dead ashes on the hearth. But, standing there, I heard a footstep outside, and swung round with clenched fists. Yet Charmian was quicker, and as the door opened and Sir Maurice entered, she was between us. He stood upon the threshold, dazzled a little by the light, but smiling, graceful, debonair, and point of ice as ever. Indeed, his very presence seemed to make the mean room the meaner by contrast, and as he bent to kiss her hand, I became acutely conscious of my own rough person, my worn and shabby clothes, and of my hands, coarsened and grimed by labor, wherefore my frown grew the blacker, and I clenched my fists the tighter. "'I lost my way, Charmian,' he began, but, though late, I am none the less welcome, I trust. Ah, you frown, cousin Peter. Quite a ghoulish spot, this, at night. You probably find it most congenial, good cousin Timon of Athens. Indeed, cousin, you are very like Timon of Athens. And he laughed, so that I, finding my pipe upon the mantel-shelf, began to turn it aimlessly round and round in my twitching fingers. You have already met, then? inquired Charmian, glancing from one to the other of us. We had that mutual pleasure nearly a week ago, nodded Sir Maurice, when we agreed to disagree, as we always have done and shall do with the result that we find each other agreeably disagreeable. I had hoped that you might be friends. My dear Charmian, I wonder at you, he sighed, so unreasonable. Would you have us contravene the established order of things? It was preordained that Cousin Peter should scowl at me, precisely as he is doing, and that I should shrug my shoulders thus at Cousin Peter, a little hate with, say, a dash of contempt, give a zest to that dish of conglomerate vapidity which we call life, and make it almost palatable. But I'm not here on Cousin Peter's account, he went on, drawing a step nearer to her. At this moment I heartily wish him, among his hammers and chisels, I have come for you, Charmian, because I love you. I have sought you patiently until I found you, and I will never forego you as long as life lasts. But you know all this. Yes, I know all this. I have been very patient, Charmian, submitting to your whims and fancies, but through it all I knew, and in your woman's heart you knew, that you must yield at last, that the chase must end. Some day, well, let it be to-night. My chaise is waiting. When I ran away from you in the storm, Sir Maurice, I told you once and for all that I hated you. Have you forgotten? Hated you, always and ever, and tried to kill you. Oh, Charmian, I have known such hate transfigured into love before now, such love as is only worth the winning. And you are mine, you always were, from the first moment that our eyes met. Come, my chaise is waiting, in a few hours we can be in London, or Dover. No, never. Never is a long time, Charmian, but I am at your service. What is your will? I shall remain here, here, in the wilderness, with my husband, your husband, I'm going to marry your cousin, Peter Vibart. The pipe slipped from my fingers and shivered to pieces on the floor, and in that same fraction of time Sir Maurice had turned and leapt toward me. But as he came I struck him twice with left and right, and he staggered backward to the wall. He stood for a moment with his head stooped upon his hands. When he looked up his face was dead white, and with a smear of blood upon it that seemed to accentuate its pallor, but his voice came smooth and unruffled as ever. 
the mind feminine is given to change said he softly and i shall return yes i shall come back smile madam triumph cousin but i shall come between you yet i tell you i'll come between you living or dead and so he turned and was gone into the shadows but as for me i sat down and leaning my chin in my hand stared down at the broken fragments of my pipe peter you are safe now said i without looking up he is gone but oh charmian was there no other way she was down beside me on her knees had taken my hand rough and grimy as it was and pressed it to her lips and so had drawn it about her neck holding it there and with her face hidden in my breast oh strong man that is so weak she whispered oh grave philosopher that is so foolish oh lonely boy that is so helpless oh peter vibart my peter charmian said i trembling what does it mean it means peter yes that the humble person yes will marry you whenever you will if yes if you will only ask her end of how in place of death i found the fullness of life Section 43 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Freckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 41. Light and Shadow. Now as the little preacher closed his book, the sun rose up, filling the world about us with his glory. And looking into the eyes of my wife, it seemed that a veil was lifted for a moment there, and I read that which her lips might never tell, and there also were joy and shame and a deep happiness. See, said the little preacher, smiling upon us, it is day, and a very glorious one. Already a thousand little choristers of God's great cathedral have begun to chant your marriage hymn. Go forth together, man and wife, upon this great wide road that we call life. Go forth together, made strong in faith, and brave with hope, and the memory of him who walked these ways before you who joyed and sorrowed and suffered and endured all things, even as we must. Go forth together, and may his blessing abide with you, and the peace that passeth understanding. And so we turned together side by side, and left him standing amid his roses. Silently we went together homeward, through the dewy morning, with a soft green carpet underfoot, and leafy arches overhead, where trees bent to whisper benedictions, and shook down jewels from their dewy leaves upon us as we passed by merry brooks that laughed and chattered and gurgled of love and happiness, while over all rose the swelling chorus of the birds. Surely never had they piped so gladly in this glad world before, not even for the gentle Spencer, though he says, There was none of them that feigned to sing, for each of them he pained, to find out merry crafty notes. They ne spared not their throats. And being come at length to the hollow, Charmian must needs pause beside the pool among the willows to view herself in the pellicid water. And on this mirror our eyes met, and lo, of a sudden her lashes drooped, and she turned her head aside. Don't, Peter, she whispered, don't look at me so. How may I help it when you are so beautiful? And because of my eyes she would have fled from me, but I caught her in my arms, and there amid the leaves, despite the jealous babble of the brook, for the second time in my life her lips met mine and gazing yet into her eye, I told her how, in this shady bower, I had once watched her weaving leaves into her hair, and heard her talk to her reflection, and so had stolen away for fear of her beauty. Fear, Peter? We were so far out of the world, and I longed to kiss you, and didn't, Peter, and didn't, Charmian, because we were so very far from the world, and because you were so very much alone, and and because, Peter, because you are a gentle man and strong, as the old locket says, and you do remember, she went on hurriedly, laying her cool restraining fingers on my eager lips, how I found you wearing that locket, and how you blundered and stammered over it and pretended to read your Homer, and how you sang to prevent me, and how gravely you reproved me, and how you called me a creature, and how you deserved it, sir, and grew more helpless and ill at ease than ever, and how, just to flatter my vanity, you told me I had glorious hair. And so you have, said I, kissing a curl at her temple. When you unbind it, my Charmian, it will cover you like a mantle. Now when I said this, for some reason she glanced up at me sudden and shy, and blushed and slipped from my arms and fled up the path like a nymph. 
So we presently entered the cottage, flushed and panting and laughing for sheer happiness, and now she rolled up her sleeves and set about preparing breakfast, laughing my assistance to scorn, but growing mightily indignant when I would kiss her, yet blushing and yielding nevertheless. And while she bustled to and fro, keeping well out of reach of my arm, she began to sing in her soft voice to herself, In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling, made every youth cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. Oh, Charmian, how wonderful you are! All in the merry month of May, when green buds they were swelling, surely no woman ever had such beautiful arms, so round and soft and white, Charmian. She turned upon me with a fork held up admonishingly, but meeting my look, her eyes wavered, and up from throat to brow rushed a wave of burning crimson. Oh, Peter, you make me almost afraid of you, she whispered, and hid her face against my shoulder. Are you content to have married such a very poor man, to be the wife of a village blacksmith? Why, Peter, in all the world there never was such another blacksmith as mine, and, and, there the kettle is boiling over. Let it, said I, and the bacon, the bacon will burn. Let me go, and, oh, Peter. So in due time we sat down to our solitary wedding breakfast, and there were no eyes to speculate upon the bride's beauty, to note her changing color, or the glory of her eyes, and no healths were proposed, or toasts drunk, nor any speeches spoken, except perhaps by my good friend the brook outside, who of course understood the situation, and babbled tolerantly of us to the listening trees, like the grim old philosopher he was. In this solitude we were surely closer together, and belonged more fully to each other, for all her looks and thoughts were mine, as mine were hers and as we ate, sometimes talking and sometimes laughing, though rarely, one seldom laughs in the wilderness, our hands would stray to meet each other across the table, and I would answer I, while in the silence the brook would lift its voice to chuckle throaty chuckles and outlandish witticisms, such as could only be expected from an old reprobate who had grown so in years, and had seen so very much of life. At such times Charmian's cheeks would flush and her lashes droop, as though, indeed, she were versed in the language of brooks. So the golden hours slipped by, the sun crept westward, and evening stole upon us. "'This is a very rough place for you,' said I, and sighed. We were sitting on the bench before the door, and Charmian had laid her folded hands upon my shoulder, and her chin upon her hands. And now she echoed my sigh, but answered without stirring. "'It's the dearest place in all the world. And very lonely,' I pursued. "'I shall be busy all day long, Peter, and you always reach home as evening falls, and then—' then, oh, I shan't be lonely. But I am such a gloomy fellow at the best of times, and very clumsy, Charmian, and something of a failure. And my husband. Peter, Peter, oh, Peter, I started and rose to my feet. Peter, oh, Peter, called the voice again, seemingly from the road, and now I thought it sounded familiar. Charmian stole her arms about my neck. I think it is Simon, said I uneasily. What can have brought him? And he will never venture down into the hollow on account of the ghost. I must go and see what he wants. Yes, Peter, she murmured, but the clasp of her arms tightened. What is it? said I, looking into her troubled eyes. Charmian, you are trembling. What is it? I don't know. But, oh, Peter, I feel as if a shadow, a black and awful shadow, were creeping upon us, hiding us from each other. I am very foolish, aren't I? And this our wedding day. Peter! Peter! Come with me, Charmian. Let us go together. No, I must wait. It is a woman's destiny to wait but I am brave again. Go, see what is wanted. I found Simon, sure enough, in the lane, seated in his cart, and his face looked squarer and grimmer even than usual. Oh, Peter, said he, gripping my hand, it be come at last. Gaffer be going. Going, Simon? Dying, Peter. Fell downstairs a morning. Doctor says he can't last the day out. Sinkin' fast he be, and he acts in free, Peter. Where be Peter, says he, over and over again, where be the Peter as I found of a sunshiny afternoon, down in the audit aller? You weren't at work's morning, Peter, so I be come to fetch ye. You'll come back with me to bid good-bye to the old man? Yes, I'll come, Simon, I answered. Wait here for me. Charmian was waiting for me in the cottage, and as she looked up at me I saw the trouble was back in her eyes again. You must go, leave me, she inquired, for a little while. Yes. I felt it, she said, with a pitiful little smile. The ancient is dying, said I. Now as I spoke, my eyes encountered the staple above the door, wherefore, mounting him on a chair, I seized and shook it, and, lo, the rusty iron snapped off in my fingers, like glass, 
and I slipped it into my pocket. "'Oh, Peter, don't go! Don't leave me!' cried Charmian suddenly, and I saw her face was very pale, and she trembled. "'Charmian!' said I, and sprang to her side. "'Oh, my love, what is it?' "'It is as though the shadow hung over us, darker and more threatening, Peter, as if our happiness were at an end. I seem to hear Maurice's threat, to come between us, living or dead. I am afraid,' she whispered, clinging to me. "'I am afraid.' But all at once she was calm again and full of self-reproaches, calling herself weak and foolish and hysterical, though indeed I was never hysterical before, and telling me that I must go, that it was my duty to go to the gentle dying old man, urging me to the door, almost eagerly, till being out of the cottage she must needs fall a-trembling once more, and wind her arms about my neck with a great sob. But, oh, you will come back soon, very soon, Peter, and we know that nothing can ever come between us again, never again, my husband and with that blessed word she drew me down to her lips, and turning, fled into the cottage. I went on slowly up the path to meet Simon, and as I went my heart was heavy, and my mind full of a strange foreboding. But I never thought of the omen of the knife that had once fallen, and quivered in the floor between us. "'Twears the snuff-box has done it,' said Simon, staring very hard at his horse's ears as we jogged along the road. "'You were a-goin' upstairs for it, and slipped, he did. Simon says he, as I lifted of him in my arms, "'Simon says he, quiet-like, "'I be done for at last, lad. "'This poor old feather o' yourn will never go a-climbin' up these stairs ni mer, says he. "'Never, no, mer. After this Simon fell silent, and I likewise until we reached the village. Before the bull was a group who talked with hushed voices and grave faces. Even old Amos grinned no more. The old man lay in his great four-poster bed, propped up with pillows, and with Prue beside him to smooth his silver hair with tender fingers, and Black George towering in the shade of the bed-curtains like a grieving giant. "'Here I be, Peter,' said the old man, beckoning me feebly with his hand. "'Here I be, at the parting of the ways, and with some had a gone wrong with my innards. When a man gets old as I be, his innards be like glass, Peter like glass, and apt to fly all to pieces if he goes a-slippin' and slidin' down the stairs like me.' "'Are you in pain?' I asked, clasping his shriveled hand. "'Just a twinge now and then, Peter, but, Lord, that bain't nothing to a man the likes of me, Peter.' "'You always were so hale and hearty,' I nodded, giving him the usual opening that he had waited for. "'Aye, so strong as a bull that I were, like a lion in me youth. Black jarge were not to me. A cart-horse I were.' "'Yes,' said I. "'Yes,' and stooped my head lower over the feeble old hand. "'But after all, Peter, bulls pass away, and lions and cart-horses lose their teeth, and gets wore out. For all the flesh is grass, but iron is iron, bain't it, Peter? Rusts it do, but tis iron all the same, and lasts a man out even such hardy chap as I were. Sometimes, I said, without looking up. I be very old and tired, Peter. My heart be all wore out with beatin' and beatin' all these years. Tis a wonder as it didn't stop afore now, but a staple, Peter, don't have no heart to go beatin' and a-wearin' of itself away. No, ancient. So here be I, a-standin' in the valley of shadow, and waitin' for God's angel to take me and for to show me the way. Tis a darksome road, Peter, but I be not afeard, and there be a light beyond Jordan water. No, I aren't afeard to meet God has made me, for the Lord is merciful and very kind, and I don't suppose he'll be very hard on an old, old man as did his best, and with a heart all tired and wore away with beaten. I be ready, Peter, only. Yes, Ancient. Oh, Peter, it be that there old staple, as it'll go rustin' away and rustin' away arter the old man has watched, so as laid in the earth and forgot about. No, said I, without looking up, but slipping my hand into my pocket. No, Ancient. Peter, oh, Peter, do he mean? I mean that although it had no heart, the staple was tired and worn out, just as you are. So I brought it to you. And I slipped the rusty bit of iron into the old man's trembling palm. Oh, Lord, he began in a fervent voice. Oh, dear Lord, I got it, Lord. The old staple. I be ready to come to thee, and joyful, joyful, and for this mercy and benefit received. Blessed be thy name. Amen. He lay very quiet for a while, with the broken staple clasped to his breast, and his eyes closed. Peter, said he suddenly, you won't have no one to bring you news no more. Why, Peter, be ye crying for me? Tis true, twere me found ye, but I didn't think as you'd go to cry tears for me. I be going to take old staple with me, Peter, all along the road, and Peter, yes, ancient, be ye quite sure as ye aren't a duke? Quite sure. Nor no? No, ancient. Not even a baronet? No, ancient. Ah, oh, well, you be a man, Peter, and tis summit to have found a man, that it be. 
and now he feebly beckoned us all nearer. Children, said he, I be an old and ancient man. I be a-goin' across the river to wait for ye, my blessin' on ye. It be a dark, dark road, but I've got to old staple, and there be a light beyond the river. So the ancient sighed, and crossed the dark river into the land of the light eternal. End of Light and Shadow Section 44 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 42. How Sir Maurice Kept His Word. Night, with a rising moon, and over all things a great quietude, a deep, deep silence air close and heavy without a breath to wake the slumbering trees, an oppressive stillness which small sounds magnified themselves and seemed disproportionately loud. And presently, as I went upon my way, I forgot the old man sleeping so peacefully, with the rusty staple clasped to his shrunken breast, and thought only of the proud woman who had given her life into my keeping, and who, henceforth, would walk with me hand in hand upon this broad highway over rough places and smooth, even unto the end. So I strode on, full of a deep and abiding joy, and with heart that throbbed and hands that trembled, because I knew that she watched and waited for my coming. A sound broke upon the stillness, sudden and sharp, like the snapping of a stick. I stopped and glanced about me, but it had come and gone, lost in the all-pervading calm. And presently, reaching the leafy path, that led steeply down into the hollow, I paused a moment to look about me, and to listen again. But the deep silence was all unbroken, save for the slumberous song of the brook, that stole up to me from the shadows, and I wondered idly what that sudden sound might have been. So I began to descend this leafy path, and went on to meet that which lay waiting for me in the shadows. It was dark here among the trees, for the moon was low as yet, but every now and then she sent a kindly ray through some opening amid the leaves, so that as I descended the path I seemed to be wading through small, limpid pools of radiance. But all at once I stopped, staring at something which lay at the edge of one of those pools, a white claw, a hand, whose fingers, talon-like, had sunk deep and embedded themselves in the turf. And beyond this gleaming hand was an arm, and beyond that again, something that bulked across my path, darker than the shadows. Running forward, I stood looking down at that which lay at my feet, so very still, and stooped suddenly, and turned it over that I might see the face, and seeing it, started back in shuddering horror, for in those features, hideous with blood, stained and blackened with powder, I recognized my cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart. Then, remembering the stick that had snapped, I wondered no more, but a sudden deadly faintness came upon me so that I leaned weakly against a tree near by. A rustling of leaves, a shuddering of breath, and though I did not raise my head, I knew that Charmian was there. "'Oh, Peter!' she whispered. "'Oh, Peter!' And that was all. But moved by something in her tone, I glanced up. Her eyes were wide and staring, not at me, but at that which lay between us. Her face was pallid, even her lips had lost their color, and she clasped one hand upon her bosom. The other was hidden in the folds of her gown hidden as I remembered to have seen it once before, but now it struck me with a horrible significance. Wherefore I reached out and caught that hidden hand, and drew the weapon from her nerveless fingers, holding it where the light could play upon it. She started, shivered violently, and covered her eyes, while I, looking down at the pistol in my hand, saw that it had lately been discharged. "'He has kept his word,' she whispered. "'He has kept his word.' "'Yes, Charmian, he has kept his word.' Oh, Peter, she moaned, and stretched out her hand toward me, yet she kept her face turned from that which lay across the path between us, and her hands were shaking pitifully. Peter, she cried with a sudden break in her voice, but I went on wiping the soot from the pistol barrel with the end of my neckerchief. Then, all at once, she was beside me, clasping my arm, and she was pleading with me, her words coming in a flood. No, Peter, no. Oh, God, you do not think it. You can't. You mustn't. I was alone waiting for you, and the hours passed, and you didn't come, and I was nervous, and frightened, and full of awful fancies. I thought I heard someone creeping around the cottage. Once I thought someone peered in at the lattice, and once I thought someone tried the door. And so, because I was frightened, Peter, I took that 
that, and held it in my hand. And while I sat there it seemed more than ever that someone was breathing softly outside the door. And so, Peter, I couldn't bear it any more, and opened the lattice and fired, in the air, I swear it was in the air. And I stood there, at the open casement, sick with fear, and trying to pray for you, because I knew he had come back, to kill you, Peter. And while I prayed I heard another shot, not close but faint, like the snapping of a twig, Peter, and I ran out and, oh, Peter, that is all. But you believe, oh, you believe, don't you, Peter? While she spoke I had slipped the pistol into my pocket, and now I held out my hands to her and drew her near and gazed into the troubled depths of her eyes. Charmian, said I, Charmian, I love you, and God forbid I should ever doubt you any more. So, with a sigh, she sank in my embrace, her arms crept about my neck, and our lips met and clung together. But even then, while I looked upon her beauty, while the contact of her lips thrilled through me, even then, in my mind, I saw the murderous pistol in her hand, as I had seen it months ago. Indeed, it almost seemed that she divined my thoughts, for she drew swiftly back and looked at me with haggard eyes. Peter, she whispered, what is it? What is it? Oh, Charmian, said I over and over again, I love you, I love you. And I kissed her appealing eyes and stayed her questioning lips with my kisses. I love you more than my life, more than honor, more than my soul. And because I so love you, to-night you must leave me. Leave you? Ah, no, Peter, no, no, I am your wife. I must stay with you, to suffer and share your troubles and dangers. It is my right, my privilege. Let us go away together, now, anywhere, anywhere, only let us be together, my husband. Don't, I cried, don't. Do you think it is so easy to remain here without you, to lose you so soon, so very soon? If I only loved you a little less. Ah, don't you see, before this week is out my description will be all over England, we should be caught, and you would have to stand beside me in a court of justice, and face the shame of it. Dear love, it would be my pride, my pride, Peter, to face them all, to clasp this dear hand in mine. Never, I cried, clenching my fists, never. You must leave me. No one must know Charmian Brown ever existed. You must go. Hush, she whispered, clasping me tighter. Listen, someone is coming. Away to the right we could hear the leaves rustling, as though a strong wind passed through them. A light flickered and went out, flickered again, and a voice hailed faintly, Hello! Come, said Charmian, clasping my hand. Let us go and meet him. No, Charmian, no, I must see this man alone. You must leave here to-night, now. You can catch the London mail at the crossroads. Go to Blackheath, to Sir Richard Anstruther. He is my friend. Tell him everything. She was down at my feet and had caught my hand to her bosom. I can't, she cried. I can't go and leave you here alone. I have loved you so, from the very first. It seems that each day my love has grown until it is a part of me. Oh, Peter, don't send me away from you. It will kill me, I think. Better that than the shame of prison, I exclaimed and while I spoke I lifted her in my arms. Oh, I am proud, proud to have won such a love as yours. Let me try to be worthy of it. Good-bye, my beloved. And so I kissed her and would have turned away, but her arms clung about me. Oh, Peter, she sobbed, if you must go, if you will go, call me your wife, just once, Peter. The hovering light was much nearer now, and the rustle of leaves louder, as I stooped above her cold hands and kissed their trembling fingers. Some day, said I, some day, if there is a just God in heaven, we shall meet again, perhaps soon, perhaps late. Until then, let us dream of that glorious golden some day, but now, farewell, O beloved wife. With a broken cry she drew my head down upon her breast and clasped it there, while her tears mingled with her kisses, and so, crying my name, she turned and was lost among the leaves. Chapter 43 How I Set Out to Face My Destiny the pallid moon shone down pitilessly upon the dead white face that stared up at me through its grime and blood, with the same half-tolerant, half-amused contempt of me that it had worn in life. The drawn lips seemed to mock me, and the clenched fists to defy me still, so that I shivered and turned to watch the oncoming light that danced like a will-o'-the-wisp among the shadows. Presently it stopped, and a voice hailed once more. Hello! Hello! I called back. This way! This way! In a little while I saw the figure of a man, whom I at once recognized as the one-time postillion, bearing the lanthorn of a chaise, and as he approached it struck me that this meeting was very much like our first, save for him who lay in the shadows, staring up at me with unwinking eyes. 
"'So ho!' exclaimed the postilion as he came up, raising his lantern that he may view me better. "'It is you again, is it?' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'Well, I don't like it,' he grumbled. "'A meeting of each other again like this, in this here ghastly place? No, I don't like it. Too much like the last time to be natural. And as you know, I can't bide on naturalness. If I was to ax you where my master was, like as not you'd tell me he was here, said I, and moving aside, pointed to the shadow. The postilion stepped nearer, lowering his lantern, and staggered blindly backward. Lord, he whimpered, Lord love me, and stood staring with a dropped jaw. Where is your chaise? Up yonder, yonder in the lane, he mumbled, his eyes still fixed. Then help me to carry him there. No, no, I durst touch it, I, I cannot, not me, not me. I think you will, said I, and took the pistol from my pocket. Ain't one enough for to-night, he muttered. Put it away, I'll come. I'll do it. Put it away. So I dropped the weapon back into my pocket, while the postilion, shivering violently, stooped with me above the inanimate figure, and with our limp burden between us, we staggered and stumbled up the path and along the lane to where stood a light travelling chaise. He ain't likely to come to this time, I'm thinking, said the postilion, mopping the sweat from his brow and grinning with pallid lips after we'd got our burden into the vehicle. No, he ain't likely to wake up no more, nor yet curse my head off this side of Jordan. No, I answered, beginning to unwind my neckcloth. Nor it ain't no good to go abandoning and binding him up like you did last time. No, I said, no. And stepping into the chaise, I muffled that disfigured face in my neckcloth, having done which I closed the door. What now? inquired the postilion. Now you can drive us to Cranbrook. What? Be you a-coming too? Yes, I nodded. Yes, I am coming too. Lord love me, he exclaimed. And a moment later I heard him chirruping to his horses. The whip cracked and the chaise lurched forward. Whether he had some wild notion that I might attempt to descend and make my escape before we reached our destination, I cannot say. But he drove at a furious pace, taking corners at reckless speed so the chaise lurched and swayed most violently, and more than once I was compelled to hold that awful figure down upon the seat before me lest it should slide to the floor. On we sped, past hedge and tree, by field and lonely wood, and ever in my ears was the whir of the wheels, the drumming of hooves, and the crack of the whip, and ever the flitting moonbeams danced across that muffled face until it seemed that the features writhed and jibed at me beneath the folds of the neckerchief. And so at last came lights and houses, and the sound of excited voices as we pulled up before the posting-house at Cranbrook. Looking from the window I saw a ring of faces with eyes that gleamed in the light of the lanterns, and every eye was fixed on me, and every foot gave back a step as I descended from the chaise, and while I stood there the postilion came with two white-faced ostlers, who between them bore a heavy burden through the crowd, stumbling awkwardly as they went, and as men saw what they were carrying, there came a low, deep sound, wordless, inarticulate, yet full of menace. But above this murmur a voice rose, I saw the postilion push his way to the steps of the inn and turn there, with hands clenched and raised above his head. My master, Sir Maurice Vibart, is killed, shot to death, murdered down there in the haunted dollar, he cried. And if you ax as me who done it, I says to you, he did, so help me God. And speaking, he raised his whip and pointed at me. Once more there rose that inarticulate sound of menace, and once more all eyes were fixed upon me. "'You were a fine gentleman,' said a voice. "'And so gay and light-hearted,' said another. "'Aye, a generous and open-handed gentleman,' said a third. At every moment the murmur swelled and grew more threatening. Fists were clenched and sticks flourished, so that instinctively I set my back against the chaise, for it seemed that they lacked only someone to take the initiative ere they fell upon me. The postilion saw this, too, for with a shout he sprang forward, his whip upraised. But as he did so, the crowd was burst asunder, he was caught by a mighty arm, and Black George stood beside me, his eyes glowing, his fists clenched, and his hair and beard bristling. "'Stand back, you chaps,' he growled. "'Stand back, or I'll hurt some on ye. "'Be ye all a lot of dogs set on worry ones all alone?' And then he said, turning to me, "'What be the matter with the fools, Peter?' "'Matter?' cried the postilion. "'Murder be the matter. My master be murdered, shot to death, and there stands the man as done it.' murder cried george in an altered voice murder now as he spoke the crowd parted and four ostlers appeared bearing a hurdle between them 
and on the hurdle lay a figure, an elegant figure whose head and face were still muffled in my neckerchief. I saw George start, and like a flash his glance came round to my bare throat, and dismay was in his eyes. Peter, he murmured. Then he laughed suddenly and clapped his hand down upon my shoulder. Look ye, you chaps, he cried, facing the crowd. This is my friend Peter, an honest man and no murderer, as he will tell you hisself. This is my friend, as I'd go bail for my life to be a true man. Speak up, Peter, and tell him that you am an honest man and no murderer. But I shook my head. Oh, Peter, he whispered, speak, speak. Not here, George, I answered. It would be of no avail. Besides, I can say nothing to clear myself. Nothing, Peter? Nothing, George. This man was shot and killed in the hollow. I found him lying dead. I found the empty pistol, and the postilion yonder found me standing over the body. That's all I have to tell. Peter, said he, speaking hurriedly beneath his breath. Oh, Peter, let's run for it. T'would be main easy for the likes of you and me. No, George, I answered. It would be worse than useless. But one thing I do ask of you, you who know me so much better than most, and it is that you will bid me good-bye and take my hand once more, George, here before all the eyes that look upon me as a murderer, and, before I had finished, he had hold of my hand in both of his, nay, had thrown one great arm protectingly about me. Why, Peter, he began in a strangely cracked voice, oh, man as I love, never think as I'd believe their lies, and, Peter, such fighters as you and me, a match for double their number, let's make a bolt for it. Eh, God, I want to hit somebody. Never doubt me, Peter, your friend, and they'd go over like skittles, like skittles, Peter. The crowd, which had swelled momentarily, surged, opened, and a man on horseback pushed his way toward me, a man in some disorder of dress, as though he had clothed himself in a hurry. Rough hands were now laid upon me. I saw George's fist raised threateningly, but caught it in my grasp. Good-bye, said I. Good-bye, George. Don't look so downcast, man. But we were forced apart, and I was pushed and pulled and hustled away through a crowd of faces whose eyes damned me wherever I looked, along panelled passageways, into a long, dim room, where sat the gentleman I had seen on the horse, busily tying his cravat, to whom I delivered up the pistol, and answered diverse questions as well as I might, and by whom, after much jotting of notes and memoranda, I was delivered over to four burly fellows, who, with deep gravity, and a grip much tighter than was necessary, once more led me out into the moonlit street, where were people who pressed forward to stare into my face, and people who leaned out of windows to stare down upon my head, and many more who followed at my heels. And thus, in much estate, I ascended a flight of worn stone steps into the churchyard, and so, by way of tombs and graves, came at last to the great square church tower, into which I was incontinently thrust, and there, very securely, locked up. End of How I Set Out to Face My Destiny Section 45 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. CHAPTER Forty Four, THE BOW STREET RUNNERS It was toward evening of the next day that the door of my prison was opened and two men entered. The first was a tall, cadaverous-looking individual of a melancholy cast of feature, who despite the season was wrapped in a long frieze coat, reaching almost to his heels, from the pocket of which projected a short staff or truncheon. He came forward with his hands in his pockets and his bony chin on his breast, looking at me under the brim of a somewhat weather-beaten hat. That is to say, he looked at my feet and my hands and my throat and my chin, but never seemed to get any higher. His companion, on the contrary, bustled forward and, tapping me familiarly on the shoulder, looked me over with a bright, appraising eye. "'Selp me, Jeremy,' said he, addressing his saturnine friend. "'Selp me. I've ever seen a poor misfortunate cove more to my mind and fancy. Nice and tall and straight-legged, twelve stone if a pound. A five-foot drop now, or say five-foot six, and he'll go off as sweet as a bird.' Ah, you'll never feel it, McCovey, not a twinge. A little tightish round the windpipe, perhaps, but, Lord, it's over soon. You're looking a bit pale round the gills, young cove, but, Lord, that's only natural, too. Here he produced from the depths of a capacious pocket something that glittered beneath his agile fingers. And how might be your general health, young cove? He went on affably. Bobbish, I hope. Fair and bobbish? 
as he spoke with a sudden dexterous motion he had snapped something on my wrists so quickly that at the contact of the cold steel i started and as i did so something jingled faintly there he exclaimed clapping me on the shoulder again but at the same time casting a sharp glance at my shackled wrists there now we're all happy and comfortable i see as your Rakovas takes things nice and quiet and so long as you do i'm your friend bob's my name and bobbish is my nature lord the way i've seen which fortunate coves take on at sight of them bracelets something outrageous but you well you're a different kidney you're my kind you are what do you say jeremy don't like his eye growled that individual don't mind jeremy winked the other it's just his perverseness lord he is the perversest country ever did see why he finds fault with the pope of rome just cause he's in the habit of letting ghosts kiss his toe i've heard jeremy work himself up over the pope and a pint of porter till you'd a thought and we ain't never a gonna start inquired jeremy staring out the window with his back to us and where said i might you be taking me why since you ask my covey we am taking you to where you'll be took good care on where you'll feed well and have justice done on you trust us for that though to be sure i'm sorry to take you from such proper quarters as these nice and airy eh jeremy ah and with a fine view of the graves growled jeremy leading the way out in the street stood a chaise and four surrounded by a pushing jostling throng of men women and children who catching sight of me between the bow street runners forgot to push and jostle and stared at me with every eye and tooth they possessed until i was hidden in the chaise right away growled jeremy shutting the door with a bang whoa roared a voice and a great shaggy golden head was thrust in at the window and a hand reached down and grasped mine a pipe and baccy peter for me a flask o rum simon's best from simon and chicken sandwiches from my prue this as he passed in each article through the window and i were to say peter as we're all wi' ye ever and ever and i were likewise to tell ye as how prue will pray for ye oftener than before and e god he broke off the tears running down his face there were a lot more but i forgot it all only peter me and simon be going to get a lawyer chap for ye and ah man peter say the word and i'll have ye out of this in a twinkling and we'll run for it but even as i shook my head the postboy's whip cracked and the horses plunged forward good-bye george i cried good-bye dear fellow and the last i saw of him was as he stood rubbing his tears away with one fist and shaking the other after the chaise chapter forty five which concerns itself among other matters with the boots of the saturnine jeremy a bottle of rum said the man bob and taking it up very abstracted of eye he removed the cork sniffed at it tasted it took a gulp and handed it over to his companion who also looked at it sniffed it and tasted it and what do you make of that jeremy tasted better for now growled jeremy and immediately took another pull sandwiches too pursued the man bob in a ruminating tone i always was partial to chicken and forthwith opening the dainty parcel he helped himself and his companion also what do you make of them jeremy he inquired munching i've eaten worse rumbled jeremy also munching young cove they does you credit said the man bob nodding to me with great urbanity great credit there ain't many misfortunates can produce such sandwiches as them though to be sure they eats uncommon quick go lard in there jeremy but indeed the sandwiches were already only a memory wherefore his brow grew black and he glared at the still munching jeremy who met his looks with his usual impenetrable gloom a pipe and backa mused the man bob after we had ridden some while in silence and with the same serene unconsciousness of manner he took the pipe filled it lighted it and puffed with an air of dreamy content jeremy's a goodish sort he began with a complacent flourish of the pipe a goodish sort but cross-grained lord young cove his cross-grainedness is a gull only by his perverseness and cause why cause he don't smoke go easy with the rum jeremy there's nothing like a pipe of backer to soothe such things away i got my eye on you jeremy no there's nothing like a pipe of backer look at me i were the perversest infant that ever was till i took to smoking and to-day whatever i am i ain't perverse nor yet cross-grained and many a misfortunate cove as is now no more as wept over me at parton they generally always do growled jeremy uncorking the rum bottle with his teeth no jerry no returned the other blowing out a cloud of smoke misfortunates ain't all the same are you with that bottle 
You have criers and laughers and prayers and silent ones, and the silent coves is the dangerousest. Are you with the bottle, Jeremy? Now you, McCovey, he went on, tapping my hand gently with his pipe stem, you ain't exactly talkative, in fact, not wishing no offence, I might say as you was inclined to be one of the silent ones. Not as old's that against you, far from it, only you reminds me of a young cove as had the misfortune to get hisself took for forgery, and who, order me a-talkin' and a-chattin' to him in my pleasant way, went and managed to commit suicide under my very nose, which were hardly nice or even respectable, considerin'. Barted you with the bottle, Jeremy. Jeremy growled, held up the bottle to the failing light of evening, measured its contents with his thumb, and extended it unwillingly toward his comrade's ready hand. But it never got there, for at that instant the chaise lurched violently. There was a cry, a splintering of glass, a crash, and I was lying, half stunned in a ditch, listening to the chorus of oaths and cries that rose from the cloud of dust where the frightened horses reared and plunged. How long I remained thus I cannot say, but all at once I found myself upon my feet, running down the road, for hazy though my mind yet was, I could think only of escape, of liberty and freedom, at any price, at any cost. So I ran on down the road, somewhat unsteadily as yet, because my fall had been a heavy one, and my brain still reeled. I heard a shot behind me, the sharp crack of a pistol, and a bullet sang over my head, and then I knew they were after me, for I could hear the patter of their feet upon the hard road. Now as I ran my brain cleared, but this only served me to appreciate the difficulty of eluding men so seasoned and hardy as my pursuers. Moreover the handcuffs galled my wrists, and the short connecting chain hampered my movements considerably, and I saw that upon this straight level I must soon be run down or shot from behind. Glancing back I beheld them some hundred yards or so away, elbows in, heads up, running with that long free stride that speaks of endurance. I increased the pace, the ground flew beneath me, but when I glanced again, though the man Bob had dropped back, the Saturnine Jeremy ran on, no nearer, but no farther than before. Now as I went I presently espied that for which I had looked, a gate set in the midst of the hedge, but it was closed, and never did a gate before or since appear quite so high and insurmountable. But with the desperation of despair I turned and ran at it, and sprang, swinging my arms above my head as I did so. My foot grazed the top bar, down I came, slipped, stumbled, regained my balance, and ran on over the springy turf. I heard a crash behind me, an oath, a second pistol barked, and immediately it seemed that a hot iron seared my forearm, and glancing down I saw the skin cut and bleeding, but finding it no worse, breathed a sigh of thankfulness, and ran on. By that leap I had probably gained some twenty yards. I would nurse my strength, therefore, if I could once gain the woods. How far off were they? Half a mile? A mile? Well, I could run that easily, thanks to my hardy life. Stay! What was that sound behind me? The fall of flying feet, or the throbbing of my own heart? I turned my head. The man Jeremy was within twelve yards of me. Lean and spare, his head thrust forward, he ran with the long, easy stride of a greyhound. So it was to be a question of endurance? Well, I had caught my second wind by now. I set my teeth, and clenching my fists, lengthened my stride. And now, indeed, the real struggle began. My pursuer had long ago abandoned his coat, but his boots were heavier and clumsier than those I wore. But then again, my confining shackles seemed to contract my chest, and the handcuffs galled my wrists cruelly. On I went, scattering flocks of scampering sheep, past meditative cows who started up, puffing out snorts of perfume, scrambling through hedges over gate and stile and ditch, with eyes upon the distant woods full of the purple gloom of evening, and in my ears the muffled thud, 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 thud of the pursuit, sometimes seeming much nearer, sometimes much further off, but always the same rhythmic, remorseless thud, 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 thud. On and ever on, climbing steep uplands, plunging down precipitous slopes, past brawling brooks and silent pools, all red and gold with sunset, past oak and ash and thorn, on and on, with ever those thudding footfalls close behind, and as we ran it seemed to me that our feet beat out a kind of cadence, his heavy shoes and my lighter ones, thud, thud, pad, pad, thud, thud, pad, pad, until they would suddenly become confused and mingled with each other. One moment it seemed I almost loved the fellow, the next I bitterly hated him. Whether I had gained or not I could not tell, to look back was to lose ground. The woods were close now, so close that I fancied I heard the voice of their myriad leaves calling to me, encouraging me. But my breath was panting thick and short, 
my stride was less sure, my wrists were raw and bleeding, and the ceaseless jingle of my chain maddened me. Thud, thud, untiring, persistent, thud, thud, the pulse at my temples throbbed in time with it, my breath panted to it, and surely it was nearer, more distinct. Yes, he had gained on me in the last half-mile, but how much? I cast a look over my shoulder. It was but a glance, yet I saw that he had lessened the distance between us by half. His face shone with sweat, his mouth was a line, his nostrils broad and expanded, his eyes staring and shot with blood, but he ran on with the same long, easy stride that was slowly but surely wearing me down. We were descending a long grassy slope, and I stumbled more than once, and rolled in my course, but on came those remorseless footfalls, thud, 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 strong and sure as ever. He was nearing me fast, he was close upon me, closer, within reach of me, I could hear his whistling breaths, and then all at once I was down on hands and knees. He tried to avoid me, failed, and shooting high over me, thudded down upon the grass. For a moment he lay still, then, with a groan, he rolled over and propped himself on his arm, thrust a hand into his bosom, but I hurled myself upon him, and after a brief struggle, twisted the pistol from his grasp, whereupon he groaned again. Hurt? I panted. Arm broke, I think, he growled, and forthwith burst out in a torrent of curses. "'Does it hurt so much?' I panted. "'Ah, but it ain't that,' he panted back. "'It's me a letting of you work off a moldy old trick on me like that.' "'It was my only chance,' said I, sitting down beside him, to regain my wind. "'To think,' he growled. "'A me being took in by a—' "'But you're a great runner,' said I. "'A great fool, you mean, to be took in by a—' "'You have a long walk back, and your arm will be painful. "'And serve me right for being took in by—' "'If you will lend me your neckerchief, I think I can make your arm more comfortable,' said I. He ceased cursing to stare at me, slowly and awkwardly unwound the article in question and passed it to me. Thereupon, having located the fracture, I contrived a rough splint with a piece of wood lying near, which done, he thanked me, in a burst of profanity, and rose. "'I've seen worse coves nor you,' said he, "'and one good turn deserving another. Lie snug all day and travel by night. Keep to the by-roads.' This ain't no common case. There'll be a thousand pounds on your head before the week's out, so look spry, my cove. Saying which, he nodded, turned upon his heel, and strode away, cursing to himself. Now presently, as I went, I heard the merry ring and clink of hammer and anvil, and guided by the sound, came to a tumble-down smithy, where was a man busily at work, with a shock-headed boy at the bellows. At sight of me the smith set down his hammer, and stared open-mouthed, as did also the shock-headed boy. "'How long would it take you to file off these shackles?' I inquired, holding out my hands. "'To file them off?' "'Yes. Why, that that depends. Then do it, as soon as you can.' Upon this the man turned his back to me, and began rummaging among his tools, with his head very near that of the shock-headed boy, until having found a file suitable to the purpose, he set to work on my handcuffs. But he progressed so slowly, for one reason and another, that I began to grow impatient, Moreover, noticing that the shock-headed boy had disappeared, I bade him desist. "'A cold chisel and hammer will be quickest,' said I. "'Come, cut me off this chain. Here, close up to the rivets.' And when he had done this, I took his file, thrusting it beneath my coat, set off, running my hardest, leaving him to stare after me, with his eyes and mouth wider than ever. The sun was gone down when I reached the woods, and here, in the kind shadows, I stayed a while to rest and rid myself of handcuffs. But when I felt for the file to do so, it was gone. End of Which Concerns Itself, Among Other Matters, With the Boots of the Saturnine Jeremy Section 46 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 46. How I Came to London. Justly to narrate all that befell me during my flight and journey to London would fill many pages, and therefore, as this book of mine is already a magnitude far beyond my first expectations, I shall hurry on to the end of my story. Acting upon the advice of the Saturnine Jeremy, I lay hidden by day and travelled by night, avoiding the highway. But in doing so, I became so often involved in the maze of crossroads, by-lanes, cow-paths, and cart-tracks, 
that twice the dawn found me as completely lost as though i had been set down in the midst of the sahara i thus wasted much time and wandered many miles out of my way wherefore to put an end to these futile ramblings i set my face westward hoping to strike the high road somewhere between tunbridge and sevenoaks determined rather to run the chance of capture than follow haphazard these tortuous and interminable byways it was then upon the third night since my escape that faint and spent with hunger i saw before me the welcome sight of a finger-post and hurrying forward eager to learn my whereabouts came full upon a man who sat beneath the finger-post with a hunch of bread and meat upon his knee which he was eating by means of a clasp-knife now i had tasted nothing save two apples all day and but little the day before thus at sight of this appetizing food my hunger grew and increased to a violent desire before which prudence vanished and caution flew away therefore i approached the man with my eyes upon his bread and meat but as i drew nearer my attention was attracted by something white that was nailed up against the finger-post and i stopped dead with my eyes riveted by a word printed in great black capitals and stood oblivious alike of the man who had stopped eating to stare at me and the bread and meat that he had set down upon the grass for what i saw was this g r murder five hundred pound reward whereas peter smith blacksmith late of sissinghurst in the county of kent suspected of the crime of wilful murder did upon the tenth of august last make his escape from his gaolers upon the tunbridge road somewhere between sissinghurst and pembury the above reward namely five hundred pounds will be paid to such person or persons who shall give such information as shall lead to the arrest and apprehension of the aforesaid peter smith in the furtherance of which is hereunto added a just and close description of the same viz he is six foot tall a sizable rogue his hair black his eyes dark and piercing clad when last seen in a worn velveteen jacket knee breeches buckled at the knees gray worsted stockings and patched shoes the coat torn at the right shoulder upon his wrists a pair of steel handcuffs last seen in the vicinity of pembry while i yet stared at this i was conscious that the man had risen and now stood at my elbow also that in one hand he carried a short heavy stick he stood very still and with bent head apparently absorbed in the printed words before him but more than once i saw his eyes gleam in the shadow of his hat brim as they turned to scan me furtively up and down yet he did not speak or move and there was something threatening i thought in his immobility wherefore i in turn watched him narrowly from the corner of my eye and thus it chanced that our glances met you seem thoughtful said i ah i be that and what might you be thinking why since you ax me i was thinking as your eye was mighty sharp and piercing ah said i and what more that your coat was tore at the shoulder so it is i nodded well you likewise wears buckled breeches and grey worsted stockings you're a very observant man said i though to be sure said he shaking his head i don't see no handcuffs that is because they are hidden under my sleeves ah said he and i saw the stick quiver in his grip as i said before you are a very observant man said i watching the stick well i've got eyes and can see as much as most folk he retorted and here the stick quivered again yes i nodded you also possess legs and can probably walk fast ah and run too if need be he added significantly then suppose you start start where anywhere so long as you do start not without you my buck i've took a powerful fancy to you and that there are five hundred pounds here his left hand shot out and grasped my collar so supposing you come along with me and no tricks mind no tricks or ah would ye the heavy stick whirled up but quick as he i had caught his wrist and now presented my pistol full in his face drop that stick said i pressing the muzzle of the weapon lightly against his forehead as i spoke at the touch of the cold steel his body suddenly stiffened and grew rigid his eyes opened in a horrified stare and the stick clattered down on the road talking of fancies i pursued i have a great mind to that smock frock of yours so take it off and quick about it in a fever of haste he tore off the garment in question and he thrusting it eagerly upon me i folded it over my arm now said i since you say you can run supposing you show me what you can do this is a good straight lane off with you and do your best 
and no turning or stopping, mind, for the moon is very bright, and I am a pretty good shot. Hardly waiting to hear me out, the fellow set off up the lane, running like the wind, whereupon I, waiting only to snatch up his forgotten bread and meat, took to my heels down the lane, so that, when I presently stopped to don the smock-frock, its late possessor had vanished as though he'd never been. I hurried on, nevertheless, eating greedily as I went, and after some while left the narrow lane behind, and came out on the broad highway that stretched like a great white ribbon unrolled beneath the moon, and here was another finger-post, with the words, To Sevenoaks, Tunbridge, and the Wells, to Bromley and London. And here also was another placard, headed by that awful word murder, which seemed to leap out at me from the rest. And with that word there rushed over me the memory of Charmian as I had seen her stand, white-lipped, haggard of eye, and with one hand hidden in the folds of her gown. So I turned and strove to flee from this hideous word, and as I went I clenched my fists and cried within myself, I love her, I love her, no doubt can come between us more. I love her, love her, love her. Thus I hurried on along the great high road, but wherever I looked I saw this most hateful word. It shone out palely from the shadows. It was scored into the dust at my feet, even across the splendor of the moon in jagged characters. I seemed to read that awful word, murder. And the soft night wind woke voices to whisper it as I passed. The somber trees and gloomy hedgerows were full of it, I heard it in the echo of my step, murder, murder. It was always there, whether I walked or ran, in rough and stony places, in the deep soft dust, in the dewy tender grass, it was always there, whispering at my heels and refusing to be silenced. I had gone on in this way for an hour or more, avoiding the middle of the road because of the brilliance of the moon, when I overtook something that crawled in the gloom of the hedge, and approaching, pistol in hand, saw that it was a man. He was creeping forward slowly and painfully on his hands and knees, but all at once sank down on his face in the grass, only to rise, groaning, and creep on once more. And as he went, I heard him praying, Lord, give me strength. Oh, Lord, give me strength. Angela, Angela, it is so far, so far. And groaning, he sank down again upon his face. You are ill, said I, bending over him. I must reach Deptford. She's buried at Deptford, and I shall die to-night. Oh, Lord, give me strength, he panted. Deptford is miles away, said I. Now as I spoke, he lifted himself upon his hands and stared up at me. I saw a haggard, hairy face, very thin and sunken, but a fire burned in the eyes, and the eyes seemed somehow familiar. You, he cried, and spat up in the air toward me. Devil, he cried, devil, Vibart. I recoiled instinctively before the man's sudden wild ferocity, but propping himself against the bank, he shook his hand at me and laughed. Devil, he repeated, shade, ghost of a devil, have you come back to see me die? Who are you? I cried, bending to look into the pale, emaciated face. Who are you? A shadow, he answered, passing a shaking hand up over his face and brow. A ghost, a phantom, as you are, but my name was Strickland once as yours was devil Vibart. I am changed of late. You said so in the hollow, and laughed. You don't laugh now, devil Vibart. You remember poor John Strickland now? You are the outside passenger, I exclaimed, the madman who followed and shot at me in a wood. Followed? Yes, I was a shadow that was always behind you, following and following you, Satan Vibart, tracking and tracking you to hell and damnation. And you fled here, and you fled there, but I was always behind you. You hid from me among lowly folk, but you could not escape the shadow. Many times I would have killed you, but she was between. The woman. I came once to your cottage. It was night, and the door opened beneath my hand, but your time was not then. But ha! I met you among the trees, as I did once before, and I told you my name, as I did once before. And I spoke of her, of Angela, and cried her name, and shot you just here, above the brow. So you died, Devil Vibart as soon I must, for my mission is accomplished. It was you, I cried, kneeling beside him. It was your hand that shot Sir Maurice Vibart? Yes, he answered, his voice growing very gentle as he went on. For Angela's sake, my dead wife. And fumbling in his pocket, he drew out a woman's small lace-edged handkerchief, and I saw that it was thickened and black with blood. This was hers, he continued, in her hand the night she died. I had meant to lay it on her grave, the blood of atonement, but now... 
a sudden crash in the hedge above, a figure silhouetted against the sky, a shadowy arm that falling struck the moon out of heaven, and in the darkness I was down upon my knees and fingers were about my throat. Oh, Darby, cried a voice, I've got him this way, quick. Oh, Darb, my fist drove into his ribs. I struggled up under a rain of blows, and we struck and swayed and staggered and struck, trampling the groaning wretch who lay dying in the ditch, and before me was the pale oval of a face, and I smote it twice with my pistol butt, and it was gone, and I was running along the road. Charmian spoke truth. Oh, God, I thank thee. I burst through a hedge, running on and on, careless alike of being seen, of capture or escape, of prison or freedom, for in my heart was a great joy. I was conscious of shouts and cries, but I heeded them no more, listening only to the song of happiness my heart was singing. Charmian spoke the truth, her hands are clean. Oh, God, I thank thee. And as I went, I presently espied a caravan, and before it a fire of sticks, above which a man was bending, who, raising his head, stared at me as I approached. He was a strange-looking man who glared at me with one eye and leered jocosely with the other, and being spent and short of breath, I stopped and wiping the sweat from my eyes, I saw that it was blood. "'How is Lewis?' I panted. "'What?' exclaimed the man, drawing nearer. "'Is it you, James? But you're a picter you are. Hello!' He stopped as his glance encountered the steel that glittered upon my wrist, while upon the silence the shouts swelled, drawing nearer and nearer. "'So the runners are after you, are they, young feller?' "'Yes,' I said. "'Yes. You have only to cry out, and they will take me, for I can fight no more, nor run any further.' This knock on the head has made me very dizzy. Then take a pull at this ear, he said, and thrust a flat bottle into my hand. The fiery spirit burned my throat, but almost immediately my strength and courage revived. Better? Much better, I answered, returning the bottle, and I thank you. Don't go for to thank me, young feller, said he, driving the cork into the bottle with a blow of his fist. You thank that young feller as once done as much for me. Not a fair. And now, cut away, run. The edge is good and dark up yonder. Lay low a bit and leave these damn runners to me. I obeyed without more ado, and as I ran up the lane, I heard him shouting and swearing as though engaged in a desperate encounter, and turning in the shadow of the hedge, I saw him met by two men, with whom, still shouting and gesticulating excitedly, he set off running down the lane. And so I once more turned my face Londonward. The blood still flowed from the cut in my head, getting often into my eyes, yet I made good progress notwithstanding. But little by little the effect of the spirits wore off, a drowsiness stole over me, my limbs felt numbed and heavy, and with this came strange fancies and a dread of the dark. Sometimes it seemed that odd lights danced before my eyes like marsh fires, and strange voices gabbled in my ears, furiously unintelligible, with laughter in a high-pitched key. Sometimes I cast myself down in the dewy grass, only to start up again, trembling, and run on till I was breathless. But ever I struggled forward, despite the throbbing of my broken head and the gnawing hunger that consumed me. After a while a mist came on, a mist that formed itself into deep valleys, or rose in jagged spires and pinnacles, but constantly changing, a mist that moved and writhed within itself. And in this mist were forms, nebulous and indistinct, multitudes that moved in time with me, and the voices seemed louder than before and the laughter much shriller, while repeated over and over again, I caught that awful word, murder, murder. Chief among this host walked one whose head and face were muffled from my sight, but who watched me, I knew, through the folds, with eyes that stared fixed and wide. But now, indeed, the mist seemed to have gone into my brain, and all things were hazy, and my memory of them is dim. Yet I recall passing Bromley Village and slinking furtively through the shadows of the deserted high street, but thereafter all is blank, save a memory of pain and toil and deadly fatigue. I was stumbling up steps, the steps of a terrace. A great house lay before me, and lighted windows here and there. But these I feared, and so came creeping to one that I knew well, and whose dark panes glittered palely under the dying moon. Now I took out my clasp knife, and fumbling blindly, put back the catch, as I had often done as a boy. And so, the window opening, I clambered into the dimness beyond. Now as I stumbled forward my hand touched something, a long dark object that was covered with a cloth, and hardly knowing what I did I drew back this cloth and looked down at that which it had covered, and sank down on my knees groaning, for there staring up at me, cold, contemptuous, and set like marble, was the smiling dead face of my cousin Maurice. 
as i knelt there i was conscious that the door had opened that some one approached bearing a light but i did not move or heed peter good god in heaven is it peter i looked up and into the dilated eyes of sir richard is it really peter he whispered yes sir dying i think no no peter dear boy you didn't know you hadn't heard poor maurice murdered fellow name of smith yes sir richard i know more about it than most you see i am peter smith sir richard fell back from me and i saw the candle swaying in his grasp you he whispered you oh peter oh my boy but i am innocent innocent you believe me you who were my earliest friend my good kind friend you believe me and i stretched out my hands appealingly but as i did so the light fell gleaming on my shameful wristlets and even as we gazed into each other's eyes mute and breathless came the sound of steps and hushed voices sir richard sprang forward and catching me in a powerful hand half led half dragged me behind a tall leather screen beside the hearth and thrusting me into a chair turned and hurried to meet the intruders they were three as i soon discovered by their voices one of which i thought i recognized it's a devilish shame the first was saying not a soul here for the funeral but our four selves i say it's a shame a burning shame that sir depends entirely on the point of view answered the second a somewhat aggressive voice and this it was i seemed to recognize point of view sir where i should like to know are all those smiling non-entities those fawning sycophants who were once so proud of his patronage who openly modelled themselves upon him whose highest ambition was to be called a friend of the famous buck vibart where are they now doing the same by the present favourite as is the nature of their kind responded the third poor maurice is already forgotten the prince said the harsh voice the prince would never have forgotten him for crossing him in the affair of the lady sophia sefton the day he ran off with her he was as surely dead in a social sense as he is now in every sense here the mist settled down upon my brain once more and i heard nothing but a confused murmur of voices and it seemed to me that i was back on the road again hemmed in by those gibbering phantoms that spoke so much but said but one word murder quick a candle here a candle bring a light there came a glare before my smarting eyes and i struggled to my feet why i have seen this fellow's face somewhere ah yes at an inn a hangdog rogue i threatened to pull his nose i remember and by heaven handcuffs he has been roughly handled too gentlemen i'll lay my life the murderer is found though how he should come here of all places extraordinary sir richard you and i as magistrates duty but the mist was very thick and the voices grew confused again only i knew that hands were upon me and i was led into another room where were lights that glittered upon the silver and decanters and glasses of a supper table yes i was saying slowly and heavily yes i am peter smith a blacksmith who escaped from his gaolers on the tonbridge road but i am innocent before god i am innocent and now do with me as you will for i am very weary sir richard's arm was about me and his voice sounded in my ears but as though a great way off sirs said he this is my friend sir peter vibart there was a moment's pause then a chair fell with a crash and there arose a confusion of excited voices which grew suddenly silent for the door had opened and on the threshold stood a woman tall and proud and richly dressed from the little dusty boot that peeped beneath her habit to the wide sweeping hat brim that shaded the high beauty of her face and i would have gone to her but my strength failed me charmian she started and turning uttered a cry and ran to me charmian said i oh charmian and so with her tender arms about me and her kisses on my lips the mist settled down upon me thicker and darker than ever end of how i came to london Section 47 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 47. In which this history is ended. A bright room, luxuriously appointed. A great wide bed with carved posts and embroidered canopy. Between the curtain windows, a tall oak press with grotesque heads carved thereon, heads that leered and gaped and scowled at me. 
but the bed and the room and the oak press were all familiar and the grotesque heads had leered and gaped and frowned at me before and haunted my boyish dreams many and many a night and now i lay between sleeping and waking staring dreamily at all these things till roused by a voice near by and starting up broad awake beheld sir richard deuce take you peter he exclaimed i say the devil fly away with you my boy curse me a nice pickle you've made of yourself with your infernal revolutionary notions your digging and blacksmithing your walking tours where is she sir richard i broke in pray where is she she he returned scratching his chin with the corner of a letter he held she she whom i saw last night you were asleep last night and the night before asleep then how long have i been here three days peter and where is she surely i have not dreamed at all where is charmian she went away this morning gone where to gad peter how should i know but seeing the distress in my face he smiled and tendered me the letter she left this for peter when he awoke and i've been waiting for peter to wake all morning hastily i broke the seal and unfolding the paper with a tremulous hand read dearest noblest and most disbelieving of peters oh did you think you could hide your hateful suspicion from me from me who knows you so well i felt it in your kiss in the touch of your strong hand i saw it in your eyes even when i told you the truth and begged you to believe me even then deep down in your heart you thought it was my hand that had killed sir maurice and god only knows the despair that filled me as i turned and left you and so peter perhaps to punish you a little perhaps because i cannot bear the noisy world just yet perhaps because i fear you a little i have run away but i remember also how believing me guilty you loved me still and gave yourself up to shield me and dying of hunger and fatigue came to find me and so peter i have not run so very far nor hidden myself so very close and if you understand me as you should your search need not be so very long and dear dear peter there is just one other thing which i hoped that you would guess which any other would have guessed but which being a philosopher you never did guess oh peter i was once very long ago it seems sophia charmian sefton but I am now and always was your humble person, Charmian. The letter fell from my fingers, and I remained staring before me so long that Sir Richard came and laid his hand on my shoulder. Oh, boy, said he very tenderly, she has told me all the story, and I think, Peter, I think it is given to very few men to win the love of such a woman as this. God knows it, said I, and to have married one so very noble and high in all things, you should be very proud, Peter. I am, said I, oh i am sir even peter even though she be a virago this lady sophia or a termagant i was a great fool in those days said i hanging my head and very young it was only six months ago peter but i am years older to-day sir and the husband of the most glorious woman the most oh curse me peter if you deserve such a goddess and she worked for me said i cooked and served and mended my clothes where are they i cried and sprang out of bed what the deuce began sir richard my clothes said i looking vainly about my clothes pray sir richard where are they burnt peter burnt every blood-stained rag he nodded her orders but what am i to do sir richard laughed and crossed to the press and opened the door here are all the things you left behind when you set out to dig and egad make your fortune i couldn't let em go with all the rest so i had them brought here to keep them for you ready for a time when you should grow tired of digging and come back to me and oh damn it you understand and granger's waiting to see you in the library been there hours so dress yourself in heaven's name dress yourself he cried and hurried from the room it was with a certain satisfaction that i once more donned buckskin and spurred boots and noticed moreover how tight my coat was become across the shoulders yet i dressed hastily for my mind was already on the road galloping to charmian in the library I found Sir Richard and Mr. Granger, who greeted me with his precise little bow. "'I have to congratulate you, Sir Peter,' he began, "'not only on your distinguished marriage and accession to fortune, but upon the fact that the, uh, unpleasantness connecting a certain Peter Smith with your unfortunate cousin's late decease has been entirely removed by means of the murderer's written confession, placed in my hands some days ago by the Lady Sophia. "'A written confession, and she brought it to you?' galloped all the way from tonbridge by gad nodded sir richard it seems pursued mr granger that the uh man john strickland by name lodged with a certain preacher 
to whom, in Lady Vibart's presence, he confessed his crime, and willingly wrote out a deposition to that effect. It also appears that the man, sick though he was, wandered from the preacher's cottage, and was eventually found upon the road, and now lies in Maidstone Gale in a dying condition. Chancing presently to look from the window, I beheld a groom who led a horse up and down before the door, and the groom was Adam, and the horse... I opened the window, and leaning out, called a name. At the sound of my voice, the man smiled and touched his hat, and the mare ceased her pawing and chafing, and turned upon me a pair of great soft eyes, and snuffed the air, and whinnied. So I leaped out of the window and down the steps, and thus it was that I met Wings. "'She be in the pink of condition, sir,' said Adam proudly. "'Sir Richard bought her. "'For a song,' added the baronet, who, with Mr. Granger, had followed to bid me good-bye. "'I really got her remarkably cheap,' he explained, thrusting his fist deep into his pockets and frowning down my thanks. But when I had swung myself into the saddle, he came and laid his hand on my knee. "'You are going? To find her, Peter?' "'Yes, sir. And you know where to look?' I think so, because if you don't, I might... I shall go to a certain cottage, said I tentatively. Then you'd better go, boy. The mare's all excitement. Good-bye, Peter, and cutting up my gravel most damnably. Good-bye. So saying, he reached up and gripped my hand very hard, and stared at me also very hard, though tears stood in his eyes. I have always felt very fatherly toward you, Peter, and you won't forget the lonely old man. Come and see me now and then, both of you for it does get damnably lonely here sometimes, and, oh, curse it, good-bye, dear lad. So he turned and walked up the steps into his great lonely house. O oh, wings, with thy slender grace and tireless strength, if ever thou didst gallop before, do thy best to-day. Spurn, spurn the dust neath thy fleet hoofs. Stretch thy graceful Arab neck. Bear me gallantly to-day, O oh, wings, for never shalt thou and I see its like again. Swiftly we flew with the wind before and the dust behind, past wayside inns where besmocked figures paused in their grave discussions to turn and watch us by, past smiling field and darkling copse, past lonely cottage and village green, through Seven Oaks and Tunbridge, with never a stop, up Pembry Hill and down, galloping so lightly, so easily, over that hard familiar road which I had lately tramped with so much toil and pain, and so, as evening fell, to Sissinghurst. A dreamy, sleepy place is Sissinghurst at all times, for its few cottages, like its inn, are very old, and great age begets dreams. But when the sun is low, and the shadows creep out, when the old inn blinks drowsy eyes at the cottages, and they blink back drowsily at the inn, like the old friends they are, when distant cows low at gates and fences, when sheep bells tinkle faintly, when the weary toiler seated sideways on his weary horse, homewards nodding sleepily with every plodding hoof-fall but rousing to give one a drowsy good night then who can resist the somnolent charm of the place save only the bull himself snorting down in lofty contempt as rolling of eye as curly of horn as stiff as to tail as any indignant bull ever was or shall be but as i rode watching the evening deepen about me soft and clear rose the merry chime of hammer and anvil and turning aside to the smithy i paused there and stooping my head, looked in at the door. "'George,' said I. He started erect, and dropping hammer and tongs, came out, running, then stopped suddenly as one abashed. "'Oh, friend,' said I, "'don't you know me?' "'Why, Peter,' he stammered and broke off, "'have you no greeting for me, George?' "'I—I I, I heard you was free, Peter, and I was glad, glad because you was the man I loved, and I waited. I have been waiting for you to come back, but now you be so changed, so fine and grand, and I be all black with soot from the fire. Oh, man, you bant my Peter no more. Never say that, George, never say that, I cried, and leaping from the saddle I would have caught his hand in mine, but he drew back. You be so fine and grand, Peter, and I be all sooty from the fire, he repeated. I'd just like to wash my hands first. Oh, black George, said I, dear George. Be you rich now, Peter? Yes, I suppose so. A gentleman with horses and houses and servants? Well, what of it? I'd like to wash my hands first, if so be you don't mind, Peter. George, said I, don't be a fool. Now as we stood thus fronting each other in the doorway, I heard a light step upon the road behind me, and turning beheld Prudence. Oh, Prue, George is afraid of my clothes and won't shake hands with me. For a moment she hesitated, looking from one to the other of us. Then all at once, laughing a little and blushing a little, she leaned forward and kissed me. Why, George, said she, still blushing, how foolish you be. Mr. Peter were as much a gentleman in his leather apron as ever he is in his fine coat. How foolish you be. 
so proud George gave me his hand, grimy as it was, rejoicing over me because of my good fortune, and mourning over me because my smithing days were over. You see, Peter, when men has worked together, and sorrowed together, and fought together, and knocked each other down like you and me, it bean't so easy to say good-bye. So if you must leave us, why, don't let's say it. No, George, there shall be no good-byes for either one of us, and I shall come back soon. Until then, take my mare, have her made comfortable for me, and now good-night, good-night. And so, clasping their loving hands, I turned away, somewhat hurriedly, and left them. There was no moon, but the night was luminous with stars, and as I strode along my eyes were often lifted to the wonder of the heavens, and I wondered which particular star was Charmian's and which was mine. Reaching the hollow I paused to glance about me as I ever did before descending that leafy path, and the shadows were very black, and a chill wind stirred among the leaves, so that I shivered, and wondered for the first time if I had come right, if the cottage had been Charmian's mind when she wrote. Then I descended the path, hurrying past a certain dark spot, and coming at last within sight of the cottage I paused again, and shivered, for the windows were dark and the door shut, but the latch yielded readily beneath my hand, so I went in and closed and barred the door behind me, for upon the hearth a fire burned with a dim red glow that filled the place with shadows, and the shadows were very deep. Charmian, said I, oh, Charmian, are you there? Have I guessed right? I heard a rustle close beside me, and in the gloom came a hand to meet and clasp my own. Wherefore I stooped and kissed those slender fingers, drawing her into the fire glow, and her eyes were hidden by their lashes, and the glow of the fire seemed reflected in her cheeks. The candles were so bright, Peter, she whispered. Yes, and so when I heard you coming, you heard me? I was sitting on the bench outside, Peter. And when you heard me, you put the candles out? They seemed so very bright, Peter. And shut the door? I only just closed it, Peter. She was still wrapped in her cloak as she had been when I first saw her, wherefore I put back the hood from her face, and, behold, as I did so, her hair fell down, rippling over my arm, and covering us both in splendor as it had done once before. Indeed, you have glorious hair, said I. It seems wonderful to think that you are my wife. I can scarcely believe it even yet. Why, I had meant you should marry me from the first, Peter. Had you? Do you think I should ever have come back to this dear solitude otherwise? Now, when I would have kissed her, she turned her head aside. Peter. Yes, Charmian. The Lady Sophia Sefton never did gallop her horse up the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral. Didn't she, Charmian? And she couldn't help her name being bandied from mouth to mouth, or hiccoughed out over slopping wine glasses, could she? No, said I, frowning. What a young fool I was. And Peter? Well, Charmian. She never was, and never will be, buxom or strapping, will she? Buxom is such a hateful word, Peter. And you, love her? Wait, Peter, as much as you ever loved Charmian Brown? Yes, said I, yes. And nearly as much as your dream woman? More, much more, because you are the embodiment of all my dreams. You always will be, Charmian, because I honor you for your intellect and worship you for your gentleness and spotless purity and love you with all my strength for your warm, sweet womanhood and because you are so strong and beautiful and proud. And because, Peter because I am just your loving, humble person. And thus it was I went forth a fool, and toiled and suffered and loved, and in the end got me some little wisdom. And thus did I, all unworthy as I am, win the heart of a noble woman, whose love I pray will endure, even as mine will, when we shall have journeyed to the end of this broad highway, which is life, and into the mystery of the beyond. End of In Which This History Is Ended End of the Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall